Hello and welcome to Archipelago Architectures for the Multiverse. My name is Vera Sacchetti. I am the curator and coordinator of this event. And it is my absolute pleasure to welcome you to the third day of our broadcast. We are here in Geneva at the heart of the city uh, in a space called Cube at uh, the head, the Haute École d'Art et Design. Archipelago Architectures for the Multiverse is a collaboration between two schools of the HOSSO, Geneva's University of Applied Sciences and Arts of Western S Switzerland. And these two schools are the head, the Geneva School of Art and Design, and the HEPIA, the Geneva School of Engineering, Architecture and Landscape. Since a few years, these schools have been working together to create a deeper reflection on the intersections and overlaps of the architectural disciplines that they teach. These are landscape architecture, architecture, and interior architecture. And the result of that reflection is what you see here today, Archipelago Architectures for the Multiverse. During the last two days, we've been discussing larger topics such as, do we need to build? What are the understories, the systems, and the issues that are hidden in plain sight in the midst of these disciplines. And in the last day of our broadcast today, we will be talking about interdependency. We will be talking how we need to reconfigure and restructure the way that we do and practice our disciplines in order to center other values such as care, kinship, advocacy, and find new ways and new roles for the practitioners of these disciplines. We have a lot of fantastic guests lined up to talk to us today. And before we start with the first topic of the day, I'm going to go and speak to a group that has been working parallelly to the event. They developed a special intervention in the city that takes place over the course of the same days of our event. We are in Geneva. We have a virtual event that you can see broadcast on our website, archipelagoarchitectures.ch. You can see it on the YouTube of Head Genève, and you can see it on Facebook of Head and Hepia over the course of these three days. But we also have a physical program of events that is happening here in the city of Geneva. Without further ado, I'm going to talk to Trojans Collective, who've been developing a parasite intervention uh, that takes place in the city of Geneva over the course of the last three days. And they're here with us and they have brought the intervention that they've been developing for Archipelago. Welcome, it's great to have you here with us. Um, Helena, can you tell us a little bit about what we're seeing here? This is a device for a, a parasite action, I'm assuming. Indeed. Well, first of all, thank you, Verda, for inviting us to the festival and also for inviting us here today. This is the Trojan Parasite, uh, the, the intervention we have created for Ar Archipelago. And it's composed by six different benches that you can wear as a sort of backpack. And we have been using to walk around the city and infiltrate the benches of Archipelago that are distributed in the city. Uh, we have been using those benches as stages and where we put this, um, our benches. And we have had conversations about topics that concern Geneva as a city, but also that can be seen broadly in a more uh, general question. Can you tell us a little bit how these conversations are structured? Who is talking to you? Who are you talking to? And what are the topics? Sure. So the, we have had three conversations. For each conversation, we wanted to invite a person from the festival and a person that is active in Geneva in the field of spatial practices. Uh, for us, it was very important to make this link between the festival and the city. So that's also why we wanted to mix these, these voices and we, we put the benches in the city to have the conversations there. Uh, the topics have been uh, the Rhone and its uh, legal condition, also the, in the identity of, the, um, of Geneva through its public uh, status, and third, the immigration and uh, migration issues and how does Geneva play in that, in that uh, sense. And who is Trojans Collective, Jessica? Who are you and how do you work together? So we're an international uh, group, collective, based in Geneva. We met during our master degree here at La Head in the Master of Space and Communication. And after graduating, we wanted to create a place for transdisciplinarity and explore through our practice design as a research method. This idea of transdisciplinarity is something that we've been talking about a lot over the course of the last day's discussions here over at Archipelago. Can you tell us a little bit about this porosity of borders between disciplines? This is, in fact, something that you advocate, right, Netillo? Uh, yes, uh, for us, I think this uh, porosity between disciplines is quite important. 
it creates a sort of a holistic research space that allows us to look for original or at least um, unexpected outcomes that contribute to our practice. I think that's more and more important over the course of the times that we are living in. But it's also difficult to work together. I mean, how do you guys make it work as a collaborative uh, collective? Um, for us, it's very important, this notion of uh, collective and collaboration. And actually, for us, we think that it's very important to challenge and question design through a constant dialogue. And uh, this is uh, one of the first reasons why we built a collective. Um, and also the second one is because we have different practices, different expertises that we um, ac activate together. Um, and we think it's very important to uh, work th uh, and constantly educate ourselves uh, through uh, collaborative processes. And yeah. Very interesting what you say, Jeanne, because it's really talking to the issues that we were also speaking in over the course of the last days about listening. In fact, this is an event for listening. I'm very happy that you came here and shared your intervention. It will have an afterlife over at the Archipelago blog and also in another physical form. Thank you so much, guys, for telling us about the project. Um, I'm going to continue over to talk to our first guest of today, Adrian Lahoud. He is the Dean of Architecture at the Royal College of Art in London. He was also the curator of the, the first ever Sharjah Triennale of Architecture. And he joins us today from London, where I'm delighted to be speaking. I'm delighted to be speaking with you, Adrian, today. Thank you so much for joining us. Adrian is going to introduce the first topic of today, um, which deals mostly with centering ideas of kinship and advocacy. Um, Adrian, I think a lot of the work that you've been doing centers these kinds of values, and it also centers the creations of new networks uh, of solidarity between practitioners of architectural disciplines. Welcome to Archipelago. It's a Thank pleasure you. to have you here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Vera. It's uh, wonderful to be here today. Thank you very much for this invitation, um, especially um, in a context of this incredible event that you've put together and all of the uh, really like wonderful speakers that you've assembled. Um, so in order to uh, introduce this theme of kinship and advocacy, um, which is really also a story about survival, about what survives, about what is passed on, and how it can be remade. I want to put four things on the table um, as prompts to examine what is this complex idea in the hope that they might become useful objects for us to think through. Uh, so the first one is an illustration from the Andes. Uh, the Should second have, uh, is a knotted chord from well. we Papua New Guinea. Already? Should we be looking at your um, slides already? I'll tell the people. No, no, not yet. Not really? Um, I'm, I've, 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 I've sent through a transcript, so I think the, the person who's running the slides should be able to know when, um, when okay, to change great. the slides. So, yeah. So the first one is an illustration from the Andes. The second one is a knotted cord from uh, Papua New Guinea. The third is a painting that was used to win a historic land claim in Australia. And the fourth is a birthmark uh, in the context of a project by Lawrence Abu Hamdan. Um, three of them are taken from the Sharjah Architecture Triennial, which you just uh, mentioned, uh, which was an exhibition on the architecture of the Global South that I curated in uh, 2019. So maybe we could move to the first slide so along the mountainous slopes of uh, abandoned caravan routes that cross the atacama desert in chile are thousands of geoglyphs made by displacing rocks and stones the geoglyphs include depictions of humans uh, animals mythological figures and geometric shapes the pathways joining bolivia Chile and Argentina once formed a plateau of multi-ethnic network of corridors linking the people of the Andean plateau and its salt pans to each other and to the world beyond. The geoglyphs were sighted on the slopes to be read by travelers moving along the valleys, but also scaled and positioned to be visible to other geoglyphs and to supernatural beings. These trans-desert corridors were more than pathways for travel, however, they they express an entire metaphysical system. So the Aymaran call them uh, Taki. And the word describes a uniquely Andean form of social memory where named mountains and rivers act to sequentially elicit imagination, ritual, and oral performance. 
So if we could move on to the second slide, um, which is this illustration I wanted to put on the table. So in his book titled Pathways of Memory and Power, um, Thomas Abercrombie includes two curious illustrations that suggest a further link between the toponymic and the mnemotechnical importance of this idea of the tucky. Drawn in 1804, they were created to support an inheritance claim in a litigation over property between the Guarache and the Chocatella families. So what they would depict would be familiar to anyone who was inclined to resolve an inheritance dispute by referring to biological lineage. How they depict it, however, would be another thing entirely. So instead of a family tree, they depict the tucky in the shape of a path that zigzags up and down the face of a mountain. So these illustrations weld a European notion of filiation to Andean ideas of emplacement and social memory, arresting in a written and graphic form the physical and spiritual practices of uh, moving through the desert landscape and the oral recitation and performances that accompanied them. So these documents, um, these illustrations, therefore mark uh, an important point of inflection in the Spanish colonization of the Americas. But that is not all. So in the bottom left-hand corner of the illustration depicting the Chocatella family, a lone figure stands outside of the filial line of connection to his ancestors. The annotation refers to him as a pathless beggar. Strangely, though, to emphasize the state of being stranded outside of the social world, he's depicted inside a building. If we could move slides forward. So Andean, Australasian, Mesoamerican, and Amerindian people have often been described as having something called oral traditions, so icons, and symbols that act as a kind of prompt to memory or to performance or speech. Uh, a notable example first described in the anthropological literature by Gregory Bateson in his iconic text, Naven, is the Ayatmal practice of recitation, where a memorized list of thousands of ancestors' names are passed down generation to generation. Um, with each generation having to, to memorize the entire list and be able to, uh, to repeat it. More than oral records of genealogy, though, uh, expressed as names, among the villages of the Sepik River in Papua New Guinea, these lists are the literal pathways of the ancestors' original migration. So, um, Kirugu is the name given to a length of cord, um, this is the second object, whose knots represent a sequence of toponyms um, which is place names, uh, according, uh, ordered according to that path. Yeah, so the path of the ancestors' migration. During song cycles, the cord's owner will pass the knots uh, through their hand like a rosary, with each knot designating an episode relating to the life of the ancestors. Uh, the larger knots indicate a name that you can speak out loud, uh, that can be uttered, with the smaller knots indicating names that can only be recalled in the mind of the owner. Because their vocalizations lack phonetic transcription into written form, the graphic traditions of oral societies are still seen as abortive and ultimately uh, failed attempts to produce writing. But this view depends on an idea of mental activity that is stilted, it's almost mechanical. Yeah? So the recollections in the mind, in its complete form, it's always there. But because it's accompanied by many other recollections, its retrieval depends on something outside of the mind to prompt that recollection into conscious perception. So usually an icon, a symbol, or a glyph, or in this case, perhaps a knot on a cord. The anthropologist Carlos Severi claims that the very idea of an oral society is mistaken, however. For Severi, the material cultures and graphic traditions of these societies are not failed attempts to produce writing. Um, on the contrary, they represent a wholly independent technology of social memory and imagination in their own right. And in a really revolutionary book that he wrote called The Chimera Principle, he argues that the graphic icons, symbols, and illustrations of Andean, Australasian, Mesoamerican, and Amerindian societies are incomplete images posing the problem of their completion to the imagination. So named after the mythical monsters, these 
chimeras span two realms. One is visible to the eye, the only other to the mind. And this is maybe why they appear to be incomplete when they're compared to writing, but there may be other reasons. Um, their job, however, uh, is not to transcribe sound, but to solicit the action of the imagination in the minds of the beholders, an imagination that was collective and whose exercise the chimeras worked to cultivate. So in the West, the imagination, much like dreaming, is a predominantly private and asocial affair. In fact, we could say it's one of the most private things that, that we think that we can do. On the contrary, here, if Severi is correct, we find a deprivatized, socialized understanding of the imagination as a kind of shared cultural artifact about one whose meaning and durability depends on the um, places and lived practices of its members. Now, if Severi is wrong, um, and there are indeed societies without writing, then at the very least, we must also allow that there might be societies without dreams and imagination too. So on May 10th in 1997 in Binini, on the edge of Australia's Great Sandy Desert, 40 artists, their family members, and a large number of uh, Toyota Land Cruisers assemble around the edge of a recently completed painting. Among them are representatives of the state and federal governments um, taking turns, old men and women uh, walk over to the painting one by one. They stand on the part of the painting that they painted and they talk about their country. Their testimony is straightforward, consisting of short statements uh, addressed to the tribunal chair. They say things like, this is my father's country. This is my grandmother's country. This is my country. They describe their parents, their grandparents, and their great-grandparents. They name the Jilla, um, which is an Aboriginal word meaning waterhole, and you can see one depicted in this image here. Um, and they describe having to work at the cattle stations arranged along the Canning stock route. And at the conclusion of each of the artists' testimony, there is an applause. So despite being the original inhabitants of the land, Despite stealing this land from them, the state demands evidence of their origin. It asks them, who are you? Where are you from? Where do you come from? And if they present this evidence so that it conforms to the court's understanding of their traditions and their origins, the relevant tribunals and courts can choose to grant them title over their land. So in other words, in order for Indigenous Australians to secure native title, their right to land, they will be asked to dramatize the very thing that white settler society sought to eradicate. But what in the eyes of the court counts as evidence of tradition? From the perspective of the state, the alterity of Indigenous enunciation marks its authenticity. So its failure to coincide with normative legal processes, including evidentiary ones, does not jeopardize the testimony, however, instead it strengthens it. So refusing the state's tradition of evidence becomes the best evidence of an incommensurable tradition. The 40 artists responded to the liberal desire uh, for alterity by making a painting as proof. And the painting is the third object I wanna put on the table. They stood on the part of the painting, they pointed to the ground and they said, this is my country. But it's really impossible for the chair of the tribunal to know exactly what the painting says beyond the kinds of statements made by the artists. It's withdrawal from the state into a secret realm of social memory that belongs to Indigenous Australian communities becomes a sign of alterity, a sign that is persuasive enough for them to win back a territory twice the size of the Netherlands, which they ended up doing. So for the time being, uh, the, the ability of this community to pass on social memory has survived the ravages of contact with Guria, which is their word for white people. Despite the virtuosity of their collective performance and the remarkable, uh, remarkable legal verdict that stemmed from it, the future is far less certain. Already the sense of resignation among senior members of the community is very hard to shake. Um, during the opening of the Sharjah Architecture Triennial, uh, two desert people, the Nugara, 
uh, you can see in this image, you can see the feet in this image, an Atacamenu um, from the Atacama Desert met for the first time. In their exchange, the Nugara learned that their friends in the Atacama now depend on the work of archaeologists and anthropologists who, working from nothing more than physical traces, attempt to rescue the meaning of their own enigmatic chimeras, but this time absent of the lived practices of social memory and imagination that lent them sense and connection to the world. That is to say that the continuity of their culture was so broken um, by the scale of the Spanish genocide, was so destructive, um, and that it took place many, many centuries before Australian colonization. And so now they depend on experts to reinterpret the signs of their own ancestors' traditions back to them. So like trying to reconstruct a vast ancestral puzzle from a surviving piece, the people of the Atacama must become experts in a new set of rituals, surveys, excavations, photogrammetry, aerial reconnaissance, and satellite imagery. The tendrils of these instruments also reach back in time, as if to assure us that the dead persist in the composition of the world. There's no oblivion here, nothing is missing, everything is still here. The dead can be a source of life for the living. Reincarnation is a form of inheritance where the soul, memories, or physical attributes of a deceased person are passed on to another individual at birth. Transmigration, or the passage from a perished body to a newly alive one, can take many years. Among Lebanon's Druze community, every soul transmigrates, but only a few remember the passage. Importantly, the more violent, unexpected, and transgressive the death, the more one's life's memories leak into the next. In his performance of the Sharjah Architecture Triennial titled Natak, Lawrence Abu Hamdan enters into dialogue with Yusuf al Jahari, who was born in 1967 and who died in 1984. Yusuf is reincarnate. In the, in the figure of Basil Abishahin, born in 1987, three years before his former self's passing. For Abu Hamdan, Basil's recounting of his memories as Yusuf are natuk, an Arabic term that describes a form of speech that is impossible to explain by any means except reincarnation, usually because they contain recollections of events that could not have been witnessed otherwise. So in the context of the continuation and aftermath of the Lebanese civil war, Natuk breaks the cordon surrounding history that makes its research and transmission impossible, a cordon made up of post-war amnesty provisions that protect criminals from trial and the outlawing of Natuk in legal testimony. Erupting as the linguistic sign of a secret past, reincarnation also marks the body with the physical traces of the soul's transmigration, such that birthmarks on the body of the living surface as the after effects of wounds suffered in a previous life. Reincarnation points to the fact that there are intergenerational transmissions of souls or memories that are karmic, mechanical, traumatic and aleatory, as much as there are affiliations of the blood that are biologically determined, productive, reproductive, and territorial. Reincarnation proposes an alternative order of kinship as inheritance that is imminent, germinal, and transversal, in which the memory of the other person persists in you as you, making you always more than one. In his text, Reincarnation and Biology, Ian Stevenson examines the birthmark as a sign of the persistence of ancestors. And he too suggests that especially traumatic memories act as a kind of trigger for recollection in later lives. Drawing from case studies in Burma, Brazil, Sri Lanka, Thailand, Lebanon, and Nigeria, he suggests that there is a high correlation between the shock to consciousness presented by the moment of death 
and the means of death and the chances of the wound appearing in the next life, as if trauma were able to weave some unknown thread between bodies, each generation passing its encrypted message to the next, who must then learn to decipher it again. And I'll wrap up. And of course, the birthmark is the fourth, the fourth object. Like a vast emanation with no object and no target, the past remains ready to send its signs. It merely waits for someone to come who is ready to receive them. The future discovery of a sign amidst the murmur of the past heralds their arrival. Its discovery retroactively confers on the past the production of a communicative act with the future. Or, to put it differently, nothing can be definitively lost. Everything might have survived. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Adrian. So are we ready to receive these signs? Is now the moment for a new generation or perhaps the generation that is currently active of practitioners to receive these signs and to work with them? Yeah, I think, I think we're now more than ready to start to attune ourselves and to sensitize ourselves to these other kinds of signs, the ones, the ones I'm trying to refer to. But I also think it's, um, it's an open question in the sense that uh, we're always discovering new ways of registering the past. So one of the things I've spoken about before, um, I mean, who would have thought that uh, the level of CO2 discovered in an ice core would tell us something about the scale of the genocide in Latin America? Yeah. Um, and so that ability to reconstruct a kind of argument about the past um, can be deployed in all kinds of very interesting political ways that I think we're only really now just starting to understand. Um, and for me, this is exactly what the question of kinship is about. Um, and the question of advocacy is about is that how we start to um, mobilize these relationships um, between the past and the future. Um, in, a, in a way that allows us to make new political claims in the present. Uh, and so I think what's really fascinating about both the, um, the geoglyphs in the Atacama Desert, the Nogura canvas, but also these birthmarks, um, is whether you believe that they're true or not is actually irrelevant. Um, what's important is that they're efficient. They do certain kinds of work politically. They allow you to um, make a kind of legal claim about bringing, having your land back. They allow you to make a claim around your ancestors that stops a mining company. Um, they allow you to say something about a civil war in a condition where nobody is allowed to speak about the civil war. And so, so for me, it's, it's incredibly beautiful um, the way that these signs become uh, activated in new kinds of ways in the present uh, to produce these kinds of political effects. Thank you, Adrian. And with those words, I'm going to pass it on to our next roundtable. Thank you so much for this introduction and for <laughs> sharing all these thoughts. It's wonderful to have you here. I'm going to go walk you, over there to our next discussion, which will start from the points that we were just introduced to by Adrian. Um, we are going to be discussing issues of kinship and advocacy. Um, and I'm joined here by an, by an array of wonderful guests. Um, we are going to be moderated by Elise masao hunchuk who I'm going to join in a second. Um, Elise, I'm going to be sitting next to you for this one, but I'll uh, sit down and let you say some introductory remarks after Adrian's wonderful introduction. Good to see you. Um, and thank you, Adrian, for sharing um, each of those stories with us. Uh, and in this way, your important work um, in, in making and dedicating space uh, and in telling and sharing stories. Um, so thank you for that. Um, and, you know, as Adrian so um, eloquently said, we're always discovering new ways of registering the past. Um, and the work of our panelists um, makes, um, we'll, we'll see, uh, is making new ways of registering the past and the present in an effort to um, make new spaces now and in the future. Um, and so, um, uh, Vera, I don't know if you want to introduce uh, Charlotte or if you want me to uh, just go ahead with the introduction to the entire panel. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, welcome Charlotte Malterbat, who is sitting here uh, in front of me. 
it's wonderful to have you here. And I believe Elise asked you to prepare an introduction about yourself, so I will just let you go ahead. Well, thanks, um, and it's wonderful to be here in, in such a lovely set. Uh, you know, when we talk about these hybrid formats, we're always terrified, but this is really, you know, as good as it gets. And um, I'm really happy to to be able to um, sit with you and with um, the panelists who are speaking from other places. Um, yes, so, well, I will be very brief uh, because I think there's a lot of things to discuss based on what Adrian was uh, already discussing and um, of the work of the panelists as well. Uh, so my name is Charlotte Malterbart. I'm an uh, assistant professor in urban design at uh, the Harvard Graduate School of Design. Um, I uh, also have a PhD from ETH Zurich, uh, looking at the political economy of commodities and their impacts on the built environment, um, especially looking at Egypt. Uh, and I recently worked uh, on Marseille, uh, questions of migration, and also, uh, last but not least, I'm also a, a founding member of the Parity Group uh, and the Parity Front, which is a kind of a spin-off uh, looking at how, or let's say, actively uh, engaging on um, questions of uh, gender and diversity uh, and bringing change in architectural um, institutions. So that would be kind of uh, my own introduction. Thank you, Charlotte. Uh, it's nice to have you join us. Um, we're also fortunate to have uh, in this shared uh, space, um, Esther Choi and uh, Marie-Louise Richards. Um, and so together we're going to talk about, um, as has been already mentioned, kinship and advocacy. And we're going to explore their works, um, past and ongoing, um, as ways to think uh, together about how to move forward in practice. Um, and we'll ask how disciplines can support ideas of kinship, of collaboration, of mutual care. Um, and, but we'll also, um, I, I hope, uh, perhaps the conversation will uh, interrogate and ask questions about the terms themselves uh, and others that we use um, as we explore the importance of language uh, in the making and writing of these narratives. Um, and so I'd like to now um, welcome Esther to join and perhaps introduce herself. Hi, um, thank you so much for having me. Um, uh, thank you, Vera, for the invitation and to Elise and Mary Louise and Charlotte, I really look forward to this conversation. Um, so I'll try to keep this brief, but what I thought I would do is introduce myself um, and tell you a little bit about Office Hours, which is a project that I've been working on. Um, so my name is Esther Choi. I'm a multidisciplinary artist and an architectural historian, and my work really does operate between art and architecture in a variety of forms. Um, my scholarship generally looks at concepts of nature and by extension what is natural and how these ideas are shaped by processes of modernization and the rhetorics of modernity. But I'm also really engaged in socially engaged art practice and the crossovers of pedagogy. Uh, so last July, I started a global mentoring series called Office Hours, which places design practitioners of color. Um, in North America, we use the term BIPOC or Black Indigenous people of color, so BIPOC, um, in conversation with students and emerging design practitioners of color around the world. Um, and it really began with really simply with requests that I received so many requests over the years from young people um, asking for advice, often young people of color looking for mentorship and, and just to talk to someone they could identify with um, in a very white dominated industry and, in, and, and also in academia. So Basically, I advertised these sessions on Instagram. The first session was about PhD programs, and I was shocked that I had folks from over five countries, um, you know, reach out. And um, you know, we had really a frank conversation. Um, I was a first, I am a first generation college graduate. Um, I come from a low income background. Um, my parents did not, you know, have the privilege of getting an education. So the question is like, how do you deal with tokenism and discrimination? How do you finance a degree without generational wealth? Re what resources are available to you? Um, as well as the political significance of being a historian of color, of having a, a, you know, a perspective that really has been marginalized in the field. So all of these things became really important parts of the discussion. Um, and, you know, and in that sense, I think the idea of being empowered and, and sharing skills and knowledge was really important um, because, you know, as Ruha Benjamin scholar says, you know, most people 
um, have to live inside someone else's imagination. So what does it mean for us to, as marginalized or minoritized people, be able to enact our imaginations? And um, and in this sense, I think mentorship is really important. It is proven um, as a really important device in equity. Um, and it really just helps envision, um, help people envision a path for their own achievement. Um, we have since, in a, in since July, have had over 2,000 young people of color attend our events from over 13 countries. Um, I'm going to get a little emotional, actually. <laughs> um, all of our events are free. Um, and we've had speakers, like, so blessed to have speakers like Smaya Valley, Jermaine Barnes, Shumi Bose, Eddie Opara, Jonathan Jackson, Tay Carpenter. And it's just been really, like, really overwhelming. Um, but um, it's really just so powerful, I think, for even the speakers to be in a space of only designers of color, um, a space where we can actually practice what decentering whiteness looks like and, um, and really practice what intersectional justice might look like. And, um, and so the one exchange that we have, that we, the one request is that we ask speakers, uh, sorry, our, we ask our speakers, of course, to turn their cameras on, but we ask all of our participants to turn their cameras on. Um, and this is really important to, to create a dynamic where that kind of knowledge acquisition and social experience isn't extractive or disposable, but actually people show up as accountable to a group. And for me, this is incredibly important because um, not only are the conversations light years ahead in terms of the kinds of conversations that we see in academia about racial inequality, you know, folks in the sessions, you know, attendees get to ask their own questions and uh, to speakers. And, you know, there are such insights that sort of create parallels between the generational wealth or lack thereof between immigrant communities and black communities in the United States, for example, without flattening distinctions and having um, a real kind of nuance and fine grained texture to talking about the about lived experience and the value of that. So, um, you know, again, also like having cameras on is really important because um, one of the, the biggest um, issues that I see is this kind of um, impulse around singularity and competition, which are really tenets of white supremacy. And so um, my hope, my hope is that this social experiment that seems to be gaining traction will really um, help people to collectively, and I include myself in that, um, realize that one's uplifting is intrinsically connected to the liberation of others. Um, and so self-interest is really the um, Achilles heel that we have to really um, collectively work on. Um, so anyways, I, I would say, you know, my hope is that in giving the next generation some skills and tools, the things that we, all of the speakers of Office Hours wish that we had when we were younger, the project really becomes a question of, you know, if and when you achieve a level of knowledge or resources or power, what will you do and how will you do it differently? You know, what new skills, tools, and knowledge will you, be able to acquire and also pay it forward? And how can you use your power that you're afforded to change the system or to create a new system or a new platform or opportunities, new stories, new representations of identity in the world? Um, so I'll just end it there. Um, you know, there are some like references for me that are incredibly important thinkers like Fred Moten, you know, people like Marshall Salins and Danella Meadows, who's who've written. Um, you know, diff in different ways about this idea of kinship, but I'll, I'll hold off now and, and um, maybe we can discuss during the discussion. Thank you so much, Esther. I, you immediately have raised so many of the, um, so many topics that I wanted to, um, I hoped that we could uh, speak about in the conversation. So I'm really looking forward to that. But first, um, uh, last but not least, I want uh, to introduce uh, Mary Louise uh, and welcome her um, to uh, introduce herself. Hi, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm so excited to be in conversation with, with you all here today. Um, I'm an architect who teach and do research at the Royal Institute of Art in Stockholm, where I teach the course Decolonizing Architecture with Alessandro Petti. And as an architect, I found myself needing to think about how race or the racial is embedded within the architecture. And then, of course, bringing up race uh, most of the time is perceived as disruptive. And I therefore became preoccupied with thinking about how to address questions of race 
thinking through the concept of invisibility, but not so much as exclusion, but as a critical strategy. Mm -hmm. So it's not only disruptive, it is, of course, also really difficult to talk about race. And I argue it's difficult by design in how it brings about this whole range of what Sara Ahmed refers to as our politics of emotion. And it makes the one who brings race into the center in pointing to it extremely vulnerable for, for many reasons. And I think this is true for most contexts, but it presents an additional kind of challenge here in Sweden where race has been erased and replaced with ethnicity. And this also happens in, in many places. But when we do not see race, if you claim that you do, that's irrational. So this creates this relational space of affect uh, in the spaces that you try to, to address race. Um, and where this tension or this politics of emotion sets up this binary relationship of power where some positions are either perceived as irrational or rational. And being irrational, of course, rise to racial in a binary of this affectability. So the spaces where race is pointed to can in turn never really be safe, not to mention the emotional labor in navigating it all. And mm -hmm. um, in addition to thinking about how to address questions of race and space, I have also come to spend the majority of my time reimagining the, the discipline and the practice and the history of architecture. And I've been doing so thinking alongside with Black feminist thinkers, both from the past and in the present, who has not been included in the narrative of architecture, whose thinking and literature and art engage with um, and also engage in a sort of space making and creating spaces, and whose thinking seeks to reimagine the world beyond the constraints of the, the racial. Um, but this, this reimagining is, is not so much, I don't think of the utopian thinking, for me, it needs to be a practice and it needs to be experimental and it needs to take place in the here and now, in the present, in the everyday. And this involves not only doing away or delinking or unlearning from modes of Eurocentric universal systems of knowledge or by locating erased or non-valued practices and ways of thinking, of course, one mode does not need to replace another, rather it involves the disrupting this binary. And it also involves engaging and experimenting with critical strategies um, that seeks to undermine universality, asking questions instead of rushing to finding uh, solutions or fixing things, and engaging in ways of sensing and being with the world instead of acting upon it. And it's also practice where I always need to reinterpret myself as an architect and um, as a teacher. And by finding myself for the most of the time working within institution, it is not so much about inclusion, rather it involves clearing ground for a diversity and plurality of thinking, not simply by forms of representation. Um, so it comes down to how we relate to each other and with the topics we seek to engage with critically, uh, how to give value to that which has been devalued, ignored or erased, how the ground can be clear to hold fragmentation, allowing for this friction that's staying with the entanglement and the investments we have with the issues we also critique. Um, how to care for the vulnerabilities when we often arrive at these questions from different positions, perspectives, experiences, and viewpoints. Yeah, I, I think I will, I will leave it there. Thank you so much. Um, you've actually um, brought up uh, towards the beginning, um, yourself and Esther both um, brought something up that I, I hoped we could maybe start with as a way to open the conversation. Um, and it's 
to quote something that you wrote, um, Mary Louise. <laughs> so um, forgive me for quoting your work back to you. I hope you don't mind. Um, but you wrote, uh, and it, it was particularly resonant with me. So um, I'll just read it out and then I'll, and I'll ask the question. Um, quote, difficult emotions emerge when dealing with race affect. In my attempt to address the interrelation of race and space, Within this confluence of emotions, language and bodies, it became clear that I was lacking a sufficient or satisfactory vocabulary for addressing the effects of this interrelation. Likewise, the emotions that emerged made it difficult to distinguish what should be considered knowledge production and where that knowledge production takes place. Um, and so I'd like to ask a question that you also posed in that same piece of writing, which is um, how does language regulate or enable, uh, and thereby control or frame ways in which we're able to speak and think within the current hegemony of whiteness. Um, and so perhaps I could ask you to reflect on this, um, Marie-Louise. Um, and I also am curious if, um, you know, if, if these thoughts um, have changed uh, since the time of writing. Um, uh, and and how so? Uh, and then I might also um, ask the other panelists to um, to add their um, thoughts or responses as well. But first, I'd, I'll start with you. Yeah, no, thank you so much um, for for asking that question. Um, yeah, the time of writing is some years ago, and I think th this this question of language is is always with me, and I think that's where we I struggle the most. Because wanting to engage in meaningful conversation and, and working together with others, you want them to hear you. Uh, you don't want to set off this mechanism that, um, that speaking about race uh, sets off. Uh, maybe defensiveness, uh, guilt, anger, s sorrow, all those things. But you want to talk about um, the mechanisms, uh, how a uh, concept functions, what the work it does. So I think I've been really interested in finding the language that does that and moves away from the concept. Um, and of course, this is different from every situation and um, different depending on who you engage with. Um, but I think it's what is really important is to, to take every situation for what it is uh, and stay with, with that moment and try to navigate it. I think that's the best way I can answer that this moment. No, absolutely. There's um, definitely um, uh, a kind of um, very careful um, reflection and agility in your writing um, that I think indicates that and um, this need uh, for attentiveness, um, for continued attentiveness, that there's no um, one solution and so uh, no one response, no you know, so-called right way to do uh, or to approach a, a topic or a conversation. And so I um, also want to extend this um, question um, or ask um, Esther to, to reflect on this, um, especially um, curious to um, know how you have found or, or how you've negotiated that within this space that you've um, created uh, within office hours, for example, that's explicitly meant to decenter a particular kind of whiteness, but um, but perhaps we'll we'll sort of I'll leave it there and, and we'll expand on that after. Yeah, that's a beautiful passage, Mary Louise, and thanks for the question, Elise. Um, I feel I was sort of feeling like I probably enacted the politics of emotion that you <laughs> uh, you you were writing about, but um, it made me think of Fred Moten's call in the Undercommons, um, where he calls on us collectively, or those interested, let's say, in spaces of fugitivity and acts of fugitivity, um, to create alternative spaces um, and and to think about them as experiments of sociability. You know, um, conditions, the spatial conditions in which certain kinds of social relationships can gain traction, and this. To me, you know, later in he gave a Gauss lecture at Princeton, and and he talks about the concept of difference without, uh, without hierarchy and without separation. So I just I really like to think about those two ideas and hold them um, hold them together 
in relation to your um, really great point around the questions of language as a device. And for me, it, it seems so in inherently necessary to create new spaces in which that language can be explored and, and experimented with and practiced. Um, that's definitely, I think, the project of Office Hours in a lot of ways. And thinking about, I'm always eternally amazed by the kinds of um, parallels that people, the ways in which folks like from all around the world can find identification and the experience of another. And I think in this sense, language is important, but also the, the, the power of listening is incredibly important. The power of realizing that actually, um, given that most of the narratives that most people of color have had and the representations people have had, people of color have um, absorbed are often through um, filtered by, you know, the white media, at least in North America and, and, and in Europe, that um, it, it's incredibly powerful to realize actually that there's an alternate way of understanding difference um, which hasn't been filtered by this other kind of intermediary, um, a very biased intermediary. And to think about then, um, uh, you know, what new narratives can emerge. And um, and in in at least to your your question around how how that gets mitigated, the the sessions are recorded for our archives, but we don't post them publicly. That's intentional because so much of what we discuss not all, but a lot of what we can discuss can be very personal and intimate. And, you know, it relates to people's experiences with discrimination and how they've had to handle that or, um, you know, how they deal with aspects of marginalization. And that's not something that I feel, and certainly our speakers don't feel, is, is you know, needs to be created a spectacle of. Um, and this is, but this is where I think the question of structural change, not optical change, which I think a lot of institutions right now are relying on, becomes really important. You know, the, the project in some ways actually um, uses optics as a device um, first for self-reflection. So literally seeing the experience of yourself in relation to a larger collective um, and also seeing yourself at the same time in relation to a speaker that might represent something that you're interested in achieving. So the dynamics of visuality at play are I think complex, but also then privileging who gets to see those images and who gets access to that language is really important. So, um, so that's sort of how we're trying to navigate it. Um, I don't know. It's it, it's a it's a kind of experiment in, pro in process. So um, it's difficult sometimes to theorize the thing in, as it's in motion. But that's sort of what I've witnessed, and I've always been I've been eternally sort of amazed at sort of the kind of emotional. Uh, and psychological resonance, at least that I have, you know, you know, in in witnessing um, these discussions. You raise a, a very important point, also, um, which is this um, this question of optics um, uh, seeking out structural change, not optical change, but also um, that you can also use optics as a device um, for one's own uh, goals. And so um, I would like to also extend um, to Charlotte if you want to respond to this question. Um, but I also uh, in that would like to know um, if you also wanted to perhaps reflect on this question of um, structural and not optical change in your work uh, specifically. Thanks. Um, no, it's wonderful to to be able to to come after both uh, Marie Louise and, and Esther to um, to to try to um, perhaps give a um, perspective. Um, so first, maybe I, I would like to to tell a, a little story, which I think. Uh, could could be interesting. It's kind of um, candid. Uh, so, for instance, in I think uh, at the Oslo Triennale in uh, 2019, um, I did with uh, Dubravka Sekulic a uh, reading group, uh, which was called. Uh, it was part of a project called uh, "Bringing Intersectionality to the Architecture School." Um, and it was a really wonderful output. There were um, there were uh, a lot of uh, uh, people attending. It was a reading, so we we uh, we did a reading of um, uh, the the magazine Heresies, um, and and this kind of uh, discussion on women's rights of the of the eighties and and so on and so forth. So which it was a very um, a very generous space. So many people were able to discuss. It was also about inequities. Uh, within the architectural office, something that is uh, perhaps not not too often uh, discussed. But 
uh, to go back to to the title of that um, of that particular initiative, um, we we um, we also have as part of our uh, let's say working um, uh, constellation um, uh, uh, people from uh, the uh, collective matriarchy uh, and namely Kenzani de Clerc with whom we did a. Um, a presentation uh, a few weeks ago about uh, that particular um, topic of uh, parity works and uh, the power of the collective. And then we had a very in-depth conversation about um, the term intersectionality and also about the word bringing. Um, and then we had a very, uh, you know, uh, in-depth uh, on look on that. First of all, of course, you know, the kind of question of intersectionality, and here we talk about that very important question of, you know, tokenism and um, optics, I think uh, you, you mentioned that, where uh, a term like that is kind of plastered, um, but then who are the people that you're actually doing that work with? Um, and, and this really um, forces us to, to question that, uh, whether this was the right term, whether we're really practicing that, you know, um, within our own uh, activism. And also, I think, very interesting um, that the discussion crystallizes on that bringing and what does it mean when you're, you know, from a certain point of privilege, bring something into uh, another space? Um, and we had a lot of discussion about that. So I, I think this is just to kind of give a little bit of, um, uh, n you know, kind of uh, light on how this conversation on languages um, are, are really important in the kind of uh, activist work that uh, revolves around this parity conversation. So... Um, and, and I think that uh, both uh, Marie-Louise and Esther were pointing at those, uh, at those those elements and how language becomes a point of departure for larger, um, uh, you know, constellations and how you can really uh, work together in this kind of, uh, or let's say, towards a kind of common uh, goal, which is to deconstruct those kind of uh, inequalities that we find spe specifically for us in the architecture school, which is our main... Um, sphere of intervention. Um, yeah, so I, I think that maybe gives a little bit of light. I, I had also written uh, notes on, on um, other things, but um, I, I think just to kind of uh, frame that question of language, it's useful to then become that um, space where you make space for others. I mean, I don't know if this is kind of really well articulated, but um, and I, I think this could be uh, you know articulated much more ele elegantly than I do now. But um, coming from a point of practicing this kind of activism, um, you you don't necessarily see these questions at first because you're you're so kind of heads down into fighting the institution and then being aware that the institution. Uh, instrumentalizes you as well and then you kind of have to um, find a path in there you know because the, the terms of parity and diversity in the meantime they've became um, this this kind of look good um, uh, you know words for institutions and how do you use the institution to get to what you actually want without losing too much in it so it's really about this path um, We've also been working on like making sure that the term parity is not understood as this kind of binary, but much more uh, intended to, to as a kind of um, you know uh, synonym to to other much more um, larger spaces. So uh, I don't really have an answer about the institutionalization. I think that this is something that we're working very hard um, to to really. Um, uh, find ways around it or to use it. So maybe to be a little bit cunning about these things. Um, um, so, yeah. Thank you. Um, before I uh, ask my next question, um, perhaps I can also ask the other panelists if they wanted to respond either um, to each other or to Charlotte. Um, or I can ask the next question, um, which is to, 
<laughs> it's always a little bit hard when you're not in the room, right? Um, I think there's um, two things that Charlotte brought up that I'd really like to, um, to, to put on the table for us. Um, one is, um, of course, the, the concept of other, the other and otherness um, and how we can negotiate that. Um, and then the other... Um, is um, something, again, sorry, Marie-Louise, I keep referring to your writing um, because you were so good to, to share some of it and I hadn't read it in a few years and I'm, I'm sort of struck how it still resonates, but um, this, this concept of, um, uh, of architecture uh, as a culture isn't, of course, a new one, but, um, but in your writing, you refer to, in uh, Marie-Louise's writing, you consider the work of um, Dana Cuff, who um, is an architect and a theorist, uh, who demonstrates that this culture of practice, um, or proposes, pardon me, that this culture of practice of architecture originates in knowledge acquired in and through education, as well as uh, these routine actions performed through an architect's career. And you bring up the crit, for example, as, as one of many examples. Um, but this, um, but the starting point of education um, is uh, the site from which, um, for example, Charlotte, for your work uh, began, uh, and in particular the nine points of parity, which you, which you just raised. Um, but I wonder if we could uh, focus on this for a moment, because in this work, um, in your writing on this work, you also ask um, if it's been. Um, and you've just mentioned, um, if it's an example, uh, in being an example of how bottom-up initiatives can be successful, um, that it's also been co-opted as such. And so it's been a few years, um, you know, since you wrote that text and, and I'm uh, assuming from, from how you framed things that you think that this is the case, but I wonder if you could um, perhaps um, reflect on that or expand on that a bit further, especially uh, given that it's been a few years since, since you wrote that. Um, yeah, thank you. I mean, I think the, the question on the institutionalization of activism is really, um, you know, kind of a difficult one because, um, you know, the work that we've been doing started in 2014 and came from a, a very dark place of anger. Um, when we were really confronted to an institution that was, you know, uh, okay, I'm going to say it, white male central. Um, and I think that it really, um, because it came from a place of anger, it means that you don't necessarily have uh, the tools, you know, as a kind of junior uh, assistant, uh, you're on this kind of very fragile um, job situation we call them this ejectable seats contracts where you're basically having one year contract so if you're uh displeasing you can fall from grace very easily so i mean the, the kind of context is uh hostile i would say um and then as we moved on we realized very quickly that the institution was suspiciously supportive uh, and, you know, they were like, oh, yeah, you guys can do all these events and here's the money and you you, you kind of go with it. And then, um, of course, there's no uh, compensation of labor. You know, um, Marie-Louise was talking about this kind of emotional labor that comes with all this work. And um, you're just really working towards making this um, space less hostile for, um, for, for anyone who's not, you know, in the kind of dominant group. Um, uh, so you don't necessarily have all the tools at hand to analyze the situation. And then as you move forward and you see that the institution suddenly, for instance, there are like interviews in medias of the dean speaking of how great the school is doing because they have all these, um, uh, you know, groups that are working for, uh, you know, better situations and how this means, you know, um, the school is moving forward that actually... Uh, the work that is being done by these kind of collectives is being co-opted um, by the institution. And then the question is, how do you co-opt that back? Uh, you know, and that was, I was talking about this kind of negotiated um, space because it's practically impossible to walk away from those um, mechanisms because you operate within them. 
uh, you're also part of the problem to a certain extent, as you know, being part of uh, people who have the possibility to to study or to to teach in this kind of institution. And Esther's work is, you know, uh, trying to tackle that. So I'm just saying that when you're in there, you're also in these kind of positions of power, but they are semi-identified. You don't really know uh, where to act and on with who are your allies. You know, so it's it's kind of it's muddy and complicated. Um, but I think that maybe to be a little bit, um, uh, you know, uh, to, to play some theory on that, uh, there is always a kind of uh, a, a thought that, that goes with me since a long time, which is um, the fact that when there is uh, power, there is resistance, which is this kind of old Foucault uh, <laughs> sentence. Uh, but at the same time, it speaks of the possibility to uh, work within systems. And once you've kind of identified um, the power structures, and I think that takes time as well, and that is where, you know, the building up on other people's work is relevant and how you can also pass that work further um, uh, helps. But I think that in a way, the kind of uh, map power mapping or, you know, kind of being aware of the certain power structure of an institution then allows you to be very uh, tactical about um, about the, the ways to go. So yes, the institution will ins use you uh, because they, they can do that. And the other question is how do you not let that happen? So for instance, the parity group is a non-existing entity. It doesn't exist. It doesn't have a legal status. It's a very organic, fluid uh, group. Uh, it's like you, if you come to one meeting, you're part of the parity group. That's it. And that's kind of... Uh, also means that they, the parity group is made of um, students and, you know, grassroots uh, kind of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, you know, roots, grassroots roots, that makes no sense, but yeah, you get it. And um, it, it sets the agenda for the school, which means the agenda can never set up, be set up from the top. And that has been something that we've been very careful about, for instance. I mean, that's one of the ways that you can make sure that this or try not to uh, be in instrumentalized by an institution. But it's, it, it, is, um, it is a difficult uh, work, I would say. Absolutely. I think this, um, the relation to the institution um, and, and also, you know, um, having to negotiate your place within it is something I wanted to talk um, to Esther about um, because you operate outside, you, uh, you quite purposefully operate outside of that space and outside of that relationship. And so I wonder if you can um, maybe um, talk a bit about your experience in that and about that choice um, and about some of perhaps the um, perhaps some of the challenges or the opportunities um, in that choice. Yeah, um, absolutely. I, someone referred to office hours as a kind of para-institute the other day, and I thought that term was interesting. Um, I, I think uh, the choice to operate outside of an institution was important in, in so far that we could um, have some freedom around not only the, the dissemination and visibility of the work, but also the kinds of conversations you want to have. And I think for that reason, it's incredibly, it's an outlet for a lot of people to really talk about, just engage in real talk about what's what they're experiencing. Um, and, and in that sense, it's not really, um, it's not an institute in the sense that it's educational explicitly, but I think we operate in that node between education and, and industry. Um, for that reason, um, you know, Charlotte, you were talking about co-opting. Uh, the the gamut of how office hours has tried to be co-opted by a number of different other organizations has been really um, interesting to observe <laughs> um, and navigate, um, um, as well as you know corporations interested in um, sort of the optical value of sort of what we do, and um, it's been really difficult to sort of understand. Uh, people's intentions. And so in terms of one of the, there's basically two strategies that I deploy, which are in, in some ways very simple and in some ways very difficult. The first is to ask people to tell me what their intentions are. Um, and I'll be very forthcoming about what my intentions are. Um, and then we can see if sort of the methods and methodologies meet the 
meet the metier in some ways, like meet the meet the intentions or the values that you're trying to promote. And the second is um, saying no and explaining why. And it can be really pedantic and a kind of labor that I'm not particularly fond of. But, um, you know, I have been known to write emails. Um, you know, other people associated with office hours have been known to write emails um, in, re- in relation to requests that we've received um, that have felt very rest- extractive, explaining that, you know, this dynamic feels extractive. This is why. This is our position. Um, and, you know, it becomes an opportunity. It's the extra sort of work in some ways, and some people are not open to it, Um you know, I, I have been known to even send links to studies of, uh, you know, theoretical articles, uh, different forms of literature in order to um, not necessarily only make us like I want to avoid making assumptions from people, but also to try to bridge a, conver- a greater conversation, um, because oftentimes the folks that are approaching, um, you know, office hours or even approaching me to, you know, participate in different events. Um, and, and sometimes it can feel extractive, it, you know, it, it it um it becomes an opportunity to also f- for myself really selfishly to um clarify sort of what what my terms are of engagement and and i will say as you saw i mean i wasn't expecting to feel emotional you know it, this is like you know early in the morning in new york and i'm talking about office hours and yet i got really choked up and it's in some ways very unusual for me to do that publicly but i think um you know this work is is it's not um it's not a theoretical experiment it's not, I mean, it is, but it also comes from lived experience. And, you know, as we discussed earlier with, you know, Marie Louise's writing, it's um, a really important point around emotion that that also becomes really difficult and fatiguing to have to explain that, you know, in particular, like being in uh, an Asian woman right now in New York is a very difficult experience. There are a lot of attacks. Uh, I have experienced a lot of inhospitable behavior recently. And um, so it it just becomes difficult sometimes to separate that line um, and the labor of the work relative to your life. Um, So anyways, that's a a whole lot that I just threw at you. But yeah, I, I think that's sort of how I try to navigate it as best I can. And to have to be really clear about boundaries and to listen to when things feel off to really um, pause and try to examine why they might be. And to, and again, this is where language language comes in to be able to articulate why that might feel off. And that can be an incredibly labor intensive exercise, but also really clarifying for oneself. Um, so yeah, I hope that, I hope that made sense. It makes a lot of sense. And uh, yeah, I, I completely understand that. Uh kind of position, um, especially in this question of, um, or, or your reference to emotion, um, because often we're, we're told that, you know, there's this sort of, if there's an emotional response that, um, that one is irrational. Yeah, uh, I think Mary Louise brought this up earlier. Um, and I, I wonder if we can kind of go back to this idea of, um, of uh, anger or um, refusal. Um, not as a negative, uh, because we're going to try and avoid the binary, um, but as something that can be um, possibly um, useful um, or something, again, to be negotiated and understood as being you know, part of this experience. So I wonder, Marie-Louise, if you could maybe um, expand on maybe some of your earlier comments, but also on, on the importance of um, emotion in this kind of work. Hmm. No, thank you. I, I think that's a really valid question. I think um, both Charlotte and, and Esther have raised really, really uh, beautiful points when it comes to this. Um, when, it, when it comes to, to emotion, I think it's, it's, it's connected to something really real, right? And I think it comes from a real place and a real frustration of coming up against all these walls. And I was thinking of what Esther was talking about, about them. Um, uh, but still you need to survive because you're doing all this work and it's, it's, it is em- like emotionally intense labor. But how can we give value to that without commodification and how can we sustain it? 
that's that's one aspect of it. But also, it's it is this fuel that that also moves us forward. The anger, uh, the the ways in which we need to give. Uh, to, to have our our experiences validated um, in this world, I think it's, it's, it's very much how I navigate these things. And I think what was said about hearing and listening, language becomes this tool, I think, to, to think through these things um, and use, use language to articulate it, to move through these um, situation. But I think it's incredibly important to try and understand how we can sustain it, uh, you know, in terms of getting paid and having the work acknowledged uh, without complication. So I just wanted to, 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 to bring that into the conversation because we also were talking about the optics and, and, and all that. Thank you. Um, Charlotte or Esther, did you want to respond? Yeah, I, I'm. I'm really. Um I'm really struck by by Marie Louise, and and uh, I really want to pick up on something um, that you said about the value to the emotions, and I, I just maybe want to ping pong back to Esther because um, there is a kind of looming, um, uh, let's say. Uh, uh, feeling over her own work and i think it it, it um, speaks of the generosity that such a work entails and i just wanted to ask esther um about that particular um aspect of the work because um it is something and i just want to to maybe link it to one of the um, um, conversation that we had a while ago in the parity uh, kind of initiative, which was the idea that, um, so it was specifically about curriculums and how you would uh, address the fact that some people have been teaching the same thing since 20 years. And it's not about firing these people, really. It is about um, some kind of uh, accompanying work where you would sit together and you would look at that work and you'll be like, well, you know, how about that? And and that was brought um, within the framework of generosity and how you would sit and, you know, spend some time and, and do that work with the people. And, and I, I just want to, um, um, you know, uh, ask Esther because of the incredible uh, work that she's doing with um, Office Hour. H how would you uh, reflect on these questions of generosity in in um, you know in the frame of this activism that um, that you do? Yeah, thanks for that question. I I don't really. S I guess you could see it as generosity, but I then I get nervous because I think some folks see it as charity, and I don't. I see it as justice. And if anything, I think part of me getting emotional talking about office hours is just, it comes back to like your point about anger, you know, and, and frustration that I, I had, I found myself wondering after I did my PhD at Princeton, you know, I've had the great fortune of someone who should not have ended up, uh, you know, get amassing so much education. I mean, you know, I'm like a full fledged nerd and I've been in school for a very long time, but how is it that I have navigated four institutions amassing degrees. And yet I've had one person of color as an instructor in uh, over a span of about 20 years. Um, that just feels wrong. Um, and I, I meeting young people 20 years, my junior who have had the same and continue to have the same experience to me just seems wrong. And so I think for me, it's, I, you know, I, I have to always try to be very mindful of not projecting myself and my subjectivity and centering myself in, in the work, but there is such a strong self-identification for me that I had to wonder why it was that I was given such a pr immense privilege and opportunity to get this incredible education and what I could do with it. Because, um, you know, I will say like, you know, there are a lot of very privileged people that, you know, I had the great fortune of, you know, learning alongside, but I def my experience was definitely an anomaly. And I think that the Academy among other places like industry do a very good job of trying to keep out certain kinds of subjectivities. And so it's really the, the, 
I think in some ways, almost a grief that I felt for my younger self that I saw through the experience of all of these young people who continue to have the same experience and who continue to feel so alienated and unseen and unheard that it just felt like my, my ethical, moral responsibility to use whatever skills and experience that I've had to, to do this thing. And I've just been so, I think I got choked up talking about all the people that have gone on board this experiment because the speakers have all been so willing and so, so generous. It's the speakers that are so generous with their time and their knowledge and their honesty and um, their commitment. And they just see, they just understand tacitly the importance of the work because they have also experienced it. So it's, I, I'm so indebted to them because this never could have, you know, taken shape without people um, agreeing and saying yes. And, and I don't, you know, it's been so easy in some ways to program for that reason. Um, but I just wanted to say too, that um, instead of thinking about in terms of generosity, I keep thinking about um, Marshall Salins wrote a book called uh, What Kinship Is and Is Not. I'm like looking at this book right now and it's a very small, very small, small book. Um, and he writes about this, um, the New Guineans of the Nebula Valley, <clears throat> where there's an idea around kinship uh, that's actually activated through a, what's, I'm probably mispronouncing it, but a substance called kopong, which is a kind of grease. And this grease can be found in mother's milk or father's semen, but also in sweet potatoes and in pork. Um, so in other words, kinship can be familial in terms of, pro, you know, kind of offspring, but also two people can be brothers and sisters um, because they were sustained by the same soil, right? Like they, they ate off the land together and um, I think that made me really think about how ritual is actually what brings us together as much as it can be about, you know, as opposed to sort of essentializing definitions of identity that might come from things like, um, you know, where we're from, et cetera, et cetera. Ritual and the responsibility to ourselves and to each other and to the land that we we cultivate and we we, we profit off of them and that we extract from, et cetera, et cetera. And so then I you know, I start to query whether or not world making, which is the task of architecture and design, could not also operate on the same basis for enacting a, a, this kind of mutual mutuality of being that Marshall Salins, you know, talks about. Um, and and for this reason, the kind of set of cultural practices that are associated with architecture and design really need to, you know, really require as many diverse participants in this act of shaping the world. So I know that sounds a little tangential, but I think in some ways for me intrinsically that this idea of being together in community, which inherently raises flags around immunity of who doesn't belong, but that the act of world making itself should in inherently in some ways um, be rethought as a practice of what it means to be together. Um, um, and in and, and, and that sense, to return to your question on curriculum, et cetera, I think the entire thing could be rethought. Thank you. I yeah, this this um, rethinking or, or reconstruction um, or a different uh, making of a different world, a different possibility is um, really resonant through I think all of your work um, in in very clear but different ways. And so um, and also this I think it's not tangential at all. This this um, this idea of kinship and ritual also makes me think, um, makes me recall this question of learned behaviors. Um, and in learned behaviors, what do we uh, take with us? What do we incorporate into um, our everyday and what do we not? And I think, um, as I'm mindful of the time, I might wrap, I might conclude by saying that, you know, I think what's so, um, you know, I have to say inspiring um, and, and moving about all of your works um, is that there is this um, impetus, this real drive to um, establish new rituals, new shared rituals. It's not to exclude anyone, um, but instead to really recognize difference um, in a way that allows us to, you know, move forward, but in a way that's responsible um, to, to ourselves and each other, as, as Esther so eloquently said at the very end. So um, I want to, to thank you all for, for your incredible generosity and time today um, and in sharing um, your own personal experiences because these are, of course, personal. Um, and, and I also want to um, 
perhaps um, make space for questions from Telegram if there are any, um, or if we have time for that. But I'll pass it off to Vera for that. Thank you, Elise. Um, we are going to have to go and talk about ways of being together and new forms of togetherness in our next segment. Thank you so much, everybody, for sharing and for your time today. Um, these issues that we've been talking about over the course of this panel resonate a lot with some of the issues that we've been discussing as part of our workshop program. And in our next segment, we're going to be talking to two different um, workshop leaders that did two different workshops as part of our virtual workshop program. Um, the first uh, workshop that we're going to be talking about is called Crafting Narratives Through Repair. And it tries to weave in notions of repair and fiction narrative to talk about many of the topics that we discussed over the course of the last round table. So new ways of world making, new ways of telling stories. And I'm here with Cynthia and Elif, who were, um, who were leading this workshop yesterday uh, with students and participants from all over the world. Um, Cynthia and Elif, they proposed this workshop as part of our open call for architectural students, architectural students in various disciplines all over the world, and their workshop then became part of our program. Cynthia and Elif, it's great to have you here. Cynthia, do you want to tell us a little bit about what uh, your workshop was about? Yeah, and uh, first of all, thank you so much, Vera, for this opportunity to share with um, such a great, um, amazing, incredible set of participants also. And um, our um, workshop, well, to start with, I suppose, the like nuts and bolts, we, um, we asked people to bring objects in need of repair, which uh, we left vague on purpose. So kind of broadly speaking, and um, and to bring a collection of things that might be useful for repairs. And so our participants were bringing all kinds of things from like a, a stone elephant with a missing leg, a dead plant, a jacket with a whole mask with um, um, broken elastic. And we worked through um, three short activities together. We spent 20 minutes attempting a repair um, 10 minutes to, I mean, 20 minutes to sketch imagined scenarios from the, the kind of the timeline of this object, and then 10 minutes to build from the other two activities to craft a six word story. And kind of um, prefacing all of that, we um, did a short primer on how, how we were thinking about repair, I think, well, um, I, Elif can expand on this, but I'll just say really quickly that we were very inspired among other things by Mabel Wilson's idea of radical repair, which is not interested in restoration, but rather in something that is more transformative and that recognizes um, that recognizes violent disruption, social divisions, kind of um, systemic um, issues that have occurred in the past that are ongoing that, um, that require repairing forward, so to speak. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there, but there's much more to say. Elif, I know that there was a fiction component and a narrative component that was a very important component of your workshop. Can you tell us? A little bit about that component. Yes, um, so we um, were thinking that repair is not just about repairing the object, but it's also about um, crafting new connections between the material and the stories that it participates in. Um, such that seeing an object as containing many stories, many lives allows us to craft um, potential worlds around these stories. And some of these worlds may involve uh, potential futures, possible alternative presence, um, and some may even be totally improbable, but 
there is still value in uh, thinking about the fantastic and um, perhaps it's a way of like taking stock and looking more deeply in the world and in the um, in the world's inherent and in the objects around us. This is a, a project that it's not the first time that you do this kind of workshop. You've done it several times already. Um, and you've also, I guess, learned a lot from the different iterations of, of this process. What are some of your key takeaways from this process so far? And has the workshop that you did in the framework of Archipelago given you some ideas for where you might want to take this project further? Maybe I'll ask Cynthia first. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, we started thinking about this um, during our thesis where we were trying to use different techniques of repair. Um, we, we actually, like as part of the process, we would um, use uh, broken structural components, um, like miniature, and then we would repair them using things that we found on hand. And it was always um, a very kind of material, um, kind of physical experience. And, but the whole thesis process and all the workshops that have kind of sprung from some of that thinking um, have occurred during the COVID pandemic. So in, despite the like material, the importance of the material handling, um, and I think, you know, being able to work physically together was important to us too. Um, despite that, we had to kind of think about how this would work in a virtual setting. And I think that has shaped a lot of how we're approaching the workshop. Um, and we were actually reflecting that somehow holding repair workshops virtually allows, maybe it allows people to bring more of themselves uh, to a space than a physical workshop when you're at a table that already has tools and things you know, on the table because all of our participants were bringing um, not just the thing that they wanted to uh, repair in some way, but also their, their room, their tools, their current circumstances, you know, all of that into, into the conversation. Um, and I, we thought that was really valuable and really important in the kind of collective project of repair that we're seeking to be part of. Thank you, Cynthia. Elif, do you have any other thoughts to add to, to that? Yeah, and um, I, I think one of the uh, like incredible moments in the workshop was when um, uh, the conversation found itself in this realm of discussing whether repair-centered design has a specific aesthetic agenda. And one of our participants, Nina, brought up this incredibly interesting question that I will try to paraphrase here, but apologies if I butcher it. And it was, to what extent are the aesthetics of repair purely a result of the process? Done quickly using the means of hand and the appearance becomes a visual record of the procedure. And to what extent, as a designer, do you author the aesthetics and do something because you are intrinsically taught that it looks good? And as part of a like the context of a repair workshop, as this like pedagogical model, having that question come up was very incredibly sort of a self-reflexive moment. And I think it can lead us to discuss further like issues surrounding um, like architecture schools obsession, for example, with uh, like claiming singular authorship um, and how like repair by its patchy nature and methodology intrinsically challenges that notion. Mm -hmm. Issues of maintenance yeah. and care are of course central to the discourse that we, we are trying to have here today. And I think that it's crucial, the kind of work that you were doing. And I'm absolutely impressed that, you know, it, 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 this becomes a concern of yours already in the midst of your studies. I mean, this is something, has it become apparent recently or was it something that you were always interested in when you, since you started studying architecture? 
Well, I think, um, you know, to the idea that repair operates on multiple scales and dimensions beyond the, the material, you know, like the things that we're repairing by hand, um, there's the aspect of repair of relationships, of repair of historic narratives that, um, I mean, these are all things that I think are, are part of what um, the archipelago program has been thinking through too. But there's also you no know, ecological repair and, and disciplinary repair is certainly part of that. And I think in the last year, maybe two years, um, that has been accelerated, at least in the you know, architectural worlds that we're part of. Um, uh, due to, in the U.S., the kind of national reckoning um, when George Floyd was murdered and, you know, countless other, uh, you know, things that have, caught, that have, you know, brought these issues that have been happening into the mainstream in a way that has even impacted the architecture dis discipline. And um, so I think, you know, and in, in that has led a lot of people to, um, to proclaim that yes, the architecture discipline needs repair too. And I think that's, you know, as, as I was saying, I think Archipelago very much is like part of that project. <laughs> and um, so I think, yes, there is like a recent like movement towards it, but I think we've also um, just, to touch on it briefly, Elif and I were part of a team of, um, of GSD students who were interested in informal material networks. Uh, and we undertook a project in Mexico City uh, five years ago where we were thinking about waste. What does waste actually mean? Um, and the how the idea of waste shifts across cultures. And I think a lot of that thinking has also led us to um, thinking about repair in architecture as well. OK, okay guys, um, I'm going to thank you for sharing your experience. We actually had another workshop in our virtual workshop program that also dealt with ideas of care and community and forming different relations through um, microbial, at, at a microbial scale even. And I think we have Serena Tarkanian here with us to tell us also a little bit about the workshop. Um, the title of the workshop was The Microbial Bathhouse, and it proposed an island of what Serena calls co-healers that would materially experiment with the architecture of the body as a site for becoming together as microbial beings. Um, Serena did a series of trainings with participants in, around this idea of uh, creating a new vision of what she calls a bathhouse centered around mutual health. Serena, are you are you here with us? I am. I can hear you. Hello. <clears throat> can you hear me? Hello. Hello. There she Hi. is. Hi, Hi Serena. <laughs> Thanks for joining Hi. us. Hi. Thank so you tell for us having about me. The experience. How was it to create a microbial bathhouse in the context of Archipelago? Well, I think it <clears throat> it was a really nice experience uh, to to do this within this context because um, Maybe perhaps to touch upon something that was just discussed in the previous conversation is this notion of ritual um, as, as something that brings people together uh, and notions of responsibility and, and kinship, kinship within uh, the, this notion of the ritual. And so what um, I've been inquiring on through my design practice is how, uh, how our microbial bodies can uh, become a source of health for one another as opposed to uh, unhealth. And I think in the context of the pandemic, it's uh, it's actually been even more urgent to kind of talk about these things, uh, about probiotic practices of health 
Um, and so specifically, I was um, very excited to work with participants uh, who have perhaps a shared interest in the microbial body and an under understanding um, how the microbial body works and how uh, Western biomedicine has kind of created these narratives around, around uh, bodies that are very much antibiotic and uh, how that has also kind of um, within a context of, a, of practices of care that are historically, when you look at the, the, the patient-doctor relationship, the kind of Greco-Roman history of that, how a certain paternalism has trickled down into the way that we kind of design um, and think of new uh, biomedical practices of health. And so I, um, perhaps to contextualize a little bit the work of the, of the workshop, you know, I've been working on developing uh, tools uh, that enable people to co-heal with one another, to exchange their, their microbes. Um, and this is a practice that I call co-healing. And so it really is a way of using, perhaps I could say maybe a microbiome transplant as a technique that has been uh, developed by biomedicine. Uh, but to, to rethink how those things are designed um, to, and to think about how we can design those things in a way that don't reproduce these um, hierarchical uh, care uh, structures so that, you know, the doctor is on top and then the patient is on the bottom and is kind of like a passive receiver of care. So what I had, uh, what I had participants do in this workshop was I showed them different techniques, microbiology techniques, um, such as uh, producing your own petri dish, um, nutrients, uh, agar that enables you to then uh, culture your body's microbes and see and, and come to meet your, your bodily microbes this way. But then taking that very traditional kind of, um, technique and experimenting with how you can produce this material that it usually is in a super aseptic kind of environment and lab environment and how that material can become, um, can be infected, so to speak, uh, and, and molded uh, with the body as opposed to kind of this traditional uh, structure of, of, um, of how they're used. And so I, I had them kind of create a, a nutrient dough, let's say, um, that they could, uh, that would be uh, a feed for their microbes and that they would mold to different parts of their bodies to experiment and see what would grow from that. Um, and this was a really interesting kind of practice because I think that a lot of people, um, uh, it encouraged for a lot of the participants to encourage them to, uh, interact with their body and their body, their body's microbes in a way that they are not used to doing. Um, and perhaps in, in that kind of weirdness to, to have fun with it. And then the, the, you know, we had a lot of conversations around vernacular practices of health as well. And that was really central as well to the conversation because um, one of the things I think that is uh, super important in shifting how, um, you know, shifting kind of the, the way that biomedicine is, is designed um, and to making those practices a bit I think less mm, patriarchal, let's say, less isolationistic um, and less depersonalized is to bring into the, the, the mix, the knowledges that people uh, embody, their health knowledges that they embody. And I call that somatic phronesis. So we did a lot of exercises to tap into those kinds of knowledges. Um, so we, you know, people brought up things on about witchcraft practices, um, brought up, uh, uh, things like ref reflexology, um, natural healing, um, you know, different things like this, that is not really taking it into account, uh, when in, in biomedicine, um, which is quite problematic. I mean, we, a perfect example of that, of that is how, for example, indigenous communities um, who come into biomedical establishments are very much um, uh, put aside and, and not understood or thought of as people who have uh, a very rich history of healing practices. And those practices are not valued. So the question was really, how do we bring that into these questions of um, 
a more than antimicrobial practice of healing with one another? What are the responsibilities that come into play in this? Um, so, of course, thinking about uh, things like uh, this notion of responsibility that Donna Haraway brings brings up that is very important. And the, the way that we kind of closed this experience was around a uh, joint bathing uh, ritual that we did. Um, and I think it would be nice to kind of show uh, the image number four that I shared with uh, with you guys, um, uh, where you know the group is kind of each of us is in our tub, and we collectively on Zoom um, kind of started doing to do this uh, collaborative co-created ritual, and the entire ritual basically goes through different parts of the body. Each participant. Um, was kind of gifting the group uh, a moment of interacting with uh, the the microbes of a certain part of your body uh, and to tap into those responsibilities that are linked to that and how that really links us in a way and that are that shows us that we don't have to only interact in anti uh, microbial ways but also more probiotic ways. Thank you, Serena, and thank you so much for opening up this door to a new kind of being together. It is also this thought and this forms of thinking across scale that we really welcome as part of the programming of our event. And we've come to the end of the first part of our event today. Um, we will be back in 15 minutes at 4.30 uh, to start the second part of our programming, which will be dedicated to the theme of working with, working with each other, working across scales, working with one another. Join us in 15 minutes. I hope to see you there.
de, du programme de Archipelago, Archipelago Architectures for the Multiverse. Nous sommes ici à la régie. La thématique de cette euh, deuxième partie de notre programme aujourd'hui parle de collaboration, travailler avec. Si vous voyez la régie d'Archipelago, c'est impossible de faire un événement de cette échelle et avec cette ambition, on sent le travail collaboratif de beaucoup de monde. Alors ici, je vous donne un peu un, un aperçu de ce qui se passe dehors le 7. Mais nous, nous, nous irons maintenant vers le 7 où, où nous trouverons le, les invités pour notre prochaine discussion qui parle de nouvelles formes de collaboration et nouvelles formes de travailler ensemble. Mais avant, euh, la discussion qui serait modérée par Myriam Chabani, une de nos modératrices, je vous invite à découvrir le travail d'une de, de nos invitées, Céline Baumann, une architecte paysagiste, qui nous présentera son regard sur la ville, la ville de Genève comme point de départ, pour parler des thématiques liées à la collaboration, liées au genre dans la ville, dans la nature, dans la ville à plusieurs échelles. J'invite à découvrir le travail de Céline. Je m'appelle Céline Baumann, je suis paysagiste, j'habite à Bâle. Et je m'intéresse depuis quelques années à la question du genre dans mon métier. Et qu est -ce que, comment est-ce que le genre peut informer l'espace public la nature, euh, notre vision de la ville. C'est une question qui, à première vue, peut-être euh, peut paraître déplacée. On peut se dire pourquoi le genre, euh, la, city la ville n'est-elle pas neutre La nature n'est-elle pas douce et féminine Et euh, j'ai l'impression qu'en regardant ces questions d'un peu plus près, on peut avoir une vision différente, peut-être, euh, de la ville et de nos métiers en tant qu'architecte et paysagiste. Et je voudrais peut-être, euh, dans un premier temps, parler de la question de la nature et un peu de la diversité d'expression sexuelle que l'on trouve euh, dans, le, dans la flore. Euh, C'est un projet que je mène depuis quelques années, qui s'appelle Queer Nature, et qui montre cette diversité d'expression sexuelle dans les plantes, les arbres, les fleurs, Également la façon dont elle a été découverte et perçue par euh, les hommes de science. On peut se demander si euh, la nature a un genre, et si oui, quel est-il le genre de la nature Il y a cette idée assez préconçue, assez stéréotypée de la nature à quelque chose de doux, délicat, de coloré, de parfumé qui aurait de ce fait un lien avec la féminité. Il y a également cette idée de mère nature, qui soit quelque chose de productif, de fertile, donc évidemment associé à la féminité. En fait, quand on regarde les plantes d'un peu plus près, elles ont une très grande diversité d'expressions sexuelles. Et si on regarde ce magnolia, par exemple, euh, on se rend compte que c'est, euh, si on regarde la fleur, on se rend compte que c'est une fleur qui est une fleur euh, hermaphrodite. C'est-à-dire qu'elle a à la fois des parties mâles et des parties femelles qui composent l'ensemble de la fleur. C'est ce que les botanistes appellent une fleur parfaite. Euh, les plantes à fleurs sont celles qui se sont développées le plus récemment au cours de l'évolution, il y a environ 120 millions d'années. Et euh, ce sont également euh, les plantes qui sont le plus répandues de nos jours. Il y a 95% environ de toutes les plantes que l'on connaît qui sont des plantes à fleurs. C'est quelque chose que Darwin euh, trouvait incompréhensible. Il a écrit une lettre assez euh, connue au directeur des jardins botaniques de Kew en expliquant, en disant « je ne comprends pas, euh, c'est un, vraiment une question euh, abominable que je n'arrive pas à répondre ». Certainement, le fait que les plantes à fleurs ont connu un tel succès vient du fait qu'elles ont la possibilité de se reproduire soit en étant pollinisées par d'autres fleurs, ou soit également en se pollinisant elles-mêmes, ce qui leur permet, si les conditions ne sont pas réunies, d'attendre de, de se propager, d'attendre que les conditions climatiques euh, leur soient plus favorables. Il y a un autre type de plante que l'on trouve juste ici, juste à côté. C'est un très très beau cèdre. Les conifères sont apparus il y a plus longtemps dans 
un peu avant les plantes à fleurs dans l'évolution. Et on, ce qu'on voit ici, c'est qu'elles ont euh, deux types euh, d'organes de, sexuels qui sont sur la même plante. Donc là, ce qu'on voit, les cônes, c'est la partie femelle de la fleur qui va ensuite euh, donner les, euh, les graines. Si on regarde un peu plus loin, on voit également ces inflorescences, qui sont les inflorescences mâles de la fleur, qui sont déjà un peu séchées ici. Mais si on, on ouvre un peu là, cette inflorescence, on voit les petits points jaunes, c'est toutes les parties pollen et mâles de la fleur. Donc ça veut dire que c'est une plante qui a les deux types, mâle et femelle, mais... Euh, sur la même arbre, mais qui sont séparés, qui sont à des endroits différents. C'est une, euh, une caractéristique qui est connue chez beaucoup de plantes euh, à aiguilles, chez beaucoup de conifères. Il y a également les pins ou également les mélèzes qui ont cette euh, caractéristique. Également d'autres plantes comme les bouleaux, les chênes, les hêtres, qui partagent également ce, cette caractéristique. Il y a une troisième catégorie euh, de plantes quand on... Euh, on parle du genre dans les plantes, c'est les plantes qui s'appellent dioïques, c'est-à-dire qu'un individu a soit, et soit mâle, soit femelle. C'est ce qu'on voit ici avec cette if, euh, qui est par exemple que mâle. C'est ce qu'on voit si on regarde, là, il n'a que des inflorescences mâles. Surtout l'arbre. Les arbres femelles se reconnaissent assez facilement car ils produisent des petites baies rouges qui sont assez appréciées par les jardiniers en tant que euh, et décoratives. C'est un arbre euh, qui est assez... Cette catégorie est assez ancienne, mais on la retrouve aussi, par exemple, chez les ginkgo, et également chez certains fruitiers, comme les kiwis ou euh, les palmiers dattiers. La reproduction sexuée euh, chez les plantes est, euh, est une découverte euh, étonnamment euh, assez récente. Pourtant, la reproduction sexuée chez les plantes, donc la pollinisation, est utilisée depuis... Euh, des temps, euh, euh, depuis euh, les débuts de l'histoire de l'humanité. Elle était également utilisée soit pour des raisons agricoles ou pour des raisons horticoles. Par exemple, les Hollandais ont euh, fait de nombreuses variétés de tulipes, ce qui a mené au premier, à la première bulle spéculative de l'histoire de l'humanité et également au premier euh, crash financier avec la tulipe mania au XVIIe siècle, pendant laquelle le prix d'un bulbe de tulipe est passé euh, du prix d'un oignon au prix euh, d'une maison euh, au bord du canal d'Amsterdam avant de s'effondrer à nouveau. Le premier botaniste qui a, eu une, euh, qui a fait une classification des plantes sexuées, c'est le botaniste Linné. Et sa classification des plantes, il a fait en comptant le nombre euh, d'étamines, donc le nombre de parties euh, masculines de la plante. Et le plus la plante avait de parties masculines, le plus d'étamines, le plus haut elle était dans la classification. Donc c'était une classification euh, patriarcale, euh, assez sexiste, on va dire, euh, du monde végétal. Hum, également, l'inné, quand il a mis au point cette classification sexuée des plantes, ça n'a pas du tout été accepté aussi facilement, car ça allait à l'encontre de nombreux archétypes sur le fait euh, que la nature soit euh, pure, euh, féminine, tout d'un coup, euh, toute cette multiplicité de, de genres euh, dans le monde végétal, ça allait à l'encontre complètement euh, des idées de l'époque. Et euh, c'est euh, assez intéressant quand on y pense, le fait qu'on regarde toujours euh, la nature, ce qui nous entoure avec euh, les yeux de notre époque. Et c'est assez intéressant certainement, de, maintenant qu'on a regardé la nature et qu'on a étudié ces différences de, de genre, de voir comment est-ce que ça peut nous aider aussi à euh, porter un autre regard sur la ville. Et si on regarde à la ville avec cette question du genre, est-ce que ça peut nous apporter une nouvelle façon de considérer euh, les espaces publics autour de nous Une question que je me pose souvent, c'est celle de la neutralité de la ville. Est-ce que les espaces publics sont vraiment inclusifs Sont-ils vraiment neutres pour tout le monde euh, Je trouve que la question du genre permet d'apporter un, un autre regard sur euh, qu'est-ce que, qu que la ville et qu'est-ce que sont les espaces, et surtout, qui décide Parce que les gens qui décident vont déterminer ensuite la morphologie euh, urbaine. Je me retrouve souvent dans mon métier de paysagiste, dans des réunions avec les architectes, les acteurs de la ville, qui sont un groupe que je trouve très homogène, 
est très peu représentatif des futurs utilisateurs de l'espace. Et euh, par exemple, un thème qui revient souvent, c'est le thème des équipements publics. Quels sont les équipements, les sports, les activités qu'on va mettre en place dans les espaces publics Et le skatepark, c'est un très bon exemple pour ça, parce que c'est toujours très plébiscité. On trouve toujours que c'est une idée géniale de mettre un skatepark. C'est vrai qu'aussi, ça fonctionne très très bien, c'est très très occupé, très animé. La question, c'est aussi, euh, mais qui occupe en fait euh, cet espace Et si on regarde les statistiques, euh, il y a environ euh, 90% des jeunes qui utilisent le skatepark qui sont plutôt des garçons. C'est lié au fait certainement que pour faire du skate, euh, il faut, c'est un sport assez physique, euh, assez dangereux aussi, du coup qui est plutôt stéréotypé euh, garçon. Alors comment faire pour euh, aller au-delà de ça et pour pouvoir proposer des activités qui, qui laissent aussi la place aux filles si on regarde encore une fois les statistiques, on se rend compte qu'il y a différents types de sports qui sont aussi euh, plébiscités par les filles. Et par exemple, euh, le badminton, le volleyball, ou alors le patin à roulettes, mais sur des surfaces plutôt plates. Car ce sont des sports qui requièrent différentes qualités. Qualités d'agilité, euh, de coordination, qui sont plus souvent liées à des qualités euh, féminines. Euh, je ne dis pas, j'aimerais bien aussi que plus de filles fassent des sports physiques, mais ça, je ne peux pas l'influencer. Et du coup, ce regard sur les variétés d'équipement, c'est une façon de me demander, moi, en tant qu'acteur de l'espace public, en tant que paysagiste, comment apporter une plus grande diversité dans l'espace. La ville de Genève se pose des questions euh, sur ces problématiques de genre dans l'espace public et a publié en 2017 les résultats d'un rapport du géographe Yves Rebaud qui s'interroge sur la part des hommes et des femmes dans les activités sportives et qui arrive au résultat assez étonnant que 70% de toutes les subventions qui sont données par la ville aux activités sportives, aux différentes infrastructures, sont à 70% utilisées pour des infrastructures plutôt genrées hommes. Donc c'est assez aberrant comme résultat. Tout de même, ce qui est positif, c'est déjà le simple fait que la ville ait engagé ce rapport, qu'il ait été publié en ligne. Tout le monde peut y accéder. Et la... ce rapport pose la question également de l'occupation de l'espace public, mais également de la représentativité. Et dans ce domaine, la ville de Genève fait des efforts et essaye d'apporter des modifications dans certains euh, domaines de l'espace public pour permettre euh, aux femmes d'être euh, plus visibles. Nous nous trouvons ici sur la place Lise Girardin, ancienne place des 22 cantons. C'est une place qui a été renommée en hommage à euh, la première maire de Genève, femme, qui était également la première femme maire de Suisse, Lise Girardin, en 1969. En effet, la question de la place du genre dans l'espace public, c'est également une question de représentativité. Euh, à Genève, 5% du nom des rues sont attribués à des femmes. C'est un chiffre qui est très bas. Euh, c'est quelque chose qui a été mis en avant par euh, le collectif L'Esquade, un collectif euh, féministe, activiste, à implanté à Genève, qui, avec la démarche sans elle, a proposé à la ville des alternatives des noms de femmes importantes de la ville de Genève qui auraient leur nom dans l'espace public. Donc nous avons la chance que la ville de Genève les a entendues et a changé certains noms de rues. Ce qu'on peut dire, c'est que peut-être cette question de représentativité ne s'arrête pas seulement euh, au genre, elle a d'autres répercussions. C'est ce qu'on a pu voir euh, récemment avec euh, la mort de George Floyd et le mouvement Black Lives Matter qui a entraîné le déboulonnage de statues liées à un passé colonial. C'est toutes ces questions dans la ville qui doivent être intégrées et être prises en compte. Également, peut-être la question qui se pose, c'est quel est notre rôle en tant qu'architecte, en tant que paysagiste, en tant que personne qui façonnons l'espace et qui façonnons la ville Comment pouvons-nous aussi agir en fait, sur ces thématiques j'ai l'impression qu'un point de vue qui est important, peut-être, c'est toujours d'essayer de remettre en cause la question de normalité. Est-ce que les choses qui sont normales le sont vraiment Est-ce que les choses qui sont neutres le sont vraiment Et d'essayer peut-être d'aller de, euh, voir de, euh, au-delà de la pellicule de ce qui est euh, normal et neutre 
pour voir si c'est vraiment euh, la vérité. Euh, et je l'espère, peut-être euh, grâce à ça, permettre de créer une ville et des espaces publics qui peuvent être plus ouverts, plus égalitaires, plus inclusifs et permettre euh, à une diversité de, de personnes de pouvoir vivre en ville comme il y a une diversité de plantes qui ont une diversité d'expression également dans la nature. De pouvoir être inspiré de la nature pour créer un espace public plus inclusif. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Aujourd'hui, notre conversation « Working with » va porter sur nos modes de travail collaboratif. Travailler avec qui, avec quoi et à partir de quel référentiel Pour éclairer cette question, j'ai le plaisir d'accueillir Céline Bauman, paysagiste, euh, Mathias Etchanov, euh, urbaniste et cofondateur de Herbs, Antoine Gay et Aurélien Raymond, respectivement membres du collectif Galta. Vous qui nous suivez, vous pouvez également contribuer à, à la conversation en nous posant des questions sur Telegram que nous prendrons à la fin de cet échange. Euh, Céline Bowman, euh, c'est votre vidéo qui évoque la question du genre dans la nature et son impact également dans, dans l'espace public qui introduit euh, cet échange. Et votre travail vous amène à, à, à considérer la nature comme un partenaire, euh, voire comme un complice. Donc qu'apportent ces types de partenariats non humains à votre sens euh, et à votre rapport au monde Oui, donc dans ma pratique de paysagiste, j'essaye de voir de quelle façon est-ce qu'on peut euh, s'inspirer de la nature, lier des partenariats entre humains et non-humains. Euh, je voulais montrer cette image qui passe ici à l'écran, euh, qui a été prise durant les, les démonstrations pour Occupy London en 2011, à la suite de la crise financière de 2009, que je trouve très frappante. Euh, Pouvez-vous nommer ces, ces marques Tout le monde peut le faire très bien, mais pouvez-vous pouvez -vous nommer ces plantes Tout d'un coup, ça devient beaucoup plus difficile. Et c'est vrai qu'on passe de plus en plus, euh, enfin, la, la, plus de la moitié de la population euh, du, du monde maintenant habite en ville. On est de plus en plus détaché de la nature. Et je me demande euh, dans mon travail comment est-ce qu'on peut recréer un lien en fait et qu'est-ce qu'on peut apprendre du monde végétal. Alors il y a bien sûr toutes ces questions qui d'écologie, de, de biodiversité qui sont très importantes. Mais j'essaye aussi d'aller un peu au-delà de là et d'essayer de, de comprendre. Euh, Qu'est-ce que l'on peut apprendre d'autre du monde végétal Il y a Stefano Mancuso qui parle beaucoup de l'intelligence des plantes. Donc les plantes respirent, elles perçoivent, elles communiquent. Ne seraient-elles pas également intelligentes Emmanuel Cochia aussi nous amène à essayer de nous débarrasser un peu de notre chauvinisme humain. Euh, il y a également, bien sûr, euh, euh, tout le travail de Donna Haraway, d'Anna Singh, qui essaye de lier des liens ou relier des liens, peut-être, euh, entre les, les humains et, et les non-humains. Et euh, c'est quelque chose qui a commencé euh, avec ce projet euh, qui était présenté avant dans cette vidéo, Queer Nature, qui est un projet peut-être euh, épistémologique, ont ontologique, et qui se demande euh, d'où vient notre connaissance et d'où viennent les les êtres qui nous entourent. Et cette recherche, pour moi, était assez révélatrice euh, en regardant cette diversité d'expressions sexuelles en nature qui remet beaucoup de choses en cause. Du coup, je me dis, mais euh, qu'est-ce qui, qu qui est vrai Qu'est-ce qui est normal euh, on a, Et surtout, ce que je trouve peut-être encore plus intéressant dans cette recherche, c'est la façon dont ça a été perçu par les, les scientifiques, les hommes de l'époque, quand Linné a fait sa première classification, donc Linné est un botaniste qui est plus connu car il a fait toute la taxonomie des plantes que l'on utilise encore de nos jours. Mais quand il a fait cette première classification sexuée des plantes, c'était un peu un, un, un outrage en fait. Est-ce que ça allait vraiment à l'encontre des idées de l'époque, de la nature comme quelque chose de féminin, de pur Et euh, à l'époque, donc il a fait cette classification du XVIIIe siècle. Ça a mis plus de 100 ans à être accepté. Goethe avait notamment fait un pamphlet euh, qui s'appelle La métamorphose des plantes, car pour lui, les plantes étaient, euh, ne pouvaient pas avoir de reproduction sexuée, mais étaient plutôt euh, se développer selon un processus de métamorphose, qui est un, un processus qui s'applique euh, plutôt à, aux insectes, aux papillons ou également aux, aux grenouilles. 
Et peut-être également intéressant, c'est de voir aussi comment c'est quelque chose qui nous suit toujours aujourd'hui euh, dans la ville, dans la création des espaces publics. On a tendance à favoriser les, les arbres ou les plantes euh, qui sont plutôt mâles, car les plantes femelles sont celles qui, euh, qui produisent des fruits. Et du coup, les fruits euh, tombent euh, dans la rue, euh, qui les ramassent. Euh, c'est des questions un peu de propreté qui se posent, euh, mais qui amènent aussi à des, à des équilibres, car les... Euh, les plantes mâles sont également celles qui produisent le plus de pollen. Et de ce fait, dans la ville, on a donc toutes les problématiques aujourd'hui d'allergie qui sont également liées au fait qu'on plante préférablement plus de plantes mâles que de plantes femelles. Euh, donc c'est également la question de la ville productive. Par exemple, si on regarde dans la ville de Séville, toutes les, enfin, les avenues sont bordées d'orangers. Et donc c'est possible de planter des arbres fruitiers en ville même si, encore une fois, se pose la question de qu'est-ce qui se passe après avec les fruits. Par exemple, à Séville, les allées sont bordées d'orangers qui, qui produisent des oranges amères, qui ne sont pas, euh, qui ne sont pas euh, du goût en fait, euh, des, Espa des Espagnols. Et du coup, tous les oranges sont collectées et ensuite euh, transportées au Royaume-Uni, euh, où là, elles sont transformées en marmelade, euh, qui euh, plaît beaucoup euh, du coup, euh, plutôt aux Britanniques. Donc... Donc ces questions en fait, de, oui, de, 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 de genre, elles, elles nous suivent encore et elles peuvent informer la façon dont on regarde l'espace public, quel type de plantes on plante, est-ce qu'on ne peut pas également avoir une ville qui soit plus productive, où l'on pourrait produire une partie de nos fruits Je pense que c'est des questions, en tout cas dans une pratique de paysagiste, pour laquelle il y a beaucoup de possibilités de, de développer en fait, et de avoir une ville qui peut être au plus proche de nos problématiques aussi de comment est-ce que nous nous nourrissons et d'avoir de ce fait peut-être des économies qui sont un peu plus circulaires et qui nous permettent de nous rapprocher vraiment de, de ce qui fait la nature. Enfin, je, je suis assez inspirée aussi de Bien sûr, par les écrits de, de Bruno Latour, euh, du fait que nous n'avons jamais été vraiment modernes. Enfin, Est-ce que cette quête toujours en avant pour euh, essayer de, de nous détacher de plus en plus de la nature, est-ce qu'elle n'est pas au final très artificielle Et est-ce qu'une façon d'être vraiment moderne ne serait pas plutôt de vraiment prendre en compte en fait, les cycles de production dans lesquels nous sommes inscrits et le fait que nous sommes pleinement part de la nature qui nous entoure Merci Céline de décentrer le regard de, de l'individu justement dans, dans cette multiplicité de, de, de points de vue. Là où la, la façon dont vous parlez, elle, elle part de la nature et du non-humain. Euh, J'aimerais ramener la conversation à, à présent autour des, des, des humains pour le coup. Et euh, Aurélien Raymond, euh, Antoine Guet, vous, vous travaillez en collectif, vous avez fait ce choix. Est-ce que vous pouvez nous décrire un peu la façon dont cela s'est mis en place, euh, et puis le mode de fonctionnement aussi de, de ce type d'organisation. Euh, alors ça s'est mis en place, euh, le collectif s'est mis en place euh, assez naturellement euh, à la fin de nos études. On a toujours été assez encouragés pendant nos études à, à travailler euh, ensemble. Euh, mais à la fin de nos études, on avait envie de continuer à, à travailler ensemble. Et euh, on s'est dit en fait, qu'on avait besoin de trouver un lieu pour ça. Et que ça serait, euh, un lieu qui, ça serait le lieu qui pourrait nous, nous réunir et nous permettre de, de continuer à travailler ensemble. Euh, on avait besoin d'un lieu qui soit à la fois euh, un lieu où on peut faire du travail de bureau, enfin, c'est-à-dire, enfin, c'est un peu, euh, peut-être, euh, je dis ça à tort, mais d'architecte, de, c'est-à-dire de, de dessin, de, de projet, de maquette, de toutes les choses qui se font plutôt avec les, à petite échelle. Euh, et puis, on avait aussi besoin, parce qu'on y a été encouragé pendant nos études, à faire du, du travail euh, manuel, euh, à faire de la poussière, à faire, euh, voilà, à faire du, du travail du bois. Et donc c'est ce lieu qu'on a trouvé qui a finalement un peu fondé euh, le, le collectif. Euh, suite à quoi on a... C'était en 2014, donc toutes ces dernières années, on a... Euh, on a adopté un mode de fonctionnement qui, qui, qui était 
assez, qui était organique, mais qui s'est du coup construit aussi avec beaucoup d'embûches de, euh, et beaucoup de réussite aussi, je pense. Et c'est voilà, c'est un mode où à chaque projet qui se présente, il euh, y a une reconfiguration du collectif et il y a euh, la possibilité pour euh, chacun et chacune de se dire je travaille euh, pour ce projet ou pas, suivant des affinités aussi, parce que c'est vrai que quand on sort de l'école, on est dans une, euh, on est un peu bercé par une euh, par une même musique. Tout, tout le monde est un peu bercé, tout, tout, tout les, tous les étudiants, les étudiantes. Après, il s'agit de s'intéresser vraiment à des, à des à des sujets et à des manières de faire qui, qui nous intéressent. Et c'est ça qui a un peu euh, orienté. Le, le collectif durant, durant cinq ans. Euh, et puis, il euh, y a aussi la question euh, tout simplement des choix, des choix personnels ou des choix professionnels, des choix de vie. Enfin, je dirais qu'il y a aussi deux, il y a deux, grands, il y a deux grandes thématiques qui nous, qui nous ont orientés. Euh, chacun fait des choix esthétiques dans sa vie, des choix qui sont liés à à sa perception du monde. Euh, et puis, il y a des choix économiques. Je ne sais pas si on peut vraiment résumer, à ça, résumer ça de cette manière, mais ces deux notions qui, de toute façon, sont complémentaires. Mais euh, ces choix économiques, ils, ils impliquent euh, de savoir à quel rythme on veut travailler, quel rythme de vie, quel rythme de travail, quelle rémunération on souhaite. Parce que quand on travaille en collectif, il faut se dire aussi que euh, souvent, les rémunérations ne sont pas faites pour des collectifs, donc on divise les rémunérations entre tous les membres qui travaillent. Pourtant, on ne fait pas euh, une partie, euh, on ne travaille pas beaucoup moins. Donc il y a toutes ces questions qui, nous ont, euh, qui, qui ont été importantes. Et puis, pour revenir à la question du lieu, euh, donc ce lieu, il a été, il a été important parce qu'on a aussi, euh, il s'est vraiment organisé autour d'un territoire euh, local. Euh, et on a essayé parfois de, de s'exporter, d'aller travailler euh, ailleurs. C'est vrai que ça marchait très bien quand on était en résidence tous ensemble, en, en résidence collective ou alors dans une résidence qu'on a organisée nous. Mais le, le fonctionnement morcelé, éclaté, euh, c'est-à-dire morcelé par rapport à un lieu, à un territoire physique, il, il est, et c'est encore des questions qu'on se pose aujourd'hui, il, il est plus compliqué. Euh, parce que je crois qu'on est, on n'a jamais l'habitude de travailler euh, de manière très organisée dans les. J'ai l'impression que quand on fait des, 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 des réunions à distance, on prépare ce qu'on va, on prépare un travail, on prépare ce qu'on va dire. L'information elle est déjà très synthétisée, euh, très assainie d'une certaine manière. Et puis. Je crois que de plus en plus, on aime bien plutôt travailler dans des, dans des interstices, euh, des moments qui sont assez informels. Et, et je crois que c'est aussi avec ces moments euh, interstitiels qui, que, que, que le travail il est plus, plus productif, en fait. Euh, voilà, donc je pense que le lieu, euh, par, rapport à la, par rapport au fonctionnement du collectif, je crois que le lieu, il est, il est très important. On pourrait presque dire qu'il fait partie, euh, en tout cas, un territoire qui, qui, ce territoire qui fait quasiment partie du, du collectif aussi. Merci Aurélien. Euh, Raymond, quand vous, vous parlez du lieu, vous, vous évoquez cette idée d'un ancrage territorial euh, affirmé. Donc je, je sais que vous travaillez notamment euh, beaucoup à, à Genève. Euh, mais j'aimerais passer la parole à, à Mathias Echanouvet, justement, dans cette, dans cette idée d'ancrage territorial. Il y a aussi la façon dont on fait émerger les voix et les, les voix multiples qui, qui peuvent en sortir. Euh, je sais que votre travail est très ancré dans ces dynamiques euh, de, de démarche de participation active des habitants. Est-ce que vous pouvez nous en dire un peu plus oui, bonjour, merci beaucoup. Donc, effectivement, on, je fais partie d'un collectif qu'on a fondé il y a une dizaine d'années avec un anthropologue indien qui s'appelle Raoul Shivastrav. Et ce collectif, il est clairement ancré déjà premièrement dans, une, dans, une, dans un lieu d'origine qui est la ville de Mumbai et plus spécifiquement dans la ville de Mumbai, le quartier de, de Dharavi. 
euh, ce qui est un quartier qui s'est développé euh, de manière incrémentale, c'est-à-dire euh, graduelle euh, au fil de plusieurs générations, qui est, euh, qui est un quartier qui n'a jamais été planifié par, par les architectes, les urbanistes, les ingénieurs, euh, qui a vraiment émergé euh, à travers les savoir-faire, à travers les besoins et les moyens que les gens pouvaient trouver euh, au fil du temps. Et nous, c'est un quartier qui, qui nous a fascinés euh, depuis le départ. Donc, euh, je parle de mon collègue Rahul et moi-même, euh, de nos points de vue partagés, en fait. C'est-à-dire celui de, celui de, de l'anthropologue euh, qui, euh, qui cherche à comprendre comment une communauté s'organise, euh, quelle, quelle est la culture d'une communauté, quelles sont les valeurs euh, d'une communauté, qu'est-ce qui fait qu'en fait, elle peut se représenter elle-même en tant que communauté et aussi se mobiliser pour répondre à ses propres besoins. Et puis celle de, de l'urbaniste, euh, euh, que, que moi je, je suis, je suis urbaniste, économiste, euh, qui m'intéressait euh, à cette échelle justement de, de quartier, euh, à ce savoir-faire ensemble et puis aussi à toutes les activités euh, qui font que finalement euh, un quartier arrive à se développer euh, et puis euh, à se construire comme euh, une entité euh, fonctionnelle. Euh, donc on a, on a en fait, c'était vraiment cette convergence euh, de, de, différentes, de différentes disciplines qui se retrouvent euh, dans un lieu particulier euh, pour en parler ensemble en fait à travers euh, deux langages qui, euh, qui, qui, qui finalement euh, fusionnent euh, pour devenir euh, en fait notre, notre, euh, disons, notre approche euh, et puis aussi développer une méthodologie donc, euh, qui était euh, premièrement ancrée sur notre réalité là-bas et sur euh, euh, le constat que, en fait, euh, euh, malgré le fait qu'il n'y avait pas de, de professionnels de la construction, disons, euh, formés, universitaires, etc., dans ce quartier, finalement, il s'est quand même construit. Euh, et euh, même s'il manque beaucoup de choses euh, dans un quartier, justement, qui s'est construit, qui est considéré encore par le gouvernement comme étant un slum ou un bidonville, euh, en fait, c'est un quartier qui, finalement, euh, a beaucoup d'égards extrêmement fonctionnels et qui a aussi certaines qualités qu'il qu faut savoir reconnaître et sur lesquelles il faut pouvoir s'appuyer en fait pour continuer à, à l'améliorer avec les habitants et pas contre les habitants. Donc en fait, c'est une démarche euh, basée sur l'initiative locale, la reconnaissance des capacités. Euh, et en fait, ça ça, 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 ça nous a conduit en fait à affirmer une méthodologie qui est basée sur ça, en fait, sur la reconnaissance. Euh, et on s'est rendu compte euh, en travaillant dans différents dans différentes villes. Euh, donc, euh, on a travaillé pas mal euh, à Tokyo, à, un peu à Séoul, à Sao Paulo, Bogota euh, et maintenant à Genève, Lausanne, euh, qu'en fait, cette méthode, cette approche qui se base sur la reconnaissance des initiatives existantes euh, et puis sur, sur, donc on s'appuie dessus pour faire de la participation de l'urbanisme. En fait, elle fonctionne dans différents contextes euh, et donc depuis cinq ans, on est aussi actif ici. Euh, toujours en tant que, que collectif, euh, dans beaucoup de démarches participatives, euh, parfois qui, sont, euh, qui, qui viennent à nous par, par, par des municipalités, par l'État, parfois par euh, des organisations non gouvernementales ou internationales comme la Croix-Rouge ou, euh, ou euh, la HCR. Et donc, euh, voilà, on, on a réussi à, à appliquer en fait, finalement, ces méthodes un petit peu à cheval entre, entre l'urbanisme et l'anthropologie. En fait, ce qu'on entend aussi dans, 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 dans ces voix multiples que, que vous valorisez, c'est qu'au final, il y a euh, un choix qui va avoir un effet dans la fabrication de la ville. Et, et ça m'interroge aussi sur la valeur qu'on attribue à des voix. Quelles sont les voix qui ont une valeur Quelles sont celles qu'on entend Et par conséquent, quelles sont euh, celles qui, qui fabriquent la ville Et il me semble, Céline Bowman, que vous avez un avis sur la question. Est-ce que vous pouvez nous en dire un peu plus oui, euh, Marie, merci pour euh, votre question. Effectivement, je pense que euh, ma recherche m'amène euh, à me poser la question de qu'est-ce qui est, qui fait la ville en fait, quels sont les acteurs et qu'est-ce qui est vu comme étant euh, normal. Je trouve le travail de Gordon Mataclac pour ceci très intéressant, notamment quand il fond cette maison euh, suburbaine euh, aux États-Unis dans les années 70, où il dit un peu avec cette action euh, qu'est-ce qu'il y a au-delà de la normalité de euh, la famille avec euh, papa, maman, une petite fille, un petit garçon et un chien. Euh, Est-ce qu'il y a d'autres formes d'être ou de vivre en fait euh, je pense que c'est aussi euh, quelque chose que euh, Leslie Keynes Weissman a très bien dit euh, déjà dans les années 80, dans, euh, avec par exemple cette série de magazines Hérésie euh, sur la féminité, et notamment un, un, de ces, un de ces magazines sur l'architecture et le féminisme. C'est des problématiques qui se retrouvent, qui sont ancrées dans la domesticité. Euh, 
mais également qui trouvent un peu cette relation euh, à l'extérieur, dans l'espace public. Enfin, moi, je me retrouve vraiment euh, souvent, très très souvent, dans des situations de réunion où je suis le, la seule femme, la seule étrangère, et je me dis, mais tous ces gens qui prennent vraiment des décisions pour la ville, euh, est-ce qu'ils ne sont, ils sont pas du tout représentatifs, en fait, des gens qui vont ensuite utiliser l'espace Donc, comment remédier à ça et notamment donc, la question de la représentativité, euh, de la place euh, enfin, des femmes, euh, des personnes de couleur, euh, des queers, etc., dans l'espace public. La question également des usages. Enfin, je me souviens euh, l'an dernier d'avoir installé une, une exposition à Madrid. C'était juste avant la pandémie. Et il y avait un parc, euh, c'était un jour ensoleillé de week-end, un très très grand parc d'El Rio qui a été fait par Vestart, qui était rempli. Et là, il y avait un très très grand skatepark qui était rempli, il y avait des terrains de foot qui étaient remplis, et euh, juste dans un coin, euh, il y avait deux filles euh, qui étaient en train de jouer au badminton, qui avaient monté un tout petit volet, un tout petit filet de badminton comme ça pour pouvoir jouer. Euh, et ça donne un peu vraiment une idée des rapports de pouvoir en fait euh, dans l'espace public. La question, ça serait peut-être à quel moment intervenir, parce que hum, l'étude urbaine, c'était déjà un peu trop tôt, peut-être, parce qu'on parle vraiment de morphologie, de forme, de fil d'espace, euh, mais donc c'était un moment un peu trop tôt. Après, par contre, quand on passe déjà à la commande de l'espace public, euh, c'était déjà un peu trop tard. Enfin, Damiel Zamardi me le disait hier euh, quand il parlait du fait qu'en tant qu'architecte, on est prestateur de services en fait. Donc on répond à un programme de façon spatiale, mais quand le programme est fait, euh, on est déjà, euh, c'est déjà trop tard. Donc peut-être que la solution, ça serait de quelque chose d'intermédiaire. Il y a des villes, par exemple la ville de Vienne, qui se posent des questions sur ce sujet, qui ont des, au sein en fait, de, des, services, des, euh, des services municipaux euh, un comité spécial qui s'occupe de ces questions euh, d'égalité. Et je pense que c'est un exemple, c'est assez exemplaire en fait, euh, ce qu'ils font. Et la question, ça serait peut-être comment est-ce qu'on pourrait généraliser ces, ces questions qui, il me semble, sont très très récentes. Enfin, c'est des choses euh, dans mes études ça n'était aucun... jamais mentionné il y a dix ans il n'y a pas si longtemps que ça et pourtant quand on voilà, quand on se pose, quand on fait vraiment une façon de regarder la ville et je pense qu'il euh, démontre en fait, qu'il montre beaucoup d'inégalités ou de choses qui seraient certainement à améliorer Quand vous évoquez ces questions de genre elles sont assez indissociables d'enjeux politiques est-ce que, dans le cadre de votre, de votre pratique professionnelle, quand vous évoquez ces questions-là auprès de décideurs publics, mais aussi d'acteurs potentiellement privés, qui ont un pouvoir décisionnaire sur la fabrication de, de l'espace public, ou, ou en tout cas du, du territoire d'une manière ou d'une autre, quelles, les, quelles sont les, les conversations que vous avez Est-ce que, est que vous sentez des tendances aujourd'hui dans votre pratique et sur la façon dont la profession, de manière plus large, est en train d'évoluer j'ai l'impression que c'est des questions qui sont un peu dans l'air et euh, même si parfois les gens à qui j'en parle sont assez euh, étonnés euh, ou disent ah bon ah oui en fait c'est vrai euh, j'ai l'impression que c'est quand même assez bien reçu enfin il y a je pense que les, les gens euh, en tout cas avec ceux avec qui je travaille donc euh, tous ces beaucoup de, de, de vieux monsieur euh, euh, qui ont le pouvoir euh, sont, se rendent compte aussi qu'il y a des choses qui sont euh, peut-être à remettre en cause euh, les questions de parité etc euh, c'est des choses dont on parle beaucoup après les vraiment euh c'est euh, toujours un peu la même problématique il y a un problème, on en parle mais comment est-ce qu'on va agir dessus et j'ai l'impression en tout cas dans mon contexte euh, suisse de Bâle que c'est des, des problématiques auxquelles il y a une, 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 une écoute qui est faite mais après la question c'est comment est-ce qu'on est qu peut mettre en place des fonds pour que ce soit je pense vraiment au sein des villes qu'il y ait des comités spéciaux qui soient formés sur ces sujets ça, ça serait une autre étape qui serait encore à venir Merci Céline euh, les enjeux d'inclusivité euh, du genre m'amènent aussi à des questions euh, d'enjeux de classe en fait, et, et, de, et de rapports de classe et notamment le rapport qu'entretiennent les architectes avec les professions qui fabriquent, euh, que ce soit les artisans ou en tout cas les, les différents métiers qui sont impliqués dans la, dans la construction. Euh, Antoine euh, Aurélien, quelle est votre approche à, à cette question-là 
je pense que pour, pour nous, ça a été euh, c'est une, c'est une question fondamentale qui a été fondamentale depuis le début, puisque, comme l'a rappelé Aurélien au début, euh, lorsqu'on a commencer à constituer notre, notre atelier, il était primordial pour nous de, de mettre en place autant un espace de bureau qu'un espace de construction, avec beaucoup de projets liés au bois particulièrement. Et pour nous, ces, ces, ces deux entités étaient indissociables l'une de l'autre. Euh, je pense qu'il y a peu de projets qui se sont articulés uniquement autour de, d'un de ces deux pôles. Les, 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 ces deux approches étaient, euh, étaient indissociables. Et, euh, et au sein même de notre pratique, on, on est toujours euh, soucieux de pouvoir intégrer dès le début, dès le début du processus de, de réflexion, de pouvoir intégrer euh, une approche liée à la matière et à l'espace. Euh, et, pour, et pour ça, on est, on est, on est, je pense qu'on est conscient de, de, de nos compétences, mais on est aussi conscient de, des limites qu'elles ont. C'est pourquoi on, on, on a tendance à, enfin, on, on essaye au, le plus possible de faire appel à des personnes qui sont qualifiées, donc des, des personnes qui sont liées au savoir-faire, à l'artisanat, et on, on essaye dans le processus de, de nos projets de, de, de rentrer dès le début avec ces personnes-là. Donc, on, on, on ne cherche pas à, à faire produire nos propositions par des artisans ou artisanes, mais on, on cherche plutôt à, à à l'élaborer ensemble pour arriver à, une, à un résultat final ensemble. Et euh, Aurélien parlait aussi de cette question du, du territoire, enfin de la manière dont on associe notre collectif au territoire. Je pense que tous ces espaces de production, qui sont, qui sont, qui sont tous ces espaces de production qui sont, qui se réfèrent à chaque, à chaque pratique artisanale. Pour nous, ce sont aussi, ce sont aussi des espaces que, 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 l'on, que l'on comptoie, ce sont des espaces que l'on pratique aussi. Il nous arrive de, il nous arrive de, de, de concevoir, de construire des projets dans un atelier de menuiserie. Il nous arrive aussi de, de, de concevoir des projets dans des espaces, de, dans des espaces liés à la pierre, par exemple. Donc, on essaye de, de, de favoriser, on essaye de de, de, de rentrer en discussion dès le début avec ces espaces. Et c'est vraiment tous ces espaces plus notre atelier qui lui-même, comme je disais, est constitué de ces deux entités qui constitue un peu ce, tout ce, ce territoire sur lequel notre collectif évolue. Et on a aussi ce souci, et je pense que ça c'est peut-être un point de vue peut-être un peu plus critique par rapport à la, à la pratique de, de l'architecte et des, du dessinateur, dessinatrice, c'est, je pense, et c'est aussi une question qu'on, qu'on se pose ensemble, qu'aujourd'hui, et ça, ça, j'ai l'impression que ça va aussi chercher dans l'éducation, mais je pense qu'aujourd'hui, les architectes passent trop de temps derrière leur ordinateur et on, on sont un peu coupés d'une, d'une certaine réalité, euh, la réalité du projet, en fait, la réalité de, de, de la construction. Et je pense que, que, que c'est difficilement envisageable de, de, d'imaginer un projet derrière son ordinateur et de mandater des personnes pour le réaliser. Je pense qu'il, qu'il faut cette porosité entre les personnes qui dessinent et les personnes qui construisent. Et on essaye dans notre pratique de ne de pas hiérarchiser, ces, de pas hiérarchiser ce, ce processus, mais, mais de, d'avoir un réel échange entre ces deux choses. Antoine, est-ce que vous pouvez nous nous donner un exemple un peu de la façon dont ça peut s'exprimer dans un des projets dans lesquels vous avez été engagé, par exemple euh, Comme je disais au début, c'est, au début de notre pratique, on, ce, ce rapport à la construction a, a, a toujours été euh, précieux pour nous. Et on essaye euh, aujourd'hui de le, 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 le mettre en place de plus en plus. Et on essaye aussi de le mettre en place euh, à l'échelle du, du bâti, de la construction, pas seulement pour des projets de scénographie qu'on est capable de, qu'on est capable de réaliser parce qu'on a l'atelier pour et qu'on, qu'on commence à avoir certaines compétences pour. Mais on essaye dans des projets de rénovation, de transformation, donc comme je disais, à l'échelle du bâti, de faire autant le dessin que la construction. Bien sûr, on veut pas... Je pense que par là, on ne veut pas prendre le, la place de, de personnes qui sont plus qualifiées que nous, mais 
on veut... Je pense qu'on on, on, on est conscient que le projet, il se passe aussi sur le chantier et que du coup, pour des projets de rénovation qu'on a en ce moment, euh, dès, la, dès, le, dès, dès la réflexion du projet, dès le dessin du projet, on, sait, on se projette déjà dans, dans les étapes qu'on va, qu va pouvoir réaliser nous. J'ai presque envie de, de vous pousser un, un peu plus loin justement sur ce, ce rapport euh, entre euh, le fabricant et, et le concepteur et quand le concepteur s'invite aussi euh, euh, du côté de, de la personne qui, qui fabrique. Est-ce que vous vous confrontez aussi à des... En fait, comment est-ce que vos corps sont, sont impactés par euh, cette transition de derrière l'ordinateur à, euh, à une action... Euh, voilà, physique, euh, vous vous engagez physiquement un peu dans, dans, dans ce processus-là, parce que ce sont, il n'y a rien d'anodin dans euh, euh, le fait de, de découper des, des planches de bois qui font euh, deux à trois fois votre taille. Il enfin, y, y a aussi des risques physiques qui sont euh, qui sont réels, et, euh, et je, je me demande si c'est quelque chose dont euh, voilà, est-ce que, est que ça fait partie aussi de la prise de conscience que, que vous avez pu avoir? Euh, ou pas du tout Ou est-ce qu'au contraire, vous pensez que c'est justement euh, une vue de l'esprit de, de, de créer cette dichotomie, en tout cas entre les risques, euh, même qu'on peut avoir, nous, euh, assis euh, sans, sans dossier euh, actuellement, euh, et, euh, et, et un travail plus physique euh, Est-ce que y a quelque chose à dire à ça Moi, je vais peut-être peut juste te, te laisse la parole, mais euh, ça me fait penser juste à... Moi, je, me, je repense sou, assez souvent à cette petite phrase de Bachelard qui dit que euh, quand on travaille la matière, enfin, bon, il a beaucoup écrit sur la matière, mais qui dit que quand on travaille la matière, euh, la pire des choses, c'est de s'épuiser. Enfin, c'est qu'en fait, si on maîtrise le, le rythme de travail qu'on qu souhaite, il euh, n'y a aucune raison qu'on s'épuise, il n'y a aucune raison qu'on en fasse trop. Enfin, c'est juste aussi s'écouter, comme, comme euh, vous disiez, par rapport au corps. Je pense que c'est beaucoup euh, de connaître, euh, de prendre le temps, en fait. C'est aussi beaucoup une question de temps. En prenant le temps, euh, on arrive à faire des choses qu'on n'imaginait peut-être pas faire. On arrive à déplacer des choses qui sont lourdes. Euh, en, si, en, en cinq minutes, on n'y arrivera pas. Mais même seul, en, en, en 20 minutes, on arrive à faire des choses qu'on n'aurait pas pensé pouvoir faire seul. Donc, je crois que ce rapport euh, au corps, c'est aussi un rapport euh, au temps. Quand on prend le temps d'essayer, de, quand on prend le temps de maîtriser euh, les charges, quand on prend le temps de ne pas s'épuiser dans le travail euh, manuel, et je pense que c'est toute personne qui travaille dans, dans ces métiers-là à, 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 à cette approche-là. Enfin, moi, en tout cas, c'est ce, ce que je verrais sur le rapport au corps, mais peut-être que tu veux rajouter quelque chose. Um. Bon, je, je profite qu'on parle de cette question des, des métiers pour aller aussi sur la, la question du cadre économique. Hein. Euh, alors, le cadre économique de, de territoire, mais aussi de, de pratique. Euh, Mathias, euh, je, je suis curieuse de voir de quelle façon vous approchez cette question. Il y a, vous avez un peu une double porte d'entrée, à la fois vous avec votre pratique d'urbaniste économiste, donc dans la façon dont vous comprenez les territoires euh, et votre, votre grille de lecture en fait euh, dans, dans la façon dont vous intervenez mais également de quelle manière le cadre économique de, euh, de votre pratique professionnelle informe aussi euh, votre, votre, votre action sur ce territoire j'aimerais bien vous lancer un peu là-dessus on a toujours cherché à, à lier ces deux choses, en fait, à la manière dont on génère des revenus pour subsister en tant que collectif et les quartiers dans lesquels on travaille. Euh, on a toujours eu cette idée que, en fait, euh, si on était pertinent euh, dans le milieu dans lequel on travaillait, on devait aussi pouvoir s'inscrire dans, dans l'économie locale et justement pas travailler en tant que que qu ONG, euh, comme, comme une, une organisation extérieure à but caritatif. Euh, surtout dans un contexte comme celui où on a commencé, donc euh, dans ce quartier d'Aravi qui a souvent été euh, vu comme étant euh, un, un, un quartier d'ONG en fait, où les gens, il y a beaucoup d'organisations caritatives et il y a en fait parfois une, une, une méfiance aussi qui s'est établie par rapport à ces organisations-là qui font souvent du très bon travail mais en même temps on se dit, euh, les habitants se disent parfois mais, mais en fait euh, pourquoi vous êtes vraiment là et en fait, il vient d'où votre argent Et donc, nous, on avait envie de, de vraiment créer une pratique qui soit aussi une pratique locale. Donc, on, on, et tout en assumant un aspect global aussi. Donc, de vraiment, de vraiment travailler avec ces deux dimensions-là. 
C'est pour ça que notre, euh, notre bureau, il, était, euh, on il, est, il est encore, il est dans le quartier de, de Daravi et depuis, depuis longtemps. Euh, on a bougé trois fois dans différents bureaux dans le même quartier. Euh, et on travaille beaucoup avec, euh, avec justement cette économie de la construction. Donc euh, on travaille avec des gens qui sont des artisans de la construction dans le quartier. Et on essaye d'apporter euh, une plus-value avec notre savoir-faire euh, qui, qui, qui a d'autres origines, euh, qui n'est pas basé sur la pratique et la connaissance du contexte comme le savoir-faire des artisans du quartier, mais qui est basé sur d'autres expériences, euh, d'autres enseignements qu'on a pu avoir de manière plus formelle aussi de dire en fait comment on arrive à, à intégrer euh, ces deux dimensions-là. Donc on a commencé ben, très modestement en fait dans, dans le quartier à, à essayer de, de, de faire des contacts, de comprendre aussi euh, euh, qu'est-ce qu'on pouvait apporter comme plus-value. Comme plus on a vu très vite que le, euh, le quartier était dans un combat aussi contre le gouvernement euh, pour sa reconnaissance et puis pour, pour, sa, pour sa, sa subsiste, sa, sa, euh, qui, qui puisse en fait continuer à exister, parce que le projet du gouvernement, c'était tout simplement de, de le raser. Et donc là, on a, on a commencé déjà à travailler sur euh, des, euh, des projets alternatifs, en fait, des projets qui venaient euh, des habitants euh, pour dire en fait, euh, que du quartier aussi, euh, il y avait des projets, il y avait des visions euh, pour le futur et qu'il fallait s'appuyer dessus. Et ça, on continue à le faire encore euh, au jour d'aujourd'hui. Euh, là, on a un projet, par exemple, avec euh, euh, des artisans avec lesquels on travaille par ailleurs sur, sur des, 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 vraiment des maisons qu'on construit dans le quartier. Euh, et euh, on leur demande d'imaginer de, de, euh, les maisons euh, idéales qu'ils pourraient euh, construire s'ils si, euh, avaient le champ libre euh, et euh, pas trop de limitations au niveau du budget, mais qui fonctionnent euh, dans, euh, dans disons, la fabrique du quartier, dans les besoins euh, des habitants. Euh, et donc, on a construit toute une série de modèles et on s'est rendu compte en fait, que justement, dans cette interaction entre le local et le global, euh, sur, euh, ces, ces modèles-là étaient tellement beaux euh, qu'ils ont été euh, vus par, euh, par des musées, euh, dont euh, maintenant le, le musée M+, de, de Hong Kong, euh, qui a voulu en acheter. Et on s'est rendu compte que pour le prix de l'achat d'un modèle, on pouvait construire une maison. Donc, euh, parce qu'en fait, il y a des économies qui se télescopent et qui sont, euh, qui sont tellement, euh, tellement, euh, tellement différentes. Euh, et nous, en fait, dans ce lien-là, entre le local, le, le local et le global, on pouvait activer certaines choses comme ça. Euh, donc là, on fait, euh, on fait toute une rue, en fait. Euh, ça va faire une vingtaine de, de maisons. Euh, on le fait aussi avec les habitants, c'est-à-dire que euh, tout ce qui est le, le cahier des charges, le, le programme de ces maisons-là, il a été imaginé par, euh, par les habitants. Euh, et après, construit, euh, donc, donc designé par les artisans locaux euh, et les maquettes faites par des artisans aussi du quartier euh, pour, en fait, déjà, premièrement, dire mais il y, euh, y a un urbanisme, il y a une, une expression architecturale aussi euh, qu'il faut savoir reconnaître euh, et qui est pertinente parce qu'elle fonctionne aussi dans l'économie du quartier. Euh, et puis de, après, on, va, on verra si, si on arrive, euh, on, pourquoi pas, on essaiera d'utiliser peut-être, si on arrive à les vendre ces maquettes, euh, l'argent pour pouvoir aider les familles à, à construire vraiment ces maisons-là. Donc euh, voilà, on, on travaille pas mal là-dessus. Sinon, nous, on est organisé en... En, donc vraiment en, en collectif, ça fait depuis des années qu'on travaille avec toute une équipe et, euh, et là on a, on a eu la chance récemment de pouvoir en fait euh, constituer un partenariat, partenariat avec eux donc euh, maintenant on, est, on a commencé à deux, on est six euh, ils sont tous euh, copropriétaires disons de, de notre, de notre euh, petite euh, partenariat, euh, société là-bas et puis, c'est sur le même modèle qu'on travaille aussi à Genève, où on a aussi un collectif qui est en fait une, une société à but non lucratif euh, et dans lequel on associe en fait euh, les collaborateurs. Finalement, en fait, ce que je trouve assez intéressant, c'est que ce que vous décrivez, c'est un renversement entre le rapport de concepteur et de fabricant où c'est le constructeur qui vient penser son... Voilà, ça... Sa, sa maison idéale euh, à la manière dont euh, le collectif Galta vient renverser justement et, et, et s'invite en tant que concepteur dans, dans la fabrication donc il euh, y, y a aussi une espèce de symétrie euh, que je trouve assez intéressante dans, dans, dans vos pratiques et euh, toujours dans cette idée d'économie, je sais que euh, avec Herbs vous avez travaillé sur cette figure de la tool house euh, c'est une figure que je trouve intéressante et que j'aimerais bien que, que vous introduisiez aussi dans, dans, dans ce cadre euh, de, de discussion euh, et aussi des potentiels euh, qu'on qu peut trouver dans, dans, dans cette figure urbaine bon, ben c'est une typologie qu'on a donc une typologie disons euh, architecturale ou de construction euh, qu'on a observé euh, dans le quartier dans lequel on travaille, mais en fait, on l'a observé finalement 
dans plein d'autres quartiers de Bombay, dans plein d'autres quartiers d'Inde, et en fait, un peu partout dans le monde, elle se retrouve. C'est une typologie qui est un peu universelle. Euh, c'est celle qu'on on a, on appelle ça la tool house, la maison outil. C'est vraiment la maison de l'artisan, où, où en fait, la maison est aussi utilisée euh, comme outil de production. Alors, ça peut être un outil de production économique, mais ça peut aussi être un outil de production culturelle. Euh, ça peut être un outil de toutes sortes de, de, de productions. Euh, mais la maison outil, en fait, elle vient au moment où euh, l'espace est, est rare euh, et difficile à acquérir. Et quand on a accès à l'espace, en fait, on essaie de l'utiliser euh, de manière optimale. On essaie de faire le maximum dans cet espace et du coup, on cherche la versa versatilité de l'espace. Pour nous, ça a toujours été une référence importante. La Tool House, notre, nos bureaux sont des Tool House. Maintenant, on a, on a compris que non seulement on pouvait aller de la maison à l'espace de production, mais on pouvait aussi aller de l'espace de production ou de bureau à l'espace résidentiel. Et en fait, au jour d'aujourd'hui, ça nous paraît une telle évidence qu'on doit pouvoir aller de l'un à l'autre. On a très bien vu avec le Covid que tout le monde s'est mis à travailler depuis la maison. Mais pour nous, maintenant, la prochaine étape, c'est de réaliser qu'on doit aussi pouvoir résider quand nécessaire dans nos espaces de bureau. C'est typiquement important quand on travaille avec des gens, des fois, qui ne sont pas forcément de la même ville, qu'on doit pouvoir les accueillir, qu'on ne peut pas se payer des hôtels, etc. Donc, en fait, cette espèce d'hospitalité, d'accueil aussi dans la maison, dans l'espace de travail, il est important. D'autant plus que... Euh, et ça, c'est vraiment, euh, je pense que c'est vrai aussi pour, pour beaucoup d'autres collectifs euh, aujourd'hui. <rire> mm. notre, notre mode de travail, c'est aussi un mode de plaisir et de, et de partage euh, où on mange ensemble à midi, on fait des soirées ensemble. En fait, ce n'est pas qu'on vit ensemble, mais disons qu'on a quand même un, un rapport assez, assez proche et où l'amitié est tout aussi importante finalement que, que le reste. Euh, et donc, en fait, d'affirmer que l'espace, il, il est là aussi pour ça, euh, c'est extrêmement important. D'autant plus qu'on n'a pas forcément des projets qui nous rapportent toujours beaucoup d'argent. Euh, nos projets, ils, sont, ils, nous, ils nous motivent aussi au niveau du sens. Euh, et du coup, on doit, on doit vivre en fait, euh, ce sens-là euh, dans notre quotidien, dans notre quotidien de travail. Euh, donc, on doit, on doit lui donner en fait, euh, son espace. Cette question de l'économie, mais je vais revenir aussi sur la question de la productivité hein, euh, d'un lieu... J'aimerais bien l'interroger sur la question de la productivité d'un paysage. Euh, Céline Bauman, plus tôt, vous évoquiez la question des, des arbres fruitiers, en tout cas de, de ces arbres femelles qui produisent des fruits euh, qui ne sont pas forcément les bienvenus, parce qu'évidemment, ça tombe, c'est sale, il faut, faut venir nettoyer, euh, alors, que, alors que le pollen, bah, ça, nous rend, ça nous rend malade, mais, euh, mais quelque part, euh, c'est un problème à régler chacun individuellement, plutôt que comme, une, euh, comme un problème de, de, de collectif, en tout cas apporté par les, les, les services de sanitation de la ville. Et je m'interroge du coup sur... Euh, euh, Est-ce que vous pensez que euh, une approche productive du paysage, et je pense notamment au collectif artistique Fallen Fruit qui se sert euh, de l'art pour planter des arbres fruitiers, parce que euh, et aux États-Unis, étant donné que les, les arbres fruitiers donc, sont, sont illégaux euh, dans l'espace public, on va se servir donc de, de là, en tout cas définir l'arbre la, comme, euh, comme une œuvre d'art afin de euh, parvenir à faire pousser ces, cet arbre fruitier. Alors, donc, c est, c est cette question presque d'une approche pirate euh, euh, du, du paysage euh, pour un peu détourner euh, ces, ces, ces contraintes légales et, 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 et en faire un partenaire. Donc, euh, euh, et, je m'interroge et, et, et j'aimerais avoir euh, votre réflexion euh, là-dessus. Utiliser le... L'arbre ou le, le végétal, on va dire, comme projet artistique, euh, c'est quelque chose qui a été fait euh, aussi. Euh, par exemple, Joseph Boy, c'est un très bon exemple de ça, non Quand il plante, euh, je ne sais plus, 7000 chaînes, je crois, euh, à Castle. Euh, je pense que c'est un peu la question, quel est le rôle de l'art Je pense qu'il y a beaucoup de pratiques artistiques en ce moment qui se posent la question de comment on mange avec le changement climatique, comme Cooking Section, que, qui est une pratique que j'admire beaucoup, ou Forma Fantasma, qui se pose la question de d'où vient le bois, euh, que l'on de construction, en fait. Maintenant, c'est un peu la mode, euh, tout est fait en bois, mais euh, si on fait tous les bâtiments en bois, maintenant, on va à coup sûr, euh, c'est la meilleure façon de déforester euh, toutes les forêts du monde. Et la question, je pense que, la, à mon avis, euh, c'est un avis très personnel, mais la question de la pratique artistique, ça peut permettre d'ouvrir, de, peut-être, d'explorer. Je pense que c'est peut-être ça le, le rôle de l'art, c'est de poser un nouveau regard sur la société. 
mais je pense que c'est vraiment au, au pouvoir public, en fait, euh, et à la ville de, de prendre les choses en main. Enfin, une pratique... Euh, et parce que c'est les pouvoirs publics qui peuvent agir pour le bien commun. Ça, j'en suis vraiment convaincue. Et... Euh, voilà, les pratiques privées, euh, artistiques, peuvent permettre voilà, d'ouvrir de, de nouveaux horizons et de nouveaux regards, mais c'est vraiment à la ville en fait, de se réorganiser. Comment est-ce que ça se fait qu'on a tellement... Euh euh, que les, les endroits de production de alimentaires sont si déconnectés en fait, de nos villes. Enfin, c'est aberrant quand on regarde en termes de ressources euh, combien de, de, de champs, enfin, quelle est la, la, la terre autour dont a besoin une ville en fait, pour vivre et euh, peut-être essayer de reconnecter euh, la ville à ces, à ces sources de production qui ne sont pas seulement dans la campagne, mais comment est-ce qu'on peut, en, en, en termes d'espace de, voilà, public, permettre d'avoir ce quelque chose de plus, oui, de plus circulaire, quelque chose qui amène aussi ça, aussi un outil pédagogique, bien sûr, euh, peut-être euh, dans les écoles, amener les enfants à, à, voilà, à aussi cueillir les fruits, dire bah, voilà, ça c'est en fait ce que tu manges, ça peut aussi pousser dans la ville. Euh, je pense que c'est intéressant à mettre en place, mais je crois fondamentalement que c'est vraiment le rôle des services publics en fait, euh, de le faire, et de la ville, car c'est la ville euh, qui, je pense, agit pour le bien commun. Il ne faut pas l'oublier. Alors, bon, moi, ça, ce que ça m'évoque aussi, c'est quand même des exemples euh, potentiellement, euh, si, on, si on décentre le regard en, en dehors de l'Europe, euh, par exemple à, à Tunis, le fait que au sein de l'espace public, on va avoir des arbres fruitiers qui vont déborder dans le domaine public, mais qui sont en fait du domaine privé euh, et qui, selon euh, l'usage commun, sont à disposition euh, des, des, des gens et, et, et du public. C'est-à-dire qu'à partir du moment où l'arbre fruitier déborde euh, dans l'espace public, on est tous euh, voilà, amenés à accueillir le fruit. Le, et le fruit est une propriété qui, qui devient commune. Et ce qui est une, une manière aussi de réguler euh, la présence de ces fruits et, euh, et, et la façon dont ils occupent euh, l'espace public. Ça s'autorégule presque avec, euh, avec la cueillette un peu sauvage. Euh, donc je pense qu'il y, y a une vraie question qui se pose sur... Euh, à quel moment euh, la responsabilité des pouvoirs publics s'arrête euh, Quel est le champ euh, de pouvoir en fait, et la, 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 du, du domaine privé en fait, Et par conséquent, quels sont, euh, quel est notre pouvoir individuel En tant qu'acteur, euh, euh, évidemment, individuellement, nous sommes des acteurs privés euh, de, de la transformation euh, du territoire. Et c'est une question qui s'adresse un peu à, à vous tous. En réalité, comment aujourd'hui euh, peut-on envisager aussi la construction euh, de rapports de force qui permettent l'émergence de ces pratiques que vous décrivez euh, chacun, individuellement et collectivement Comment euh, faire basculer le, le cadre dans lequel on, on, on intervient aujourd'hui pour favoriser et l'émergence et euh, surtout le, le maintien et la, et la prolifération de ces pratiques à l'avenir et, euh, et je passe la parole à qui veut la prendre en premier euh... Antoine par rapport à cette question et par rapport à ce que vous disiez, Céline, euh, euh, je pense que ce rapport à l'espace public, je pense que l'art, il a cette capacité à être, sur, à être subversif et du coup, pouvoir s'infiltrer, de pouvoir intégrer l'espace public sans, euh, sans avoir à, à rentrer dans un processus de demande. De, 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 il, il a cette capacité à... À, à passer entre les lignes et puis à passer entre la réglementation et justement à pouvoir euh, proposer euh, ce, des actions, par exemple de la, la cueillette dans l'espace public, là où c'est possible, en tout cas à Genève c'est possible. Euh, je pense que l'art a cette possibilité d'être subversif et de montrer l'exemple pour progressivement, je, je saute un peu des étapes, mais pour progressivement une institutionnalisation de, 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 ces, de ces pratiques. Peut-être qu'une peut qu cueillette subversive, subversive dans l'espace public, aujourd'hui, euh, va amener à des, à des questions d'un point de vue administratif et politique sur justement l'illégalité ou la légalité de ces, de ces, de ces, euh, de ces plantes dans l'espace public et peut-être faire évoluer la jurisprudence par rapport à ces, par rapport à ces choses. Euh, mais ça, c'est plus d'un point de vue... Euh, 
d'un point de vue de l'art. Et puis, euh, entre l'art et la politique, en passant par l'administratif, je pense qu'il y, y a beaucoup d'étapes. Et, et en tout cas, à notre échelle, je parle pour, pour notre collectif et, et nos pratiques respectives, euh, on peut commencer à montrer l'exemple. Ou en tout cas, on peut commencer à initier des, des, des actions, je crois. Mathias je, je veux bien aussi euh, euh, répondre à cette question que je trouve vraiment intéressante. Euh, elle me fait penser d'ailleurs à, à un projet euh, sur lequel on travaille en ce moment, où il y a une problématique d'un espace public qui est en fait une, une cour d'école euh, complètement bétonnée. Et, et la ville euh, désire en fait euh, en faire un espace euh, plus frais. En fait. Avec le réchauffement climatique, euh, il y a vraiment cette attention qui commence à être portée à, aux espaces bétonnés et dire mais en fait, il faut que ce soit des espaces de verdure. Et aussi du coup des espaces de quartier, des espaces de convivialité, euh, des espaces où on peut se retrouver. Donc euh, il y a cette volonté là. Euh, et donc euh, on a avancé dans cette direction, dans une démarche participative, euh, jusqu'au point où en fait euh, on s'est rendu compte, euh, et, euh, et la question s'est aussi posée à cause de la situation euh, dans laquelle on est en ce moment, aussi au niveau des finances publiques, qui sont quand même, qui sont quand même vraiment sollicitées beaucoup pour répondre un peu à la, à la crise économique qu'on est en train de vivre. Disons, mais en fait, euh, finalement, de mettre du béton, c'est moins cher que euh, de commencer à, à avoir un parc euh, qu'il faut après. Après, il faut des jardiniers, il faut l'entretenir, etc., etc. Et en fait, euh, la réponse qui a émergé de manière très naturelle, très spontanée, très organique euh, de la démarche, c'était qu'en fait, euh, on avait besoin des habitants pour entretenir euh, les espaces verts. Euh, donc les arbres fruités, bien sûr, mais il y a plein d'autres aussi espèces, il y a plein de gens en fait qui aiment se retrouver euh, à jardiner, surtout dans des milieux urbains où ils n'ont pas accès à ça. Euh, et en fait, c'est un espace euh, complètement de convivialité, de rencontre qu'il faut aussi gérer. Euh, ça peut aussi être, on parle, on parle pas forcément des potagers qui sont euh, une question bien particulière où il y a souvent un petit peu des chasses gardées, etc. Sur mon potager, ton potager, mais, euh, mais sur des espaces où on arrive à définir en fait au niveau paysager euh, des, des lieux qui, qui peuvent être entretenus de manière collective. Et là, il y a, il y a un vrai enjeu aussi de vivre ensemble euh, et de socialisation intergénérationnelle, etc. Mais en fait, ça peut aussi être une réponse. Euh, la réponse, elle peut aussi être, euh, on peut la trouver du côté justement de la participation citoyenne dans l'entretien des espaces verts. Céline, est-ce que vous avez quelque chose à ajouter euh, oui, merci, Myriam. Euh, c'est vrai que c'est... Moi, je trouve que c'est... Enfin, c'est des exemples comme ça sont extraordinaires, bien sûr. Après, c'est... Euh... Je trouve que c'est assez délicat, quand même, comme question. Enfin, si on voit aussi à... Quelle, quelle part le privé doit apprendre dans l'espace public Si on voit à Londres, tous ces espaces euh, publics, quoi, tous ces rues qui deviennent privatisées, du coup, euh, ça veut dire qu'on peut installer des caméras, on peut installer des, euh, des barrières aussi pour fermer les espaces. Il faut vraiment agir euh, en finesse pour arriver à trouver le bon, le bon équilibre et le bon rapport entre euh, quest ce qui est laissé au privé et euh, qu qui est, quels sont les droits qui sont retenus par, par la ville et je pense que pour ça c'est très important que ce soit toujours euh, j'ai l'impression que des fois les villes ne se rendent pas compte du pouvoir qu'elles ont vraiment de cadrer en fait, les choses et de pouvoir euh, laisser faire mais aussi euh, imposer en fait, des règles pour euh, permettre à tous de vivre ensemble peut-être un, euh, un, un exemple plus positif euh, serait que dans ce type de partenariat c'est euh, à Bâle il y a beaucoup de, de, de forogarten donc c'est les, les jardins, les jardins euh, privés qui sont euh, entre la maison et la rue et ça par exemple c'est des exemples assez extraordinaires donc il y a le, le, la, la voie avec les voitures il y a le trottoir et avant la façade il y a 2 mètres, 2-3 mètres de ces forgarten, de ces jardins de front en fait et ça c'est assez extraordinaire parce que du coup ils sont, euh, ils sont cultivés par les habitants euh, qui plantent leur, leurs petits arbustes, les fleurs qui mettent quelques, quelques chaises, quelques tables parfois il y a un arbre qui pousse qui va aussi faire de l'ombrage sur la rue et du coup c'est des espaces qui qui amène une qualité extraordinaire en fait euh, à la rue elle-même euh, dans cette combinaison entre le public et le privé. Donc euh, ça c'est peut-être des exemples aussi plus positifs, mais je pense qu'il qu requiert vraiment un, un certain cas par cas et une certaine finesse en fait euh, dans cet euh, équilibre entre le public et le privé. Aurélien, on a envie de vous entendre aussi. <rire> Non, moi, je, enfin, je, je trouve euh, que les exemples, euh, l'exemple que Mathias, euh, tu donnais, là, ça, ça me semble assez évident, en fait, euh, de... 
Je crois que c'est en train de se faire. Enfin, j'ai l'impression que c'est en train. On est en train d'arriver progressivement à ça. Il y a beaucoup de. Il y a beaucoup d'associations de quartier qui, qui travaillent pour des espaces qui sont effectivement, dans le cas des potagers, euh, son petit espace personnel, mais qui s'étendent aussi. Euh, je pense qu'on va arriver à ça. Je pense qu'il y a aussi... Euh, moi, je me faisais la réflexion la semaine dernière en voyant une démolition qui est en train de se passer euh, à Genève, qui est euh, une halle, je sais peut-être 15 000 mètres carrés de, de halle construite en bois. Enfin, on voyait ça avec Antoine. Euh, et en fait tout est, tout est, jeté, tout est mis à la poubelle euh, et je me demande comment le pouvoir public dans ce cas là il n'a pas, euh, pas l'obligation de, de traiter ces ressources qui ne sont pas seulement des ressources euh, organiques vivantes mais qui, enfin, qui sont toujours des, des, des matériaux qui sont exploitables c'est du bois qui était même s'il avait 40 ans il a, été, il a été bien conservé il a été au sec, il était neuf et, et voilà, ça, ça c'est des choses que j'arrive pas. Et je pense que ça, comme tu dis, je pense que ça vient, ça doit venir aussi du pouvoir public de, de penser autant à l'aspect du, du vivant et de la production qui, qui sort de terre, mais aussi de, des choses qui sont, qui sont déjà là. Et sur la valorisation des, des ressources à Genève, je pense qu'on est bien. On est bien mal placé pour en, pour en parler parce qu'il y a tellement de il y a tellement de ressources qui sont euh, qui sont qui sont gaspillées et qui sont jetées et qui sont même dans les lieux de, de tri c'est aussi des réflexions qu'on s'est souvent faites dans les lieux de tri dans les déchetteries euh, il n'y a pas la possibilité de valoriser le, le, le matériau c'est des containers et puis euh, après ça passe dans, dans la main d'entreprises de, privées qui il n'y a pas la possibilité de qui est donnée aux citoyens aux citoyennes de venir sur place de dire bon ben ce truc il est super en fait je peux en prendre une partie voilà je faisais un peu ce genre de réflexion que je me ferai sur le sujet on en revient un peu à confronter euh, les pouvoirs publics en fait, à, à leurs responsabilités. Je pense que, pour le coup, on, on ouvre une autre question euh, euh, qui, qui sera à, à explorer dans la suite euh, du programme. Donc, euh, merci beaucoup Aurélien, merci Antoine, euh, Mathias, Céline. Euh, merci d'avoir partagé vos perspectives qui élargissent euh, nos possibilités de, de champs d'action individuels et collectifs. Euh, nous allons prendre une pause et on se retrouve à 18h15 pour New Roles and New Practices euh, pour la suite du programme Archipelago.
Hello and welcome to the third part of our program today. You are watching Archipelago Architectures for the Multiverse. Three days of discussions on the contemporary state of architectural disciplines. We're taking stock of the current moment and this day, the third day of our pro broadcast, is centered around the theme of interdependency. We've heard about working together, we've heard about kinship and advocacy. And in the third part of our broadcast, we're going to be talking about new roles and new practices. We're going to be talking about the future of our professions. And to introduce the conversation that will form the roundtable of this section of our programming, I am delighted to welcome Marina otero Verzier and Lucia pietro Yusti, who are here joining us today to discuss a book that they've edited and that has just come out. It's called More Than Human, and it's a reader. It brings together texts by writers across a wide array of disciplines, and these texts serve to think and reflect on the state of post-anthropocentric thinking today. This comes uh, as, as a very opportune set of themes to discuss because all the discussions in these days have also revolved around many of the topics that this book gathers. Um, hi, Marina. Hi, Lucia. I'm so happy that you could join us here today. Um, maybe I will start by asking Marina to tell us a little bit about the process that went into the making of this book. Hi, Vera. Nice to see you again. And congratulations on all the conversations that you have uh, triggered and hosted these days. And thank you for the invitation to uh, present this book. So uh, More Than Human is a beautiful collaboration across disciplines and institutions. It uh, brings together a new institute, Manifesta Foundation, the Serpentine Galleries, the General Ecology Project uh, of the Serpentine Galleries, and the Office for Political Innovation, uh, to uh, look for, uh, you know, putting together uh, some of our interests in relation to post anthropocentric uh, search. And um, we realized that we had been working on similar questions, very kind of each of us in a particular way, but we decided to join forces and to um, bring these notions together uh, in this book. And it's a reader. We thought it was important to um, bring together already published texts. We actually didn't uh, edit them. They, we tried to maintain the logic and the typography and, and the way of the style of each text and not try to kind of uh, edit them or somehow try to not to account for the different uh, disciplines and uh, contexts from they uh, emerge. So rather the opposite, to bring them together and to also emphasize the difference and the similarities that are uh, across them. So basically what we try to do is to uh, think that in a moment where you know we are witnessing these important changes in our planet, and we think it's very relevant to look into the more than human uh, forms of coexistence. And uh, in many ways, this center the human from the disciplines in which we work, and in particular, now that we are in this, in this space, the discipline of architecture, but not only. So for us, it was very important to not only criti critically look into uh, how to decenter the human and look into beyond the anthropocentric uh, paradigms, but also to uh, think 
or, or, or prevent at any point that the, uh, the thinking of humanity as an autonomous and self-determined uh, entity will be uh, still be uh, used in institutional thinking and in, in these disciplinary settings. And uh, if I can continue a little bit, just to kind of wrap, up, wrap it up, but in relation to architecture, obviously we know that architecture has been primarily centered about around the notion of the human and more uh, uh, precisely about uh, the notion of the man as a universal uh, subject, and in particular, obviously, a white man in many cases. So what we think architecture nevertheless participates in many post anthropocentric struggles and more than human worlds, creating forms of coexistence, spaces and entanglements. And it is time, we think, also for the discipline to account for uh, these new paradigms and to create spaces that are not only uh, connected or, or designed around the comfort of certain humans, but about multiple beings coming together. So we aim to contribute to that challenge, to the center this uh, white humanist, masculinist subject uh, who sees the world as his own possession. And we try to do it with, with the reader. Thank you, Marina. Uh, Lucia, what, what is your opinion? I mean, how did you get into the project? What was, what was your opinion of the process of making this happen? Did the selection of texts come about naturally? Was it something that was a bit of a back and forth? How did the process go? And how do you come to this very difficult decision also of what to choose? I mean, there is, you know, we've been talking a lot about learning from the past and thinking about the future by looking again to the past in these days. And I wonder how did you how did you choose to sort of like make this selection? It is it must be a very difficult editorial process too, because I mean there's so much to 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 learn from, let's say. Arrowing editorial process, I have to say. It's very it's actually a, a it's still painful to know how many things we could have included that we obviously didn't have the space for. However, um, we tried to be fairly representative of a breadth of um, disciplinary and kind of thematic entry points to various ways of thinking about more than humanism. Uh, Marina has already uh, uh, mentioned this attempt to move past the kind of um, uh, hegemonic uh, white heteronormative uh, anthropocentrism, because let's remind ourselves that when we say anthropocentrism, we never actually really mean all humans. We mean a very specific kind of human that made uh, the world in the shape it, it, through sort of in different kinds of uh, uh, deployments of power made the shape, uh, made the world in the shape in which it happens to find itself today, but that is not a given. So what we were trying to think about was paradigms that can um, let's say, uh, invite us uh, to think about different ways of thinking about the more than human. And this is a little bit why, in fact, we even thought quite a lot about the title, whether it, uh, whether post-human, uh, non-human, more than human, and all the various declinations of that. And there's something quite welcoming and quite, um, a little bit like a hug in the notion of the more than human. It's one that I, I'm also personally very sort of keen on. Um, and that has somehow brings with it some kind of notion around care. And I'm thinking about Maria Puig de la Bella Casa, who obviously wrote Matters of Care, and that more than human uh, uh, expression is in the title of her book as well. So I suppose the process, the way that I came to the project, and obviously not coming from an architectural background, um, probably approached the question in a slightly different way, but was was able to do so through the generosity of Marina and Andres and associate curator uh, editor Lisa Mazza, uh, who invited me to join in uh, in this, this project. And the way that uh, we went about it, I think, is quite different. For example, uh, I think, Marina, it's fair to say that you had such an extensive amount of research in um, uh, automation, technology, the history of robotics and decolonial thinking that all of those things really featured quite prominently into those sections that you uh, that you cared for as uh, similarly andres brought a lot uh, uh, brought a lot of his own um, let's say research and approaches so it came to having to organize all of this um 
the selection that we began with was perhaps three times or maybe more, uh, three times as wide as the one that you see. Uh, and then we had to put it into some kind of logic. And what we've decided to do was to, you know, perhaps it's not the most original thing in the world, but to be inspired by Borges and by the Library of Babel and to think about these categories that is, are not exhaustive. There's always an excess to the categories um, that would organize the chapters. There's, there's also overlaps, strange overlaps. You can't necessarily tell whether a, a particular excerpt is in a particular chapter by necessity or whether it could be in a different one. So there's, a, you, there's, there's slippages there that kind of try to be adherent to the kinds of slippages of thought that, um, that uh, pepper the book, I suppose. Um, but those sections, broadly speaking, uh, uh, try to uh, enter into the notion of thinking more in a more than human way um, in the first instance, by thinking about uh, subjects, subjectivities, subject formations as forms of more than human assemblages, whether human and others, or whether entirely non-human ones between uh, different living species, but also mountains or uh, landscapes and so on. Uh, following which we had a, a section that particularly looked about at what uh, feminist and queer studies could bring to post-anthropocentric uh, thinking and uh, research. We then moved into thinking about uh, more than human justice and ethics, obviously the question of the personhood of uh, landscapes and ecocide are questions that are really coming up now, even in international uh, courts uh, context. And then we thought we have this section on technology, automation, robotics, the more than human when it, uh, when it intersects with um, Sort of the current anxieties around artificial intelligence, for example. And then the last one, with, is called With and Through the More Than Human. And it's more to do with when those more than human companions become thinking companions. And it goes here, we have also a historical text, slightly more, uh, slightly older text, being uh, The Black Beach of Edouard Glissant from Poetics of Relations. Because even though a uh, text such as uh, Glissant doesn't specifically kind of um, expressly refers to the beach as a thinking companion or as a kind of, uh, as a, as a epistemological device, de facto, it sets up a series of um, modes of potential uh, forms of organizing thought that, that, that have this kind of epistemological shift as a potentiality. I can obviously talk more about that, but that's probably enough. Sure, yeah, so maybe many to add just a, just a no, little no, go, bit, but... Go ahead, Marina, go ahead, go ahead. Um, yeah, so in total there are 43 texts, which are a lot, so you think about the book is quite thick, and as Lucia said, it could actually would have been even thicker, but we have to, to, to take decisions, and our texts between 1990 and 220. Um, so within very different approaches to writing, uh, some of them very academic, some of them more poetic, science fiction, or almost uh, texts that have been uh, institutional texts, etc. So we don't attempt to somehow try to homogenize them, but rather to emphasize their difference, as we say. And, and what we are interested as well as these texts uh, were uh, generally be regarded as belonging to different discourses and different disciplines. And we found it interesting that in order to acknowledge and to work with the more than human, all these voices will have to come together and the reader will be able to kind of create that, uh, you know, perspectives across disciplines, across different voices, across uh, methodologies of research or across methodologies of writing or styles. And, and that's what we try to do, something that the reader, as the book does, but also we hope that the reader who takes the reader does as well. And there is some only something that we have done um, with the design is to emphasize certain terms uh, that we think are really relevant for uh, the questions that are at stake. Um, in some certain cases as just words that are terms that are human or ethics or politics or uh, and then we have used different typographies across the reader, uh, highlighting those terms to create kind of a, 
across uh, the standing of, uh, uh, throughout the text, through the book. So trying to see how these terms appear or not in these different, uh, different uh, chapters. Uh, so there's a kind of another reading that is on top of, of uh, the separate chapters and the separate texts. So, but is this a little bit like a new vocabulary or a vocabulary for our times? Because you kind of form a glossary by highlighting those terms and highlighting those connections. It almost seems that you could be indicating kind of a of a of a vocabulary for our, our present moment. Perhaps was it was it the intention? It could be. I think were questions that for us were relevant, but we also had to do a lot of uh, editing back because obviously there are many terms that we consider relevant, but at the end we stayed with some of them that could seem quite uh, simple, you know, uh, but that demands a further inspection. That's what we think. So uh, that cannot be taken for granted. So some could be ethics or a species or beings, ecologies. So all of them, you know, we think we know what they mean, but maybe under the kind of framework of the more than human, what we call a species can be rethought, uh, or what we generally call uh, beings as well. As Lucia said, we can refer to a mountain or we can refer to a human being. So that's uh, the, the, the beauty they have that in a way are quite basic, but are very also powerful in their own uh, apparent simplicity. Yeah, there, there was a, there's a lot of things that resonate also with the discussions we've been having here today. Not, of course, the selection of authors that you include in the book. So many of these authors were also very instrumental in the thinking that went behind making this event that we're doing here today. But also these ideas of collaboration, interconnection, interdisciplinary thinking beyond disciplinary silos, the porosity of borders between disciplines and ways of thinking. I wonder if in the making of this uh, of this book, this kind of process, and also the, the content of the book itself, of the reader itself, inspired some of your present projects and some of your collaborations that are happening at the moment. Lucia, maybe you want to start. It's a very interesting question, I think. I, I, I would consider sort of more than human thinking part of uh, life's mission, really. So would would probably look back and think that the More Than Human book happened to take place alongside a number of other projects that also sort of offer up, um, let's say, alternative possibilities for a paradigm that has, uh, that has, I suppose, interdependency and mutual responsibility at the center rather than very, that very specific kind of human, right? So it, it, it has manifested in, I know in Marina's and Andres's um, trajectory over the last few years as well, for me, it has manifested through working on festivals, working on podcasts, working in all kinds of different ways. Um, uh, yeah, so, but, but I think in, in general, the kind of the mission or the sense of purpose is to, is to uh, offer up avenues for potential sensitizations and enfleshment of present mode of thinkings that are slightly different and that bring slightly different outcomes in terms of the relationship between us and our planet, right? I mean, that's, I suppose that's, that's kind of the purpose of all of this is, can we offer alternatives? Um, and we try all the ways in which one can offer alternatives because that's kind of the point, because we won't all respond and react to the same uh, to the same languages, to the same disciplines, to the same invitations. But the whole point is to just make and remake kind of invitations, really. Or offerings or gifts, if you like. <laughs> well, Lucia is always very humble, but it's true that, uh, I mean, I learned so much from her and uh, Andres and I were working on, on a previous project that had different ambition. I think this is much more ambitious. I'm happy that it uh, it ended up being this reader. And we indeed contacted Lucia because she has been doing so much around these questions. And so to me, has been her work in the general ecology project has been a source of inspiration. And uh, I think the collaboration, as you said, has manifested in different projects. 
and life <laughs> in itself. But more recently, we together, I think as a, as a kind of result of the collaboration and the conversations we had around these texts and the reader and these issues, uh, we worked together on the Shanghai Biennial, our biennial that we just opened a few months ago. Well, has been opening for a year almost. <laughs> <laughs> and it's called Bodies of Water. And so Andres, Lucia and I, and also Filipa, Ramos and me, you are working together on that project. And in many ways, this reader also stays somehow as a, uh, you know, aid or a, a kind of a book that is always next to us uh, across, you know, those this time working on, on this project. So in a way, I, I agree that has been many ways in which these conversations uh, have had different lives, and I hope it's, it is the case. And that's the beauty of the collaboration, that instead of saying um, institutions are competing for a space, uh, you know, in, in generating content or having, you know, uh, the most, um, uh, let's say, yeah, unique uh, program, but we thought it's like when it's uh, happens around questions that are so relevant, we have to aim for collaboration. So uh, the many, the merrier. And uh, we thought that joining forces for such a kind of topic and cause in which we believe was relevant. So I hope that that, that the spirit continues. That is also a spirit of generosity. And that was also a topic that we have been discussing earlier today. On the one hand, the willingness to create space for these kinds of processes and the, the willingness to create space for these kinds of collaborations, but also just in general, the generosity of sharing resources and especially among institutions. Um, and I wonder if, if, if this is something, I mean, I, I guess you are practicing this model, you're, you're becoming this model, but how can it be something that, is, that, is, that becomes sustainable, that becomes that becomes normal, let's say, well, although maybe normal is not the best word, but becomes an alternative, let's say, that, that, that more institutions and more uh, agents engage in. Well, I can certainly comment, make a small comment about that in as much as I think it's no uh, secret to say that public institutions at least are are undergoing and will undergo a number of challenges and crises over the next few uh, years, whether it's uh, the sort of challenges that come from the necessity for them to, uh, uh, how do you say, like um, avow, acknowledge and make reparations uh, from their colonial past, or whether it's the kinds of undermining and challenges that happen from extreme right-wing governments I'm not putting those two at all on the same plane. I think the one, the first is entirely legitimate. The other, the second is entirely is you know potentially very destructive, but in either case or the pandemic, you know the third from the top. So in either case, we are looking at a moment where public institutions need to really think very hard about what their responsibility and what their sense of purpose is. And I think one of the things that uh, the Shanghai Biennale and um, and the, uh, the, this book and the General Ecology Project and all of the, the kind of attempts that we've made recently have been not only to create a project together, but really to think about different assemblages that are almost like um, experiments for different organizations. And when it comes to uh, institutions collaborating, I mean, certainly this book, um, I would say that uh, to, to, to give credit to Marina and Lisa and Andres, this book, I sort of only contributed as a co-editor uh, for my part, but it was taken charge of primarily by uh, the printing, I believe, if I'm not wrong, was taken in primarily by Head New Institute. But um, but in general, I think that we can we can really start to think about like, okay, well, what is what is the what is the box? <laughs> like now that we've spent a year in a box of Zoom, a year in a home, a year in a box, no. What are the boxes? And it used to be that institutions were the boxes and they would commission things and put them inside. And I think that's just not, first of all, ecologically sustainable, financially sustainable, politically sort of um, ethically correct. Um, and so what if we started to think of the box as actually the project or in the case of an artwork, 
you know, a period of time during an artist's life, even at, at, as time. And then the role of an organization or an institution is to put itself underneath that, right? And it can't, and to put itself underneath that, it needs to figure out ways in which it can make a kind of puzzle and get together. And these are not, this is nothing is new about this because it happens with, it happens all the time with large scale projects in, for example, the live, the live and performing arts. It's always a question of co-production or of, of co, um, co sort of co-creation. And so I think that it's really important to try and experiment with those models also in the context of, uh, I mean, you know, I speak from the visual art field, but Marina, maybe you have comments. No, absolutely. I, I think, do you know, I mean, Lucia and uh, uh, Andres and I have been thinking a lot about these notions of collaboration. Lucia is doing that a lot with artists collaborating, as she says, in supporting artists across institutions. Um, so now, well, the work of artists doesn't have to be owned or just represented by one, uh, but the institutions have to support certain causes, certain trajectories. And, and this is the case of the book. For instance, I will say that uh, each of us have different times and resources and skills. And for instance, the fact that Lucia says that she only contributed as a co-editor where her time and her knowledge are so important as you know a budget that we can have at the new institute you know like or even much more because money is is not <laughs> cannot replace uh, knowledge uh, so i think like to understand you know different forms of collaboration that allow big institutions with the smaller ones countries uh, across the different you know political organizations and so all these questions and especially you know in times like the brexit so this collaboration uh, survived uh, <laughs> the brexit as well that's it's kind of a political point as way well, as well as regardless of certain uh, you know turns in politics um, and populisms we should also find the right channels to join forces for the right causes and I think in general, in architecture, that has to happen much more. I think there are uh, relevant and very, very important questions are, are, are around the future of the discipline that cannot be tackled or addressed just by one institution or a body. And that we have the responsibility, the people who are working in institutions right now, universities, you know, museums and it's other institutions, they have the responsibility to get together and figure things out. Um, it's, it's not anymore a choice. I think it's actually the way to go. And otherwise, we will become irrelevant. And, and that's also a possibility and other structures will uh, appear to do the job that we were not able to do. Well, and also, I mean, I think it's just worth saying, I've really, really profoundly asked myself this question is, we are in a situation of wretchedly unjust uh, climate disaster, wretchedly unjust, and you know, criminally unequally distributed climate disaster. What on earth are we doing any of this for, if not to, you know, offer and present care to future generations, or to sort of offer and present care ac across, let's say, planetary divide? What is our sense of purpose? You know, how do we come to recognize our sense of purpose? It might sound completely ideological, but at this particular moment, I just feel that I, I don't feel it in myself. I feel it in the air, a sense of uh, a, a search, a sense of urgency and a search for some kind of sense of purpose, which I think at institutional level is really important because you end up, otherwise you only end up feeling the threat, the threat you know, the kind of the challenge as something to fear and to somehow maybe repair with like PR exercises as opposed to the invitation to join in a kind of reparative or regenerative version of oneself. So this reader is a tool, in fact, it's a very powerful tool. And it's a tool to enact that kind of change that you were referring to, Lucia. I wonder if you can give me perhaps a wish or a hope as to how this book can be best best used as the tool that it is? What would be your sort of dream, um, let's say? <laughs> you know, one of my favorite things about making a constellation is that it's 
by definition somewhat cosmological. So I love when things are kind of thrown out into a particular constellation or into a particular sort of arrangement. And then actually the three-dimensional object that creates itself between the organization of the book, between the different kind of offerings that are in the book, between the chapters and the modes of thinking, and you, that three-dimensional object between those two things is completely different. You'll read, so I suppose that the tip in that is read it transversely and read it differently, because that's where, you know, the really interesting kind of emergences might happen. And I think one thing that I would say more about those terms that we decided to highlight is also within those, the same term and the same font across the book doesn't mean the same thing. And so, you know, the slippages and misunderstandings and moment of, of kind of synergies between different modes of thinking kind of read it in a paranoia. I always refer to this as like a reparative paranoia. It's like, it's not a, the Sedgwick reparative reading or paranoid reading, but rather a kind of, a, paranoid reading that sees connections between disciplines and between modes of thinking, but that ultimately has a kind of reparative ethic at heart. Marina, do you also want to say some words as to how to best use this tool? Yeah, I think Lucia put it beautifully. I, I will say that I also use it myself because obviously we all read, read all the text and so much there's always some of them that you are more attached to. And then when you suddenly open the book and read one, and so I, th I would say that you can try to follow our minds and this kind of paranoia that Lucia is talking about by following the chapters and then some stories will emerge. But at the same time, the book also allows that you just open it and start reading separately. And then there are certain connections that are uh, really, you know, powerful. That when you start mixing uh, Octavia Butler uh, with Anna Tsing, and then, you know, what, what happens in those spaces and how we understand, uh, you know, the systems in which we live and the forms of relations that are created under these two, um, you know, visions of the world. So. I will, I will say, suggest that, you know, I, every day you read one and sometimes you read the same one several times. That is my case with, for instance, the, the text by Marisol de la Cadena that I really, for me, has been something that has shifted my perspective so much. So, yeah, that's what I can offer. And actually, like given I... that you mentioned Marisol, I think it's just worth, uh, Marina, you've just prompted me to say that the generosity of the um, authors of the text in the book is needs to be acknowledged and pay homage to. So to all of those contributors, I think we owe thanks and we owe generosity. Ultimately, the thoughts are theirs. You know, we just did a little bit of the, the remixing. Yeah, and to trust us to to create that and to put them together in a way that they will, wouldn't know how <laughs> that will resonate. So I think they were really a generous patient and they gave us uh, their trust. Great. Well, thank you so much for sharing some insights on, on, on the making of this, of this volume. Um, I feel like this this proposal that you make of entanglements and frictions across species and beings is an absolute uh, essential component to the present moment. So I thank you for telling us a little bit about the process that went into making this volume. And I would encourage everybody that is with us now to 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 look into it and also try to use it yourself as a tool um, for the moment that we are living in. Thank you so much, Lucia and Marina. And with this wonderful introduction, we're going to go and uh, talk to um, two people that were doing one of the workshops in our workshop program. These topics uh, that the More Than Human volume uh, evokes is, are also the topics of their workshop. And this idea of Anthropocene and looking at effects of climate crisis in our cities and in our times were also at the heart of the process that went into making these workshops. So they're here with us today. I'm delighted to welcome them here onto the set. Emma kaufmann Leduc and Laura Nacht. They were running a workshop called Ecologies of Non-Design. Can you guys tell me a little bit about the process of 
running this workshop, the kind of walks that you were doing. Emma, maybe you want to start? <laughs> um, hi, I'm Emma. Um, we're students from Vienna and at the tail end of our studies in architecture. And we began basically, um, most simply put, by questioning the anthropocentric visions and um, values that kind of permeate through the architectural profession. And from there, um, this is an idea that has stuck with us and resonated between the two of us for a while. Um, yeah, and a bit on to our workshop, which we prepared a little bit from the participants um, and gathered their input from. Do you want to start with? And maybe for the workshop, it was important for us to emphasize on working with the methods of other disciplines. So in a way, we tried to expose ourselves to other ex um, disciplines. And maybe we can give an example on that. We um, used the method of the ecological transect, where a body of uh, one square meter that is linked to others um, can become representative in terms of biodiversity to a larger scale. And we, so we tried to use this in a way that we manipulated through our understanding as so, trained in architecture. So we flipped it into the section and then tried to work with this as a so basic understanding. And what became fundamental was this questioning of what is above and what is below. And we had all the participant, uh, participants question this exact notion because what is above might also be considered, for example, what's visible and below what's hidden or in more interesting, so divisions, nature, culture, or um, resource and source. And we kind of dove into what they, how they could interpret this transect, this divide. And then we brought them along, so this transect from the head to Hepia, Epia, and um, worked with several sites along the way. And yeah, and by that we sort of challenged ourselves also to work with outside of what we are comfortable with. So it was also a lot of frustration in that. So some of the participants felt like, but what can we do with this knowledge and how can we work with this? And we felt this is very important. So again, to expose ourselves to other disciplines and make visible the need for others' input and also yeah, by that, maybe it also goes along with why we work with non-human beings. It's also so we sort of force ourselves to think with different scales, various scales that we might otherwise not really think about or would work with. And so you were running these walks over the course of the last three days. Um, and it was very interesting for me at least, that you, you chose this, this path between the two schools that are organizing this event. Was there anything surprising that you found along the way? Could you give us an example? Mm, yeah, I mean, there were several sites of interest that we particularly stopped at, but we tried to keep it so a continuous flow of, of discourse and discussion. Um, but to name one, for example, we came upon a what we now titled the, the linear forest because it was growing out of this crack were some 10, 12 um, species of maple, and they were forming a very young forest along this kind of um, space between the street and the building, and they were clearly unintended and uncalled for. And so we looked at this as kind of um, an urban ecology that you might miss, and but it very much manifests its presence and claims its space in the city. And this was one of the sites that really, so was well, well received by the participants. And what can we do with this knowledge? Like you were saying, you also grapple with this issue. Like what can architectural practitioners, landscape architects, architects, interior architects, what can they do with this knowledge? A knowledge that becomes more and more urgent to have, more and more urgent to engage with. I think one thing that we can do with it is it enables us to have a different view on the city. So we can begin to understand the city as a site of ecological trauma. And then this brings us to a way different understanding of what the city might be. And so, yeah. A major takeaway would be that so the city does not only belong to humans, but non-humans, more than humans. As, and this became an important kind of... Um, 
perspective for the participants to carry out through the walk and then take away with them. It's not the first time that you're doing this work. This is something that you've already been thinking about for a while. Could you tell us a little bit about that process and maybe what will be the next step after this um, manifestation as part of Archipelago? Back in Vienna, um, we were in touch and we are still in touch with a lot of so um, politicians, activists, and um, as well as so scientists, horticulturalists, and we look to remain sort of in this sphere where um, they all become kind of indisposable, as well, indisposable to the project. And yeah, maybe you want to say something how it might continue. And we also look to take the knowledge that we have, um, for example, into a committee about climate for a certain district in Vienna. And I think here it was also very interesting for us as non-locals to learn from locals. And yeah, because in Vienna we feel very local and we're pretty much so engaging with the city a lot. But here we had this really different input and we, we also find it very um, inspiring how resourceful the the open source registry of the city of Ghent or Geneva was and we also think to maybe work in Vienna with this registry and try to you, know. you were mentioning being in touch with other actors in the city with policy makers politicians experts how can architects be heard by these professions because traditionally um, maybe architects are not sitting at these same tables and why is it that architectural practitioners should be heard as part of these conversations what is the what is the importance there it's a good question <laughs> um, I think uh, f well first and foremost that so this one discipline ends and the next begins is a bit frustrating for everyone and that's probably the reason why most people get left out of the table um, in, in the sense of disciplines. Um, but I would say what's also of interest is then not only being present as an architect there or from the architectural discipline, but also standing for non-humans of the city because I think what really becomes important to take away into the future is um, giving so political agency to also non-human beings in the city because they also claim space and and the like so this is this is an important so not only the architect but also standing in for the non-human and and also um yeah historical generations of architects were highly responsible for so for the design and the built environment that we're seeing right now and we are certainly kind of the experts who can sort of perceive this and maybe bring it into other other areas. So in fact, you're, you're speaking more of a role of a mediator, in fact, and an advocate, perhaps. But also important to note is to connect to the idea of the, the archipelago. And so viewing ecologies in the city as very much fragmented and yet somehow connected, whether it be through you know, um, on a very large scale, so green tunnels, or on a very small scale, a crack through a pavement that connects two systems. I think it's also important to think about that also with disciplines, how we can kind of create these cracks or break them up a little bit in the same way. So we want to see manifest in physical space and see what grows from the cracks. A beautiful analogy. Thank you so much, Emma. Thanks so much, Lauro. Um, I think that is a wonderful segue that can take us to our next discussion. We're going to be talking about new roles and new practices for architectural practitioners. Um, and this is our final round table um, of the event before our concluding discussion. Um, I'm delighted to be walking into our sort of round table setting where I see all of our guests are already here waiting for us. And Ella is going to moderate this last discussion. Hi. Hi. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm very good. 
Um, I think that you're in for a fun conversation. Oh, absolutely. I can't wait, actually. They're, <laughs> they're already here with their, you know, the beautiful ladies. Everything is amazing. And I can't wait. Thank you Very so good. much. Enjoy Vera. the conversation. Thank see you in a you. bit. Yes, yeah, see you. Thank you. Um, Hello. Um, first, I would like to greet my uh, my p fellow panelists uh, here. Um, have Mariana, Puja, and Anne uh, over here. I will, you know, present them a bit uh, more and let them talk. But first, let me just, you know, uh, do a small, like a short introduction about our panel, which is entitled um, "New Roles." Um, so over the last three days, we have seen and heard a lot, uh, you know, from architects who write, who draw who research, who make books, who make exhibitions, um, who do all kind of different, uh, you know, different practices um, in a way and who make movies and produce installations. Um, and we've also heard several um, arguments from discuss discussants of different panels um, questioning both the position and the potentials of uh, architectural practice, both in our contemporary societies, but also through different uh, historical contexts. Um, and we've discussed a lot about the notion of building and its um, kind of, uh, of building as an architectural practice and its relevance today. Um, and although this topic has been, you know, is not foreign uh, to architectural discourses, it kind of has been uh, put front and center in the last few years, uh, I would say in, in a bit over a decade, uh, perhaps because of, uh, you know, partly because of the, the um, 2008 uh, economic crisis, but also, of course, because of the current conditions that we are, are all living um, because of the ongoing pandemic. Um, and so, for example, whether by choice or necessity, conviction, or as means of survival, um, after 2008, uh, for example, more and more architects, young and established, uh, turned to exhibitions as a viable form, platform to explore and develop their work. Uh, many others also turned to publishing while uh, to experiment with their research, while others, um, in fact, uh, saw in academia or public office uh, you know, the opportunity to grapple with the questions that interest them. Um, and so new roles allow for new topics and new directions to be introduced into the field of architecture and to kind of expand its understanding as well as its outreach. Um, in their new roles, architects can still assume the position of social conveners um, and create spaces for convening without necessarily um, having to resort to you know, the traditional built form. And in fact, my interlocutors today do exactly that, each in their you know, respective uh, uh, ways, uh, they do exactly that. Um, I see them as conveners in some way. Um, so I will briefly introduce uh, our, our first panelist, who is uh, Puja Grawal. Um, she's an architect and urban designer who has held uh, public office positions in London, including at the Greater London Authority, so the London Mayor's Office. Um, and she's also the co-founder of the Social Enterprise Public Practice. Uh, we also have Anne Louis, who is an architect and founding uh, principal of Future Firm, who, which is a Chicago-based multidisciplinary architectural and design research practice. She was also the co-curator of the US Pavilion at the Venice Architecture Biennale of 2018. Uh, entitled Dimensions of Citizenship, um, and she's also the editor and curator of uh, other books and programs. Um, and finally, we have Mariana Pestana, uh, Pestana sorry, um, who is an architect and independent curator. She is a member of the interdisciplinary uh, collective called The Decorators, and most recently she curated the fifth uh, Istanbul Design Biennale entitled Empathy Revisited, Designs for More Than One. Each one, in each, each one of my, my uh, panelists today, in their own ways, has carved a space for different types of architectural practices, processes to kind of emerge within their, their practice, um, stretching disciplinary boundaries far and wide, and providing examples for assuming new roles, but also new responsibilities towards other fellow citizens. So ladies, welcome, and thank you so much for being here. 
uh, Pooja, to, to kickstart this conversation, I will turn to you. And um, I will actually ask each of you in, in due time to tell us more about you know, your work within the context of this panel. Uh, but I would like to start with, uh, with Pooja and uh, ask you if you could please give us an overview of your work and perhaps tell us a bit more about your experience working in public office um, and the public realm, um, as well as uh, you know, in planning via, uh, via your, your uh, public practice. Hi, thank you so much for having me. So that's quite a big question and I'll try and keep it fairly concise. So as, as um, introduced, I trained as an architect and practiced in architecture and urban design practices for a number of years. I've always been really passionate about the social purpose of architecture. So what, what good can we do? as architects and how can we make sure the work we do has the most impact on the public so that design is not seen as an elitist concept but everyone has access to a good life and I believe the architect has a fundamental role in, in defining and enabling that. So perhaps as an architect in the traditional sense, uh, working in practice, maybe I felt like the building was a bit too constraining. And even through at university, I always sort of wanted to look beyond the building, look at the kind of wider context, the city, the neighborhoods, um, the country, the international context. So that sort of has always been uh, my, my interest. And throughout my, I guess, private practice of working at Publica, which was a research, urban research practice, we made that where I worked as a project architect again in that role play, um, working primarily for the public sector at the time uh, I've kind of got this I thought actually it would be really interesting to sort of change sides of the table so where the, you know I guess the question of power is perhaps something we'll come to quite a lot here is like who has the power to really make change and to make an impact so for me the move to Greater London Authority which is as you introduced was the Mayor's Office in London I felt like I had much more agency to really define what is it that we should be actually um, thinking about in the city so what are the kind of key challenges that we should be thinking about now but also in the next three to five years and there's the sort of power of working in, in government, I felt like you could influence finance and money, which actually is such a big driver in how our cities are impacted and think about which neighbourhoods should we be really investing in, who should we be talking to, which are the communities we can really um, support, but do that on a kind of evidence-based. So that was my sort of experience working in, in public sector. I worked delivering projects, so funding projects, getting brilliant architects on board to use space as a tool to make a case for what are the different types of opportunities opportunities you have on a site, for example, but I also worked in policy impacting, the, uh, thinking about housing design, and I think the, the context in the UK is different, um, I think, in terms of the kind of basic quality of what you get in social housing in this country, which is really, really low. So to be able to impact that on a policy scale was really interesting. So um, that, I guess, was my kind of career. and. Uh, the, the sort of journey I took to join public sector, I thought there was a, a really big opportunity to get more people involved in that kind of fundamental planning, um, at that kind of early stage of thinking, early stage of influencing the city. So I co-founded Social Enterprise Public Practice, which is all about bringing talent, skills and resources into government at various levels, all sorts of um, skills. So architects, but also engineers, infrastructure experts, and um, you know, people with sustainability expertise, bringing these kind of multidisciplinary skills to solve today's challenges is I think one of the most important things we need to think about. And, and the previous conversation actually touched on that, like how do we work beyond our silos? So um, perhaps I'll, I'll stop there for now and I'm sure we can pick up the conversation again. Right, absolutely. Um, uh, I actually just want to very briefly, uh, you know, build on, on what you said and ask you another question, um, because you mentioned the public sector and kind of bringing more people and more creative talent into government uh, in order to, you know, for them to have more of a kind of voice and influence uh, somehow on, you know, the, the, the decision making process, I guess. Um, but my, my very uh, kind of initial reaction is, how do you, and, and maybe, 
you know, this is uh, kind of uh, me coming from a, you know, a, a bit of a dysfunctional uh, background. When, when, when I think of the public sector in, in my home country, it's a bit of a dysfunctional kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, space. And so I just wanted to kind of ask you about, you know, how do you uh, circumvent or deal with, you know, the, the, the kind of logistical challenges and hurdles that we, I think, you know, regardless of uh, the dysfunctional aspect or not, I think exists within the public sector in general, I think, kind of a little bit across the world. Um, so if you, if you have a bit of an insight for us about that, that would be great. And that's a really good question. I grew up in Mumbai in India, so you know, let's not begin to start talking about dysfunctional government. It's it's really interesting, even um I think that sort of corruption, you know, was a very big part of I guess bureaucracy in, in India. And uh, that was the sort of context I grew up in and this idea of like working in the public sector being a really aspirational job in itself is something that we've really really tried to challenge and push forward through public practice the kind of actually things like what well, planning and the public sector both are quite sort of come with a lot of connotations and I probably am the last sort of person anyone would imagine if they closed their eyes and thought about what a public planner looks like. So that's one of the key things we're trying to do actually with public practices, challenge that kind of conception of what bureaucracy is about the public sector being incredibly slow and uncreative. Actually, I would argue you know, the public sector had, because partly because of that connotation, so much uh, money has been like drained. We've had austerity in this country for a number of years and uh, resources have been drained from the public sector. Fundamentally, government and public sector should be thinking about everyone, thinking about the biggest impact they can have, but also they have the potential power to be thinking about the long term and not sort of thinking about the immediate sort of response and the immediate kind of revenue that they, they need. And, and of course, we're in this really strange position at the moment where we can talk about this at length, about what does the future look like now, given um, you know, what is the economic future going to look like. But I think you can, being within the system, and again, this kind of refers to the previous conversation, actually challenging and designing and being part of designing that system, I think is really, really important. So how can you use something like procurement, which is seen as this like huge machine? How can you actually be creative within that process to ensure that you're getting the best quality designers, for example, on board? Or how can you use procurement as a tool to ensure that you're getting really diverse consultants um, pitching for work? So systems can be, you know, they're machines, they're designed by us. So we have that power to actually be creative about how we shift and move it in the kind of sm in small ways, but also in big ways. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, and I think, uh, you know, this is a great segue into uh, and the work that you are doing um, as well, the work that you do uh, um, with the Office of the Public Architect and the way that you, you know, the, the, the the kind of thinking that you put in, um, you know, for for this particular advocacy uh, project, which uh, you have originally initiated, you know, in the context of a of a cultural event, right, of a, of the 2017 uh, Chicago Architecture Biennial, uh, but it has kind of taken different dimensions, um, you know, in in the way that you're thinking about it. So. Uh, could you please tell us a little bit more about this uh, about this project, but perhaps also, you know, how it ties to, um, you know, your larger practice as an architect? Because here, I think you are, you know, one of the the, the panelists here that actually does have uh, an architectural practice as well. And so, if you could just give us a window, perhaps into into those both worlds and how they come together, but also how they perhaps. Clash. I don't know if that's the the proper term. You could maybe tell us more about it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think uh, it, it's very inspiring to hear about uh, public practice at, at this different scale and in a different context. For me, Office of the Park Office of the Public Architect started when we opened our uh, architecture firm here in Chicago. Um, and the first people who came to us uh, looking for, for design work 
weren't people who had, you know, design driven projects or ground up construction. They were folks who um, uh, had been issued building violations by Chicago's Department of Buildings and were struggling to get them resolved. Um, so many building violations, which range in scale from like a crack on the facade or to a poorly maintained window to um, much more um, kind of structural issues like uh, foundation damage or, or renovation issues. And um, they require a licensed architect to resolve them, um, but there's no, uh, many folks don't have resources uh, for, for um, design work. So we start to ask this question, why is it that um, in the United States when accused of a crime, if you cannot uh, afford a lawyer, that you are entitled to a public defender, why is it that when you are issued a building violation, you aren't entitled uh, to the work of a public architect? Um, so we were very inspired by the work of Clara Foltz, who was um, one of the first women who, were, who was admitted uh, to practice uh, law in California in the 19th century, who was one of the first advocates for the public defender's office. And she made the argument that the law should be a, a, a sword as well as a shield. So if we think about that in terms of the, the Department of Buildings uh, in the United States, why is it that, um, you know, the, that, that the city is able to issue building violations and act as a sword, but can't also act as a shield to do kind of pro proactive uh, maintenance measures? Um, so this idea of the Office of the Public Architect um, is a kind of like long-term project that I want to advocate about in the same way that Claire Fultz advocated for the Public Defense office, even though it wasn't um, enacted uh, into federal law until decades um, after she passed away. Um, I think that for me, I see this kind of on the ground as well as a practitioner that, um, especially in Chicago, there are neighborhoods on the south and west sides that have been impacted by decades of systemic racism, where folks have had to defer maintenance or are facing issues of of, of vacancy in their neighborhoods or, or, or building stock that has um, that hasn't been um, had the resources to be maintained the way it should uh, because of discriminatory practices. I think there has to be a different way of doing architecture in Chicago. Um, otherwise, uh, those kind of conditions will continue to propagate in a way that continues to produce inequality uh, in the city uh, at large. Great, thank you so much. Um, and. Uh, do you are you in fact uh, you know in in conversation uh, somehow with uh, people in uh, public office uh, in general in Chicago? Um, you know, like how, what is I guess my question is what is your uh, views on the possibility, kind of 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 making this uh, you know, kind of moving this project from you know, the circles of, uh, you know, kind of this circle that we are that we are in right now into, you know, truly uh, kind of public policy, um, uh, you know, uh, space, I guess. Yeah, one of the things that I've been really interested in is the, the building inspectors who are the, the folks on the ground who go out into neighborhoods and issue building violations or review construction to make sure it's up to code. Um, and there's an amazing sociologist uh, uh, who went, Robin Bartram, who went on a series of ride-alongs with building inspectors here in Chicago. And I think what she learned from them is really incredible, which is that they actually see themselves as on the side of kind of like the little guy uh, fighting against the big guy. So they might, um, for example, go easy on somebody who is a single family homeowner who's actually really actively trying to make repairs to the building that they own, while they might uh, give uh, uh, someone they perceive as an exploitive landlord a kind of harder time. Um, so from that research, I kind of see that actually there, are, there is a cohort of folks both on the kind of architecture side, the design side, as well as community organizers um, and folks who have been doing kind of decades of work around uh, these issues of kind of discriminatory housing practices and so on, as well as folks on the city side who, um, like across the board, I think are invested in, in creating a kind of safer and more equitable city for everyone. Um, and in Chicago, that's certainly changing, especially under the new administration, um, there's a kind of belief that there can be more equitable development on, on, on the south and west sides. Um, so I think that there's many folks who, who believe in, in this kind of future, but the question is, what is the infrastructure that can bring folks together that goes against the infrastructure that's already in place, which creates an antagonistic relationship between architects, between builders, between folks who live in communities, um, and, and how to kind of unravel that and find a way that people can work together, which is kind of part of the idea of the Office of the Public Architect uh, as well. That's a site for convening um, and change, as well as a kind of logistical problem that needs to be solved in the bureaucracy. 
Right, um, and I would love to actually go back to uh, to these uh, notions that uh, both you and Pooja discussed. But first, I would like to uh, ask uh, Mariana, who, in fact, I believe has a slightly, you know, different approach uh, than. Uh, I mean, each one of you has a different uh, approach in, in in their work and for their work, but uh, somehow also, you know, within kind of the, the platforms that uh, Mariana, you know, works in. I think she also works on, you know, this notion of the architect as a citizen um, and, uh, you know, tries to kind of push these notions uh, further and, and sort of, you know, enlarge them. And, um, and you have, in fact, Mariana, quite a, you know, broad reaching professional practice, uh, right? And uh, you, you also, you, you kind of engage in both, you know, uh, site-specific, I guess, interventions as well as the public realm in general. And I'm thinking of your work with the decorators, but also, you know, uh, um, your, uh, to, the, to a certain extent, the, the work that you've done with the Istanbul Design Biennale uh, last year. It was last year, yes. Sorry, the time time is a bit uh, kind of compressed. Last year, when I say last year, I'm always confused if it's the year before or, or not. Um, but in any case, uh, I just, uh, you know, I guess I wanted to ask you to give you the chance to also speak both about, you know, your work with the decorators, but also about the, the, the Biennale and the title of the Biennale and, you know, the uh, kind of idea of designing for more than one. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, maybe try to speak also about how these practices kind of like feed into each other um, somehow. Sure. Hi, Ala. Nice to see you. And uh, first of all, let me congratulate um, Vera for these, what has been really a fantastic conversation over the last, um, I think, two, two and a half days. Um, I've been following and it's been, it's been really great to, um, to listen to everyone. And thank you, Ala, for, for the introduction. Um, uh, so, so yes, with, with my practice at the Decorates, which I um, co-run together with Xavi Front, uh, Susanna O'Connell and Carolina Caicedo, um, uh, it's uh, a practice we, we all talk about it in different ways and that's partly the, the beauty of being a collective is that we, um, we have different um, ways of approaching the practice but um, the, the way I see it really is um, a, a kind of fiction practice so we work with um, city councils, with cultural organisations um, and different parties to um, rehearse futures, right? And we do this in a very collective manner. So normally our projects are um, infrastructures for collaboration. They may take up the form of a restaurant or a cinema or, you know, they take up different programs. But what we, we always want to do is to set up um, a structure um, in, uh, with which uh, many, many people can plug into, right? And then um, together, collectively, we imagine what the future of a certain site may be. And I see very much our role as, as uh, you know, actors in the in the architecture field because we're not all architects. Um, Carolina has a psychology background, Suzanne has a landscape architecture background, and Xavi interior design. And then our structure expands and compresses depending on the project. We always. Um, uh, you know, the team grows and diminishes depending on, on the size and the, and the skills that each project um, uh, needs, let's say. Um, but uh, we, we always do this effort of, of trying to rehearse what a possibility can be for a given site. And I think it was really interesting to hear you talk about the 2008 crisis and how certain practices developed out of that, because that's um, very much the case of the decorators. We started working together in 2010 um, and we were in London at the time, and there were so many practices sort of starting up. And when I was hearing your introduction, it made me um, think of uh, when I interviewed Assemble um, uh, for the uh, Architects Journal here in Portugal. And they said something like, oh, um, we saw a, uh, uh, I think, existed a project in London, and then um, practice architects saw that practice saw, saw that project and said, "Oh, we can do it." And then we saw um, practice uh, architects and we said, "Oh, we can do it." And I think we also saw assemble and thought, "Oh, we can do it." And there was really this sense uh, that um, 
despite uh, the, obviously the difficulties of, of self-generating projects, there was a real sense of agency in the definition of the program, right? Um, so the idea that we could do, we could um, uh, begin a project and assign a program for a given site. And for me, that really has to do with this, um, in our case, this desire for imagining futures alternative to the dominant or sometimes even inevitable, seemingly inevitable futures that are presented to us. Um, and so that was, I, you know, I always see our projects as almost synecdoche, so little tiny parts of um, a larger vision that, uh, that we are developing and we make it possible and for a period of time in a given site and, uh, and we test it together with other people and, in, you know, very much connected with everyday life. And, and then um, by, by rehearsing that possibility, we can understand um, better what, what options, or, or at least enlarge sort of the lexicon of possibilities for, um, for, for the future. And in my territorial practice, I think I'm, I'm very interested in that as well. So I think of cultural projects as um, the creation of states of exception, almost, right? So. I think that cultural projects can create space, open up space for um, imagining possibilities um, that are not yet plausible, perhaps, in the real world um, due to sometimes technological, but also sometimes legal or political reasons. And I think in, in cultural context, you have the opportunity of, of rehearsing alternative futures. And that's what I'm interested in, in doing very much. And I think to do that, um, uh, it's important for me. It's it's really important to see architecture or design as a critical practice of critiquing what um, like dominant visions of of the present, but also pointing to um, possible alternatives. And and that's what we did also with the Istanbul uh, Design Biennial. The you were asking about the title. And uh, the title is Revisiting Empathy because um, uh, uh, even though nowadays we understand empathy as, as the means to understand or, or, or connect or, or, or grasp other people's feelings, in the beginning, in you know, the beginning of, of the 20th century, when the term came into circulation, it had to do with um, how we may elicit um, emotional connections between humans, but also um, non-human entities. Um, such as um, nature or um, uh, inanimate objects, and uh, and so I thought that in, in yeah in the you know in the 21st century age of artificial intelligence, but also the age of, of a very very serious climate crisis, it would be interesting to understand you know how can design um, um, play the role of mediating of um, 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 yeah, emotional um, connections, because I think that's that's what's um, really urgent today. We we are given um, uh, facts and information about the climate crisis um, that we're in, in the form of numbers of, of data. Um, but I think it's 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 very important to um, uh, elicit, I, I suppose, um, uh, emotional encounters. And I guess, you know, in the, uh, I, I, I worked on the Istanbul Design Biennial together with Samitra Upham and, and Billy Miraben, who are my, my co-curators. And then we, um, and we did a number of projects and some of them were really about building in the city. Those were called new city rituals. Um, and we did, a, so those were a number of interventions in the, in the city of Istanbul that, um, Again, very much in the spirit of the decorators, if you'd like, sort of um, uh, created uh, hosting structures whereby um, each project had a host in the city of Istanbul, and we set up a structure where we had a young curators group uh, who were Nur Orsanala, uh, Ulya Soleil, and Elul Shensis based in Istanbul, and they had the responsibility of sort of mediating between designers, projects, and the hosting structure, which could be a community group or um, uh, a school or a city council um, in order for this project not to just land on the city, but really to be rooted in, in the context of 
the social dynamics that, that were taking place in Istanbul. And what those projects did was um, to um, do this effort of imagining a future where citizenship is not uh, um, is not a limited category, right? So they were doing this effort of expanding citizenship to include more than human uh, entities, but also to, um, yeah, to, so this effort of, of broadening cit citizenship, let's say something that is, I think, um, uh, a constant uh, preoccupation, let's say, of my practice. Right. Thank you so much, uh, Mariana. Um, I actually really like what you said about, uh, you know, exhibitions kind of being, uh, you know, the kind of like designing a space for a state of exception, uh, somehow to imagine, you know, a situation yet to come. And I actually want to turn to uh, both Anne and Pooja with this question. Anne, because you also have uh, extensive uh, uh, experience with, uh, with exhibition making uh, and, and participating in exhibitions in general. So I would like to hear what you uh, what you think uh, about this in, in response to what Mariana just said. Uh, and then I would, look, would also like to hear from Pooja, because Pooja, you kind of, you know, you, you straddle both worlds somehow, right? So when Mariana's talking about a state of exception uh, in a way, in, a, in an exhibition setting, in a kind of like creative setting, you come from a creative background and you work with like with with creative networks um, but you're also very much anchored in the real world and so i would also like to hear your response uh, to that uh, you know to that statement somehow so and maybe we'll we'll start with you to make a smoother transition somehow yeah, no, I also, I, I find this idea of the state, state of exception um, in, in exhibitions like a really kind of beautiful thought, right? That that uh, exhibitions might carve out a space for thinking or working um, that can't happen in, in other conditions. Um, and I think that um, uh, at Dimensions of Citizenship for the U.S. Pavilion, uh, you know, we, uh, Mimi I co-curated with Mimi Zeiger and Neil Atkinson and and we wrote this proposal for the U.S. Pavilion at a time where we, I think, were personally uh, trying to reckon with with what was happening in the United States. So, uh, kind of ongoing uh, violence and loss um, around the topic of citizenship, and a kind of what we felt like was a, a underrecognized impact of of the role of the built environment in creating um, those kind of those kinds of spaces. And um, and so the work we did was to kind of think about citizenship at multiple scales. We thought about it from the from the body to the cosmos. Um, and Mariana, it's, it's great to hear you also speaking about um, the idea of thinking about non uh, about citizenship for non-human actors, because that was also, I think, a, a thread that was really important for us. Um, but for me, what is uh, kind of beautiful about the state of exception is that if, the, if that state can also grow to impact the kind of field at large. So what was powerful for me was that all the projects um, at the U.S. Pavilion ended up kind of taking on and continuing in a life of their own um, beyond um, beyond the exhibition itself. So Studio Gang and Scape were uh, working on a, on a project uh, now uh, at the Mississippi River, which is coming to life a few years after this exhibition. Um, uh, Teddy Cruz and Fauna Foreman continue to work at the, the U.S.-Mexico border in collaboration um, with the mayors of Tijuana and San Diego. I mean, for me, it's really the idea is that you can both create this kind of space of exception where there can be um, a kind of like uh, artistic imagination or architectural imagination that might not be able to happen um, like on a kind of traditional fee-based client project or in academia, but then those projects can go on to kind of change the discourse of the discipline one inch or one millimeter, right? So when those conversations are happening on the ground, that that they're 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 kind of shaped and influenced by this this discourse that happens um, in 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 the spaces of the exception, but that then you know kind of have this ripple effect uh, out into the world. That that's something that's really profound and, and kind of exciting for me about exhibitions in general. Fantastic! Thank you so much, Pooja. I I give you the the you know the the platform right now to to respond <laughs> somehow to what was just uh, what was just said. Um, and perhaps if you have you know uh, some concrete examples that you could uh, pull from, I think to, to help us illustrate you know this uh, this notion of the the state of exception, but kind of like how it manifests itself in the real quote-unquote, world, um, in a way? Sure. Um, I think 
the thing that's almost for me so powerful about both Anne and Mariana's work is around that the, the, these kind of spaces of exception are all about growing and it, it's not this sort of thing that is um kind of isolated in its in its existence and so I, I think actually the, it, it, that's really really powerful about both their work more generally I think if we were to think about um this idea of the state of exception being I guess elitist um is is where it becomes a bit problematic where I guess when architects are only talking to architects and we're all trying to tell each other what we think is the best way forward or what the kind of future can be and not sort of kind of broaden who who is kind of part of these conversations and how different people's experiences are as valid to kind of contribute to these spaces. And, and like I said, I don't think this is at all a criticism of Anna, Anna and Mariana. And actually the work that comes to my mind when you ask for a good example, it completely is the work I've seen with the decorators in, you know, in local authorities when they've sort of tested, um, you know, kind of pirate radio stations and, you know, like boxing matches. And I let Mariana talk, talk about her own work. Um, so it, for me, it's like the, the except the like the kind of idea of exception is almost like problematic like we should all be able to have the opportunity to be in places that are beautiful and imaginative and playful and joyous and so how do we move away from that position that we are only contributing to spaces of exception sure we need to test ideas but like how do we do that in spaces that are accessible and open and public um, and actually, this is perhaps a good segue into a sort of um, very, obviously, very linked uh, part of your practice, uh, but I guess a bit, you know, uh, different than uh, your, the work that you do with, um, with um, public practice. And I'm thinking here about uh, your sound advice uh, project, uh, Puja, and, uh, you know, in the same way, kind of, I guess, that you deal with notions of uh, bridging inequalities and, uh, you know, bridging these kinds of gaps in the public sector or in, in you know, in, I, I'm sorry, forgive me, I don't really like that term, but like in real life, um, but then how you also do it through a platform like Sound, uh, like Sound Advice um, in a kind of, um, how do you say, um, I guess, creative platform um, somehow. So if you could tell us a bit more about that, please. Sure, so Sound Advice is an initiative I've sort of, have we actually set it up? I think we've set it up. So Joseph Henry and I work together at the Greater London Authority and um, both of us being people of color within the industry, I suppose, like many people have had various experiences. And I guess we were sort of a bit tired of the the way I guess every time people talk about that well t talk about diversity in the industry people do roll their eyes feel a bit bored or, or kind of say oh you've got a bit of a chip on your shoulder so we were kind of interested in kind of tackling the subject in a in a different kind of way in a it's in quite a provocative way, in quite a funny way, and use perhaps different cultural references to tackle this. So Sound Advice is a platform and we use a whole lot of different types of media to provoke. Um, our Instagram, um, if you follow us in sound underscore x underscore advice, if you look it up now, we use sort of quite provocative slogans uh, or tips as a way to get people almost a bit uncomfortable, but it gives people the time to pause and reflect and think about um, people's behaviour so we've, we've done a whole lot of things. We've held um, awards, Sound Advice Awards, which was about uh, actually, you know, quite relevant to this. It's like celebrating all of the people who really have a huge responsibility and impact on our built environment. But yet we tend to celebrate the architect as the architect who actually gets the award. But what about the community activists who actually spend years and years actually saying that this shot, the site should be like, uh, a kind of community housing project or what about the environmental lawyer who's been pushing to kind of make sure that we have um, the kind of legal rights to to sustainability in buildings so we kind of use different forms of media um, and and I guess the lockdown has helped us kind of push that and actually one of the things Mariana was talking about before like 
the kind of experience of food, I was thinking actually we use music in that sort of a way to experience things and use music to think about architecture. So the other thing we are often quite frustrated about is a quite a, a limited sense of academia, perhaps references for academia for architecture. So how can we push that beyond, you know, the, the very limited references we had in architecture education? So how can we use a music video um, to tackle social housing and actually, you know, why can't music lyrics be as form or valid reference point when we're talking about people's experiences in the city. So we've sort of used these kind of quite experimental forms to bring these kind of conversations together to challenge some of the very stale um, kind of approaches or understandings of what the city is, what architecture is, how it should be taught and what it is should be celebrated. And, and I mean, I can talk about space, but also challenging the aesthetics. Uh, we use quite a lot of references in kind of pop culture, hip hop culture, you know, our, our fonts, our colors, our, you know, again, the, the sort of music we use, it's again, challenging a very particular sense of aesthetic of what has tended to define good architecture to date. Great, thank you so much. Um, and uh, I actually, you know, hearing all of you speak um, just now, I, I'm, I'm thinking um, about, you know, the, the kind of, when we talk about, you know, an expanded notion of uh, architecture uh, somehow, you know, when, when, when people have sort of opted for, you know, uh, as we were talking about earlier, um, not following, you know, the, the traditional uh, uh, path of being an architect who builds. Um, I wonder if um, that choice in itself somehow, you know, uh, uh, liberates also the kind of topics that one is able to engage in and engage with. Um, so, for example, you know, if, if I'm not, you know, if I don't have the constraints of creating necessarily a, a space in a traditional sense, if that actually, you know, um, somehow naturally allows for, um, our, for people from the creative field to kind of engage in more, you know, in broader topics somehow and engage with larger topics that are more kind of anchored within a societal uh, um, uh, context. Um, and this is, I guess, a, a, a very open and broad question. Um, and so you should, you know, kind of all feel free to, to, to jump in. Um, but Mariana, for example, when, when you're, you know, um, when you're dealing with, um, with, uh, with the Biennale, for example, right? Uh, with the context of the exhibition. And you've dealt with a lot of different thematics um, in, this, uh, in this exhibition somehow. Food was one of them. Um, and I just kind of wanted to, to understand in this case, what are the, I guess, the anchors, you know, that dri or the drivers that uh, pull you or push you towards certain uh, thematics and certain topics uh, you know to, to to pursue in the work that you do thanks um, yeah to, to answer your question I, I, I don't think that um, it is by operating outside or at the borders of, of the, the discipline the practice of building that these questions should be or or, or are easier to consider um, uh, you know, the, 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 I think the practice of, of active listening to um, to society is something that is part of um, histories of architecture that have been, for example, here in Portugal, where I'm from, uh, the Sal movement uh, following the, the revolution in '75. You know, that's that's a really great example of how um, a practice of, of deep listening to uh, um, to to inhabitants, to, um, uh, to to citizens, then resulted in the making of, um, of proper buildings, let's say. Um, but uh, in relation to, to, to your question um, around food, uh, yes, I mean, it's interesting because, you know, at the decorators, we've um, always used food uh, as a fundamental part of our project and, uh, and I think it has to do with maybe two qualities of, of you know, the, the, the gathering that food makes uh, possible 
um, uh, one um, diagram that we often refer to is a diagram of, of commensality by Susan Kerner, who's a food anthropologist, where she um, maps uh, different scales of commensality from uh, in utero feeding, you know, in the case of uh, mother and child, to um, uh, the scale of banquets or food banks, you know, where many, many people um, share foods together. And this idea of companionship, which is inherent to food, and this idea of collectivity um, is quite interesting. At the same time, um, uh, there is this question of uh, the commensality is, is the sharing of food around the table. And the table is a really interesting metaphor for, you know, who sits at the table and who does not, in terms of who is included in conversations about um, the future of our cities, of our uh, of the places we are discussing. And I think that's um, uh, that's quite interesting. In that sense, for example, the work of uh, Sarah Ahmed and her phenomenology of the table has been really important to, to, to us in our thinking about um, uh, how the, the uh, how issues of, of difference that may have to do with um, gender, that may have to do with race, that may have to do with uh, uh, species, um, how they are played out uh, at the table. And then I think food is also a Trojan horse in a sense that um, uh, through food you may speak about um, uh, geopolitical um, really important questions, um, uh, you, you may talk about um, uh, politics and so on. That's what we did, for example, with the Critical Cooking Show now at the Istanbul Design Biennial, where we did a, a program, a digital program that was, uh, you know, borrowed from this culinary form that is something that we are quite used to watching from home. That's partly why we thought about it um, as a, a format that is consumed from the comforts of the house. But... Uh, where each episode starts with uh, an ingredient or a, a, a utensil, but then discusses um, very topical contemporary um, issues. Um, and you know, to give you uh, some examples, there's an episode by Luisa Prado, for example, um, uh, which begins with her um, a set of, of ingredients that are used in her, you know, in her family. Um, including onions and others, but then she goes on to a pepper, for example, she goes on to, to describe how, how some of those ingredients are also used in um, tear gas uh, uh, bombs and, and the context of demonstrations both in Brazil and in Turkey that are taking place at the moment and the use of, uh, of tear gas as a means of controlling crowds and, and political uprisings. And and so I think I'm I'm always interested in in, in um, uh, yeah in the use of, uh, of food I guess as a gateway um, for broader um, uh, I think societal and spatial questions. Building on this uh, notion of. Uh, listening, right? To lis listening to different actors, listening to uh, you know, uh, training, I guess, ourselves or untraining ourselves to listen uh, more carefully to you know different agents that are involved in in our work. Um, I wanted to ask uh, both Anne and uh, and Pooja how uh, you know how these how this kind of notion plays out and how do we. Uh, you know, uh, um, I guess uh, uh, either expand our, you know, our, uh, the pool uh, to who we listen to or in, in our work uh, or like in, in your work in particular, um, or, you know, how do we actually on the, on the country, you know, just focus it on uh, agents that have not been heard, uh, you know, uh, before. Maybe I, I can maybe jump in very quickly. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, you know, this really resonates with me. I've been thinking a lot um, lately with my collaborator, Anna Miliaki, about this question of co-authoring. And for me, actually, all the kind of discussions that we're, and uh, all the things I admire about uh, Mariana and Pooja's practice, these questions of other actors who who contribute to to the built environment, like, for me, that's always been there. And even with a kind of traditional building practice, so like, I think we could make the argument that that everything in the built environment is co-authored, right? By by 
tradespeople, by builders, but also by the people who inhabit buildings and maintain them, by by non-human actors, the the insects and critters and animals who who affect buildings over time, as well as um, like Kuja was mentioning, the the kind of community activists, organizers, everybody who has who has kind of like paved the way for the for the work that's happening now to occur. Um, and I think for me, the the issue is kind of like, uh, as you mentioned, to to kind of undo the myth of the the sole genius in architecture, right? So it's not necessarily that like at the at the at the core of architecture, there is this kind of certain way of practice that's happening, and in expanded practice, there's another form of practice. Like I believe that form of practice is like a, a, across the field, right? So how do we reframe how we think about um, architecture and and the built environment at large to include um, all the kind of co-authors? Who have already kind of uh, always been there is, is something I'm thinking about. Um, and for me, like in, in our practice in Chicago, often um, when we're working on projects on the south and west sides, um, we're working with folks who 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 are bringing who are who we've met or who have become friends or collaborators before the point that an architecture an architect would traditionally be involved, right? In 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 kind of uh, capital A American. Uh, professional practice. So that means that we're working collaboratively to figure out what the future of a project might be, how funds might come to the table, how it might get over certain bureaucratic hurdles, how it might build consensus um, in a community about what, what the kind of um, best impact or best future for a certain site or certain places, how to bring forward kind of histories that have been overlooked um, of a certain place. Um, I, for me, that that's actually kind of always present. So I, I really appreciate this idea of listening because I think that in any project, even no matter you know how mundane, I think all those actors are always present if we if we take the kind of minute to to look or listen or or and and I wonder if the role of the architect actually starts to be to to slow down the process, right? That our job might actually be to to drag our heels to say that that development doesn't need to happen so quickly or in a certain way. And that our job can be to to move slowly to to help convene all those voices at the table and and make sure um, and, and just to be part of that to be part of that process kind of collaboratively. Thank you so much, Pooja. I I, I turn to you to basically um, you know tell us maybe if, if in your in your experience you know you. Are there mechanisms that uh, you know that that in your practice or in your experience are put in place in order to kind of you know um, bring more actors into onto the table and listen to to you know more relevant actors, I guess, uh, to the projects that uh, you're involved with. Yeah, that's that's a really good question. And I, um, I was just when Anne was talking about us, uh, part of our job is to slow down the process. I was just thinking about all of those people who complain about planning being really slow. Maybe that's why it's really uh -huh. slow. It's it, it's to give us all a bit more time to listen to people and to listen to the different uh, to, to different voices. So um, I guess I would try and answer this in in some ways. You could think about the whole process. As if it would really simplify, it's a, it could be seen as being really, really linear. So like the, the process of someone having a concept of something being built somewhere from there being kind of law and planning policy for them being kind of land and funding from there being kind of designs and then there, it being kind of money again to deliver it and then it's delivered in some for, form. And perhaps what we see, if we do oversimplify it, it is that we, we tend to get different people's voices at that point quite a latter stage. So that's when we start to think, hold on, we know already that there's going to be um, a 20 story building on this site. What should the ground floor be? Oh, let's have a kind of conversation here about what that ground floor is, where I think so many of the decisions of, of have already been sort of been made and arguably that's also potentially when the architect is actually coming in is when all of these decisions are being made. So what's, um, and then actually what, what Anne's really made me think about today is that actually the afterlife and the building is built, but then what happens after that, like 20 years on, who are the people who are paying the price for the building, say the building not being built very well, or they're not being kind of safe connections to wider neighborhoods. Uh, and then again, the people who seem, who will kind of, um, have the most impact will be people from 
socially deprived backgrounds or people of colour. So I guess um, what's interesting with Mariana's work is seeing how perhaps this is disrupting. So Mariana is looking at how this doesn't need to be such a linear system and you can actually start to create the projects and, and think about what it is in the first place and convene and get money into it. And I guess from my perspective, it's sort of thinking for the whole stage, like how can we disrupt the people, like actually people who are kind of making the plan, is, um, the policy in the first place, how can we make sure that there are different voices? And that includes, you know, lived experiences, but also actually why aren't more engineers thinking about planning policy or people with like proper sustainability experience thinking about the impact of flooding and water in the next 20 years when we're thinking about our cities. So I guess it's like trying to disrupt the, the it at every stage and making sure that um, all of those decisions are not already made when when we start to think about bringing either different skills in um, in terms of like technical experience or sort of lived experience. Thank you so much, Pooja. I'm actually being told that uh, we need to uh, we need to wrap up uh, this uh, this conversation. But thank you so much for this amazingly rousing uh, discussion about you know the the different i guess ways uh, that as architects we could practice creative citizenship um, i really uh, thank you mariana thank you puja thank you anne for uh, all your contributions and for the stellar examples uh, that you've pulled out from your practice to uh, you know show uh, everyone that is following us you know the the, the different uh, new roles i guess that architects could assume um, so I will also just uh, tell uh, everyone else who is uh, following us online that uh, we're going to take a break uh, and we'll be back at uh, 8.10. So please stay tuned. Thank you so much again, ladies. Thank you.
And welcome to the concluding segment of our third day of broadcast of our program, Archipelago Architectures for the Multiverse. Three days of reflections on the contemporary state of architectural disciplines. We're talking about architecture, interior architecture, landscape architecture. We're talking about architectural disciplines across scales. And we've had a third day of programming that was dedicated to issues of interdependence. We've talked about kinship and advocacy. We've talked about working with each other in new ways and new configurations. And finally, we just had a round table where we talked about new roles and new practices for architects. And it is now the time to come to the concluding segment of our event. It's been a pleasure to have you with us. Um, before we go on to our conclusion, where we will be discussing with our moderators and also with some students from both HEAD and HEPIA, the two schools organizing this event, we still want to take a look at one of the last workshops that happened as part of our parallel workshop program. I am here joined by Matthias Echenovia. You saw him earlier as part of our working with panel discussion, and Emma Julia Fuller, who is uh, teaching at the HEPIA. Um, hi, guys. Lovely to see you. Hi, Vera. Hi. Hi. So it is my pleasure to be uh, talking to you today. Actually, I'm going to stand, Emma, because you're so tall. I feel like I need to look you in the eye. <laughs> so you were just running a workshop. At the same time, you came here, you did your talk, you went back to the workshop, you concluded your workshop. Can you tell us a little bit about this um, workshop, which was a collaboration between the SCA Genève and Archipelago with Herbs. And it was called Salvage City, Making New from Old. It was a full day workshop and you had a lot of people going into the city doing a lot of collecting and thinking. Can you tell us a bit about that? I'll, I'll ask Emma first. Yeah, so how it came about was that um, Archipelago and the SCA wanted to collaborate on a workshop. And um, the SCA is, is really trying to always create links between um, the students and the professional community. So um, we jumped on this occasion to get everyone together and have a day when we can really work together and create new sort of synergies. And there's something kind of magical that happens when you mix the different ages and different professions and have this sort of interdisciplinarity and um, try and have a, an exciting a uh, mishmash situation where we don't really know where we're going, but um, we know where we want to go, and it's sort of about the journey of being mm. together and creating together. It's pretty much the journey that got us into this event in the first place. Matthias, what were you doing then today? Yeah, so I mean, it was it was really fantastic to um, to have this invitation from SCR and Archipelago, and that was just okay, guys. You know, like let's do a really fantastic workshop with you know professional architects and students and whoever else wants to join. Um, so it was an open uh, call and invitation to to everybody, and so um, we got inspired first by um, Archipelago itself, like the concept of Archipelago, and then the topic of this year, which is the multiverse. Um, so for us, the archipelago uh, obviously um, is about a series of islands, which um, are all singularities, but they are connected by the water or the sea. You know, so the, the, it's as important to express the singularity of the islands as to express um, the connections between them. And then the multiverse, you know, comes on as as you mentioned also on, on your blog and website. Um, it comes to complexify this relationship because it says that not only these islands as uh, entities have to connect to each other, they also have to connect with a multiplicity of potential of dimensions of universes that could be acting in parallel um, and that could be influencing uh, what they are. You know, so suddenly there are like bridges which are not only through uh, one connection, one possible connection, but a multiplicity of connections that we have to kind of decipher, invent, discover. Um, so. We took this and it just reminded us of, uh, of um, Colin Rowe, uh, book on the Collage City, uh, which, is, which is really interesting because it comes, uh, it's, comes in the 70s, 60s, um, and it's, it's really about um, how um, the, you know, the architects who've tried all over the 20th century uh, to become master planners, to create total architecture realities, um, have failed, and they've only been able to create fragments of that totality. And that actually the fragments are much better than the whole. Because if it was an entire uh, whole um, architectural reality, it would also be a political reality. 
um, which we don't want. We don't want any totalizing kind of uh, system or principle uh, through which we interact with each other. So it says that the fragments should be recognized and we should start working from uh, different fragments of the city and understand how they connect. So this is really what we try to do uh, at the beginning we sent the different teams of, um, of the three people team uh, throughout, through Geneva to discover points which were uh, decided in a, through a very random kind of system. So they just landed up somewhere and they had to you know, come back and say, what was, what is this urban fragment all about? You know, say something, some principles, some strong ideas about this uh, fragment. And then they had to express this and connect it to other fragments. So it was as much about expressing the individuality of a fragment, the potential of a fragment, as about the connections between those different fragments. And so what kind of exercises did you do? I mean, we're watching uh, over there in the big screen, we have some images of the process today. So basically they went out, collected things, and then what happened, Emma? Yeah, so the process was quite linear. We started off with um, a giant map of the city um, with API in the middle where the workshop was being conducted. And what we did was we, we threw um, a ton of gravel, similar to this one, <laughs> onto the map. <laughs> and each group had um, a cardinal point where they had to find a piece of gravel that was on their, on their line of cardinal points and then go to that spot and investigate the, um, investigate the site and really feel it and, and draw, draw things from it and be very attentive and bring back um, through any medium um, that could translate their fragment. So we had drawings, we had photos, we had interviews with local people and all sorts of different ways that we can express um, the identity and the nature of these, of these spaces that we wouldn't necessarily be drawn to, not necessarily touristic spots, but really random spots that were, that were thrown on, onto the map. And then groups uh, went out, uh, got to know each other on the way. Um, each group was composed of students, professionals, um, interdisciplinary, so not just architects, landscape architects, all sorts of disciplines that have nothing to do with, with us specifically that brought um, a much, much more richness mm -hmm. to the situation. Um, went out, collected these fragments, brought them back, and then uh, we had a moment where we exchanged with everyone. And in the afternoon, they really got down to expressing and, and drawing, um, drawing certain parallels with each other and starting to link, link these different fragments together in order to create a, a sort of more ideal city out of these fragments. And what were some of the kind of key takeaways from that process? Like what happened? What were these connections that were established? What were these kinds of parallels that were established? So... Um, <clears throat> So basically, they came to places which were really random, uh, and then they had to make something out of it, you know. So they either had to discover something that they felt was precious and was worth keeping, or something that, um, you know, should be transformed and should be different. So um, one group uh, started, like, just discovered that um, uh, they just landed up in a place which was had lots of barriers and gardens, um, and they just got inspired by the gardens because... At once, it was a beautiful nature, but it was a very contained, uh, very domesticated nature. And they said, actually, we should free up. We should liberate this nature. Um, we need to bring back the wilderness into the city um, as a fundamental principle of, uh, of connecting things uh, and letting it grow and also um, go beyond the boundaries. And many groups also uh, had this idea of the boundary as something that um, um, had to be recognized first, uh, recognize why a barrier was there. You know, everybody got confronted to some kind of like uh, um, uh, barriers or disconnections between places where they went. And they thought, at some, some of them decided that the barriers should be broken because the barriers were was taking you away from uh, a place where you would have a higher consciousness. For example, if you have a barrier because some place is dangerous, this is actually danger is what makes you makes you more aware. You know, if you are in a dangerous place, you start you know you stop looking at your phone, you stop look, looking around you, um, so you become more aware. So the kind of wilderness of the city was something that you know um, I think many of the groups wanted to reclaim and say that actually we want to to uh, to, to open up and to uh, be have access to those spaces. And others um, also really worked on the contrast uh, between different types of spaces. Uh, some of them said, you know, uh, there was a big um, kind of a big building in glass next to a, a little market selling uh, um, seeds uh, and, um, and, and small kind of like, um, it's a, a market that actually happens once a year and it happened to be right there with where they landed up. 
Um, and they said, you know, the contrast was beautiful. And uh, they actually uh, wanted to highlight, you know, the kind of like very strong contrast, you know, that exists in the city. And to say that actually the contrast is something that makes it interesting. You know, if we didn't have uh, these very sharp differences, um, then it would be, uh, it would be, you know, the city would be more dull. It would be more homogeneous. Um, so it was, it was a, you know, I think that's some of the takeaways. Um, others um, really kind of uh, also made this contrast between a nature and the built environment. We had some very interesting observations about uh, Ilo Traz, which is a part of Geneva, where mm -hmm. a group landed up. Um, and they said that actually the nature that, that is created in, um, in the kind of uh, uh, courtyard uh, in Ilo Traz is, uh, is a nature which is also um, using the building. So the birds, they counted uh, uh, almost 200 birds in the area, and they said that actually those birds use the balconies, they use the rooftops, uh, and so there's an interesting suddenly symbiosis between the built environment and the natural environment, um, especially when this natural environment is, is le left to express itself very strongly. So the images that you brought are some of the images of the exploration, but also you, you tried to do kind of a, a, a gigantic archipelago at the end as well. How did that work out? And was it kind of what you expected it to, to look like? Yeah, so <laughs> the images that you're seeing are sort of hot off the press. Um, some of them we haven't even seen ourselves, but um, the, um, the images that you see here are from the visits in the morning when um, the groups went out and sort of were collecting their fragments and their experiences. So they sent us these images. And then um, later on when they were sort of relating these fragments and, um, and putting, putting them into a, a sort of a visual format and linking them together. That's where this sort of installation came in, where they were completely free. We just gave them a massive amount of materials and said, listen, express yourself the way you want. What can best translate this fragment? And how can we link one fragment to another fragment? And that's how this sort of installation came about. And that's what you're seeing um, in the in the. What is interesting to me also is that um, you, we talked also in these days a lot about representation and when you bring in expertise that is different from the expertise of the traditional architectural disciplines and you get obviously different kinds of representation, how did that enrich then the final tableau that was at the end of the workshop? Yeah, there's something incredibly fresh about sort of bringing together these different generations mm -hmm. of, of architects, of designers and of creative people. And everyone has their sort of their medium and their way of expressing themselves, right? And when you put them together and you have sort of a younger, freer perspective and then a more, a, a more poised uh, professional perspective as well, it's, it brings so many layers and dimensions to, to, to the expression and to the representation. And I think that's something that we really were trying to do with the SCR with this workshop is, is really mixing all that together and trying to bring this synergy and see what kind of journey we can go on together. What did you think of the final tableau, Matthias? I mean, so the key to this kind of workshops is not to have any expectation, you know, and in fact, you should be surprised by it by what comes out, uh, that's, the, that's the whole point. I mean, you really kind of, uh, you know, let it happen. Um, you try to basically create as much as possible, leaving the maximum freedom uh, to all the participants to express themselves. And in this case, not just express what they had done, but also how what they had done connected to what other people had done. So, um, uh, you know, then just this thing emerged, you know, out of, uh, and in fact, in the morning, we didn't really even think that it could be a three-dimensional kind of like uh, installation, but that's what it became, you know. So there was like a, also an appropriation of the space um, and a very creative kind of uh, use of materials. So, um, so that, was, that was very good. You know, for us, the, the fact that actually there's non-architects also participating is very important because um, we've always kind of uh, insisted on a, on a methodology based on recognition of whatever is there as a starting point. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, you know, I think many different people, many different types of uh, uh, professions or, or, or backgrounds, everybody can, can recognize different things in space. Um, and so this recognition uh, is, you know, is, is really kind of what we try to materialize through the, you know, the installation. So definitely, it, it, you know, it took some of the architects in the workshop out of the comfort zone, mm -hmm. but into a different zone of, uh, of you know, very creative expression mm -hmm. um, of uh, both, you know, what is important, what, what, what is interesting there, and the potential of spaces. So. So it is an interesting experience then to put architects outside of the comfort zone. I mean, the ACI is a professional association that has architects among its members. Um, so is this something, a methodology that the ACA wants to continue to pursue, like continue putting 
its members perhaps outside of their comfort zone. I think this has definitely been a first for, for most of the members that participated today and I think um, what, what I, took, uh, I took back from it was that it was a very refreshing experience and that we all have something to sort of learn from each other, you know, and, mm -hmm. and to sort of get back to your roots. And some people said it sort of brought them back to this childlike state of just being free to express themselves mm -hmm. with materials and, 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 and really think about spaces a different way, think about um, the feeling of a space, you know, and I think they're things that we sometimes lose later on in life when other things get in the way and, and we really have something to sort of, uh, we need to go back to that and we need to be mm. reminded of that. And I think that's what this, this day of workshops did for a lot of people. And so I definitely think it's something that we'll continue to do, yeah. Yeah, well, I think it's really interesting that you just sort of created this huge mishmash and just sort of opened up to the possibility of whatever happens. Now, I mean, this is also something that we were been t we've been talking about a lot about in these days. Um, this idea of really opening up space for different possibilities and how so many times we are kind of just like stuck in the in the, the daily today of each different discipline and we do not create space. So I think it's important to create these moments, like such as this workshop that you guys did today, um, in order to create space for those alternatives to emerge, you know, and to give people also the space to listen and understand and perhaps sort of be surprised, you know, because surprise, uh, and I think this was something you were alluding to with your no expectations, um, the possibility of surprise is a very powerful um, possibility and it's extremely effective. I don't know if it's something that you used to uh, sort of use often in the way that you do things, but I, I do feel it's a little bit like that. So maybe you want to say something about the idea of surprise. Is it something that you resonates with you? Sure. Um, no, I mean, you know, that that's really one thing that uh, wh when we, we started um, uh, our practice, Herbs, uh, a few years back, um, it was really just all about uh, being surprised and, uh, you know, going to places and discovering new places with a local eye and a global eye together, you know, and just allowing ourselves to kind of be enchanted, you know, all over again uh, by places that may be familiar, but um, that, you know, we, we kind of be able to see, that we're able to see with a new gaze. Um, and I think it's really important. That's why most of uh, our workshop, you know, when, whenever we can, we always try to bring people from outside the city. In fact, today we had some people from, uh, from Zurich mm -hmm. uh, oh. and uh, other parts of Switzerland. Uh, also, people who've been in, in Geneva only for, you know, for, for a few uh, weeks. Um, and, you know, it was really incredibly refreshing to see the city through their eyes, you know, especially for uh, people in their teams that, you know, knew the city so well. And suddenly they're like, oh, wow, you know, there's a totally different perspective. Um, you know, for us, this is really fundamental, you know, this is, and it's not just about kind of, um, you know, saying something creative and, and surprising and nice about the city. For us, it's really the, you know, the raw material to start um, doing participatory planning. When we think about planning, you know, this is where we start, you know. We start with, you know, this, this kind of fresh eye, uh, fresh rediscovery of the space uh, and, and throwing, you know, the, the possibilities out there. And those possibilities are, are more than often than not, they're quite concrete, uh, they're quite applicable. Um, so it's not just about kind of like, you know, dreaming. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, we have to allow ourselves to be very free in the process. But at the end of the day, you know, we, we bring this back to uh, things which can be uh, very, very kind of uh, clear recommendations for where the city is going. Great. Thank you so much for sharing the, 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 the outcomes and also the process that took you to this. I hope this is something that will continue to happen and we'll be able to, you know, maybe not in the context of this event, but in other contexts, definitely, if that seems like a good, that it was a good surprise, like it seemed it was, um, I hope that you can continue to create those spaces for those surprises to happen. Thanks so much, Emma. Thanks so much, Matthias. Thank and you. we're just going to go directly from this conversation about outcomes and concrete outcomes into our dis discussion. Um, with our moderators and we have here students from both HEAD and HEPIA that are going to be joining us for the concluding remarks of our event. And wow, we're all here in person and Elise is also going to join us. Um, she's already there, fantastic, great. So we're all here um, and I'm very excited to be able to start this concluding discussion. It's very important for us in the, in the framework of this event to have a conclusion that tries to come up with some actionable uh, points that we can maybe already start thinking of implementing at a pedagogical level, right? So this reflection was all created from, the spa with, from within the spaces of two schools that organized this event, and it is also in these spaces that these reflections are going to come to an end. So we're delighted to welcome here also some students 
from both Head and Hepia to join us in the reflection that will start the conclusion of this event. It is fantastic to have you all here. We're all very far away. These are the times we're living in, but I'm very excited to be able to welcome you all. So we have our wonderful team of moderators in our concluding panel. I have here Maryam to my right, Ala over there, very far away from me, and Elise to my left. And we are also uh, joined by students from Head in Hepia from the three departments that organized uh, jointly this event. Architecture, we have Katerina there. Landscape architecture, we have Joanne and Celine over there. And from interior architecture, we have Patricia over here. So in order to launch the discussion um, over the concluding remarks of this event, um, I wanted to start by asking our team of moderators um, about what are for them some of the most important takeaways from the discussions that they were moderating over the course of the day. And maybe I'm going to start by Miriam. All right. Um, <laughs> so these days I've been very uh, packed with uh, ideas and um, I'm happy that we're taking the time to kind of unpack this and, and, and see what we can take away from it. Um, I feel like there's three uh, main uh, elements that I would like to uh, bring out from the, the various panels uh, that I was involved in. The first one um, is regarding uh, the idea of complexity. And that, uh, th that means the complexity of a territory, the complexity of a social, economic, and political situation, and the different tools that our panelists um, have uh, developed and um, shared with us on how they were able to tackle this complexity. And I think uh, we can take away the idea of um, transdisciplinarity, uh, we can take uh, this idea of also decentering, um, decentering from the individual, decentering from the human individual, um, to include a variety of points of view and a variety of uh, tools to address that complexity. complexity. So, coming from uh, a multiple, a multiplicity of points of view uh, allows us to also uh, address and tackle a multiplicity of issues. Uh, so I felt like that was, um, I guess, one of the biggest takeaways, uh, if, if, I, if I were to summarize it. Um, I think another thing uh, was also, and maybe I'm projecting something that I am sensitive to, but the the idea of economies uh, and the um, uh, economic um, uh, background that a territory is uh, framed in, how it informs the projects that can take place in it, but also the economical structures of our offices, of our structures, of our collectives. How do we operate and how... Um, as companies or associations or uh, nondescript uh, groups of people, how do we have the uh, means and the actual economic tools to tackle uh, dominant forms of uh, power that are shaping the territory? And I think uh, we had great examples uh, from that as well. I don't know if you want specific examples, but if I were to summarize it, uh, mm -hmm. that would be it. No, it is super interesting. And I, I really think one, one very interesting thing that strikes me is this idea of you have to be able to embrace complexity so you have to be willing to embrace that complexity to be able to tackle the issues that we are surrounded by and and that we will be continue continue to be surrounded by in in, in the coming years um, this idea of embracing complexity was also I think very present in some of the other discussions, but also another word that you use, the centering, was something that recurred a lot in your discussions, Allah, right? Can you tell us a bit about that? Absolutely. Um, uh, well, first of all, thank you, and thank you for bringing up this uh, this notion of decentering, because I think that's for me um, somehow one takeaway that um, I can trace between both panels uh, yesterday and today that I was involved in. Um, whereas in the first one, we're decentering kind of the voices of, uh, you know, um, kind of people and societies and practices that have sort of dominated the, the field and the profession um, and kind of dominated our imaginary um, in a way as well. Um, and, um, you know, uh, um, by decentering these voices, we hope, 
I guess, as well to decenter the very, um, you know, uh, uh, structures of power that are um, involved in, uh, you know, uh, kind of not only architectural practice, in fact, but in, you know, sort of uh, truly our, our own um, historical imaginaries and uh, the notions that we think are relevant and what we think is not relevant, um, right? And then uh, to just tie it back around that same term to the panel, uh, you know, just an hour or so ago, um, there's also, I think, in you know, all of the practices that we saw and all of this notion of the new roles that uh, architects assume, um, there is this notion, I think, of, of decentralizing or decentering the supremacy of one model over another. Um, and uh, somehow, um, you know, by doing so, kind of opening up the, the field uh, somehow to listen to different voices, to, uh, you know, adopt different uh, processes and practices uh, in general, which in turn would allow for, in my opinion, and, you know, that's maybe my interpretation of uh, what was uh, said, um, kind of, uh, you know, would enable a more productive sort of practice of creative citizenship, which I think with the challenges, you know, that we have have been facing, we have been faced with uh, for a very long time, but we're kind of, you know, very bluntly uh, looking at and staring at uh, today. Um, I think we definitely need, we all need to be able to practice creative citizenship. So whether we call ourselves architect, we, architects, whether we call ourselves designers, whether we call ourselves planners or, you know, public uh, public uh, uh, practitioners or whatever it is, the terms that we use, I think at the very end of the day, we're all, you know, just trying to contribute or like have a, you know, small contribution uh, in order to um, uh, sort of um, uh, uh, kind of, you know, bolster our um, collective existence uh, somehow. So this is, you know, just going off of your uh, notion of decentering. I can go in, into more details, but I think we can, you know, start pushing the conversation in, in yeah. more sort of expanded directions. I mean, definitely this idea of citizenship and also of responsibility also is something that came to the table many, many times. Um, and responsibility at a variety of scales. Um, We've talked here about practice. We've talked here about um, engaging with the built environment and the systems that surround us. But for example, Elise, um, some of your discussions were also talking about the planet and, and, and were sort of taking things also towards even a, a, b a bigger realm of, of, of action, right? We talk, you talked about systems of ext extraction. You talked about planetary narratives. Could you share with us some of the takeaways that you've uh, collected over the course of these days of discussions? Absolutely. Um, I'd also like to start by saying thank you um, again um, for for pulling all of this together, and um, and thank you to Allah and Miriam for um, their their observations uh, and sharing their observations in the last few days. Um, I think this uh, idea of uh, practicing architecture differently, um, architecture, landscape architecture something that really struck me in all of the conversations. Um, and I think it is what um, allows um, people and their practices to operate at these different scales, as you mentioned, Vera. Um, but I think my, my biggest, I mean, there's many takeaways and I think we'll all have um, changing um, takeaways in the, in the coming days because there's just, the conversations were so dense and there's just so much to think through, um, for me anyway. Um, but I was really struck by the fact that each of the panelists um, that I was able to speak with um, have or are making practices that sometimes, you know, they operate within um, or sometimes outside of architecture. Um, sometimes they straddle disciplinary boundaries. Um, and what was um, especially interesting was that 
uh, and, and hopeful uh, was that there's so much possibility for how we practice each of these. Um, so architecture, landscape architecture, and other uh, interior architecture, which is to say, you know, th through research, through teaching, through storytelling, platform making, um, activism, just to name a few, um, are, are ways to tell, you know, all of these different stories at these different scales. But to do that work with um, integrity and honesty and real you know, real mutual care isn't easy. And so, you know, everyone who joined us in conversation was quite forthcoming and open in their experiences um, and in sharing what their work is, for example, able to do um, and what it's not um, and what those challenges are. So I think this opening of, of frictions that exist in relation to our various modes of working and living in the world and with each other were, um, I think, maybe the most productive for me and, and the thing that I'll really be thinking about the most over these coming days. The idea um, also that, you know, we ended with in the last um, panel with, um, with Esther and Mary Louise and Charlotte, the idea that architecture or design is a kind of culture is an intriguing one to really have to reckon with because um, although it brings with it this language of possible exclusion because culture implies a kind of belonging, I think it also brings with it um, this idea of kinship and ritual uh, in particular in the way that Esther and Marie Louise um, were we're speaking of it. And I think to me, those are the most potent and powerful ways of, of thinking about how we might open and keep open um, our disciplines or our practices um, to, to different worlds, to different people, to different citizenships. Um, and um, I, might, I might leave it there. Um, and I'm, I'm very curious to hear also what the students um, um, have taken away um, from these conversations. Yeah, definitely, and I'm, that's exactly who I'm going to ask next. Uh, I'm going to start here with Patricia, who is uh, to my right. Um, you're a student at the Masters of Interior Architecture here at HEAD, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, and you were watching some of our conversations. What are for you some of the impressions that you took away and what seemed to you important um, elements of the discussions that resonated with you? I think that what already was uh, said here, um, all of this uh, complexity and um, looking at different uh, narratives and how we can understand our practice, it's really um, open-minding for me. And um, I think the discussions which uh, were happening throughout these uh, three days, they really um, opened some doors in my mind and uh, helped to question things and also to think where me and probably my uh, my colleagues want to position ourselves within our disciplines and what are the boundaries of it and um, as you said what are the values to really stay updated to the current problems and um, yeah like keep uh, open-minded and um, and uh, I don't know I, I just want to really thank for uh, for this festival it was a great time and I'm really impressed with the level of discussions you proposed to us. I think it's really rare to also have it proposed in such a beautiful way, which uh, is really engaging for us uh, behind the screens to follow it. So yeah, I think it was really a um, precious thing to have. Thank you. Thanks, Patricia, for those thoughts. Um, I'm going to ask maybe Joanne if you want to share some ideas. Um, about what you saw. I mean, I think I think you also participated in uh, some of the workshops program, right? Yes. So uh, today uh, I uh, participated to a workshop. So it was with the Herbs Association and the SEA, and uh, so it took place in Epia, where I study my uh, the landscape architecture in the last year, and it was re really uh, rich in the discussions, the people that we meet. And uh, that's why I, I was discussing with my my uh, colleagues is that uh, in our studies we're we're sometimes too focused on what we're doing, our projects. We have the deadlines, the and everything is going on in our, our little world in uh, Epia or in other schools. But then there's the the out, uh, outdoor world, everything that's going. Uh, it's going on outside and it's really interesting for this uh, event is that we were able to meet uh, some other people and uh, share experience with them sharing thoughts and uh, 
mindset that we were maybe not really able to see. And I think uh, that's also the main point of the, of the discussions that went on to, on this uh, stage. And uh, yeah, I was really grateful to take part of this uh, Archipelago event and uh, yeah, and share my mindset with other people and to see what are their thoughts about this. It's interesting what you mentioned also about time and about deadlines and about kind of the obligations of student life um, that you maybe are not confronted or, or, or there's just no time for to be confronted with with issues that maybe go beyond the, the universe of the school, which can be such a an, an overwhelming and all-encompassing universe when you're when you're inside it. Um, I'm going to be going to ask Celine if you want to share some of your thoughts about what you've heard here so far. Uh, I think it's a real pleasure and a treasure to work with other people and to see other minds, and um, it's it's a real demand for from student to the. We know how to work uh, individually and, and today in this situation we know and uh, now it's a real pleasure to go to school and work with our colleagues and um, and uh, it's very important to see other minds, other people from uh, other other specialties and, um, uh, and yes, it's uh, not about uh, what we do is not for, for people only, it's for people in a place, in an environment and uh, so our archipelago and this workshop are, are very important for us. Thank you. Um, Katerina, you want to add to that or share your reflections? Well, yeah, after the, the workshop today, I, well, what I really liked is that we were from different cultures, actually, from different countries. Uh, so that was really interesting to, to see how other people view our country as well, because for us, some things are normal and we don't realize that maybe in some other countries it's not like that. And also to have the contact, like we were with professionals, but we were considered their equals. We weren't considered as students, so that was really nice because we're used to having the student-professor contact during class, and so we're still learning, of course, but now we were considered as normal people who are gonna be soon in the field, and we learned, and I hope they also learned something from us and from all the exchanges we had today. Well, I'm sure they learned a lot from you because that's what uh, teachers usually do. They learn a lot from their students most of the time. Um, and I can say for sure that was also one of the central tenets of this event was to invite kind of an intergenerational exchange. And that's why we had our open call where we invited students from all over the world to propose formats. And in fact, they were leading workshops, no? And they are normally not in that role or perhaps not very often in that role. I wanted to ask maybe our, our moderators about these these things that you just heard from the students. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of things here that kind of resonate with some of the things that were discussed um, over the course of the last three days. You know, you have here this individual working versus this collaborative ways of working with that, for example, was discussed in one of Miriam's panels. Um, and also this idea of intergenerational intergenerational exchange and, and sort of decentering also power relations that I guess Allah was also discussing um, quite a lot. I don't know. Is is it about making small changes into pedagogical environments or is it just about embracing that complexity as 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 a school? Like what could be um, a series of, of of points that could be um, useful for us in these pedagogical environments where we are right now, that is at the at the core of the reflection that started this event, that could be taken on and sort of like um, developed further or implemented further. Do you have maybe some thoughts on that? Maybe I'll start by um, Allah, who is in front of me. Sure. Um, well, actually, well, first of all, I, full disclosure, I don't teach, right? So I'm saying this from a... Uh, uh, conviction perspective but from someone who's not you know as embedded within the academic setting as perhaps the two other moderators um, but I would just like to say that in my opinion I, I don't see academia or you know education architecture education architecture in its broader sense architecture and design education as being kind of 
separate from the field of architecture and design, right? So it's not that there is a field, um, as you were saying, and then you're, you're studying, but then you're going to be in the field. I think you already are in the field. And I think that, um, you know, the, the responsibility here falls on the uh, academic setting, the academic institution, but also the professors, the faculty, the people that actually, you know, um, carry through the curricula. Um, and, um, you know, I, in, you know, just going back to, you know, one of the, the panels, the first panels that I um, was involved in, um, I want to say that all of my panelists were actually um, professors. They, they, and in fact, uh, Dele Adeyemo spoke about his studio at the RCA and about how, you know, the, the notions that he explores in his own personal work kind of make up, you know, the, the, the um, core, I guess, of the studio that he leads. And so in a way, I guess what I am trying to say is that everything that we have discussed, all of the kind of polemics around our disciplines um, and all of the potentials of our disciplines, I believe should be part of the academic experience, the educational experience um, in general. And so when we talk about, um, you know, including other stories or decentering structures, structures of powers, academic institutions are very much at the core of this. Um, and they're very much, um, you know, um, they're kind of, you know, some one like some of the the first sites that we're actually looking at and we're talking at uh, somehow. And so they places like this, spaces like this, I feel, also have a responsibility towards not only their students because their students are, you know, the the kind of uh, citizens of the future, quote unquote, right? Um, and so I I do believe that um, you know if we're talking about um, creating different narratives uh, in the field, if we're talking about the the um, importance of bringing in and of listening to other voices, I think this should truly be you know part of uh, everyone's kind of educational experience because we all have again this responsibility towards our collective relationships and um, and it all I guess starts you know or this is very much part of it and so I guess as a response to your to your question Vera I I feel like we have been convened by, you know, by uh, by school, um, and we are in a school, in fact. Um, and I don't think that the topics that we're discuss we're not here just as guests somehow, right? We this for me at least like shows a kind of sort of willingness to adopt some of the the um, discussions that uh, were brought up uh, in the past two days. Thank you. Um, Elise, um, you are teaching uh, quite regularly. Do, do these thoughts that Allah just expressed um, resonate with you in some way? Absolutely. Um, and, I, and I think it's also something that came up um, quite a bit in our, our last panel, uh, or my last panel, pardon me, um, today. Um, with with Esther, uh, Marie Louise, and Charlotte, where um, you know we we talked about um, you know the different ways that we can reimagine uh, or how reimagining is itself a practice that can be learned, uh, but it's but it's never fixed, um, and that this kind of um, practice um, it needs to take place in the here and now and in every day. Um, so in, in, in large and small gestures. And, and so this question of where we learn this kind of practice of attentiveness, of, of difference without hierarchy, for example, you know, of course, ideally we begin in school, but I, I also think that Allah brought up a really good point that we're kind of always in the field in some way. Uh, and so we begin wherever we are. I think that's, that's a way to, to think of it. So um, we begin wherever we, we are and, and we can persuade and we can insist um, but I'm also thinking back to, um, you know, part of uh, the conversation where um, Marie-Louise um, 
has explored the work of uh, you know Dana Cuff and Sarah Ahmed, um, who who have written extensively about uh, education, um, and you know and, and Marie Louise um, has this. Um, brilliant passage where, you know, architecture, this culture of practice that we are all a part of in some way or, you know, acting in relation to originates in knowledge acquired in and through education, as well as through these routine actions performed um, throughout our, uh, our careers. Yeah. And so, um, which is to say, which is to kind of go back to this, this idea that yes, education and the school um, is absolutely a place to begin, but it shouldn't only uh, be expected that it happens there. Um, that the most honest answer is that we should start wherever we are um, and no matter who we are. Miriam, does this uh, resonate? Yes. Um... I think th there's multiple things, and and uh, it's really hard to to I, I, like. There's ideas like uh, going left and right, and you're trying to hold on to one. And, um, and there's one that jumps to to mind actually is that I felt like this event was kind of like the making of a school. And uh, why? Because it created, um, you know, shared references. Um, uh, like shared beliefs that can be built upon uh, to develop a curriculum, to uh, set common goals. And then, you know, the kind of courses that you uh, put together, the kind of actions also that you as students can take, you know, as long as the goals have been set, uh, that there is like clarity and enunciation of these goals or that they are common, they are shared by that school. And by school, actually, I agree, it's not just, uh, this is beautiful, it's a great building, there's a lot of money. That's awesome, and that makes a school, but not only, like a, a school is also a conversation or like a, a, a group of people that's gonna share knowledge and then uh, disseminate it. So let's just go from there. And, um, and in that regard, I really agree with what you said, Elise, and uh, you as well, Ala, in, in like also exploding that idea of what a school is. And then I also want to turn to you uh, students to um, sort of alert you to you know, the power that you hold. So I understand that as students, you are used to that, uh, you know, that hierarchy that you were describing uh, when being faced uh, with a teacher and you do owe uh, respect to your teacher. And as a teacher, I, I do want some respect, but also <laughs> there is um, there is so much power that you hold and that you collectively uh, you hold that I, I think you don't quite uh, imagine how, how, how much um, of it you have in your hands and how much uh, you can wield. And as teachers, we're individuals, we have our own agendas. So uh, when a teacher sets up uh, a course and sets up like a, a kind of research through that course, that's also uh, with the best interest in the world, that's still serving uh, an individual purpose. And you're gonna be a part of it and you're gonna learn a lot of things from that. And at the same time, you also have the power to question it. And if you manage uh, to as a collective, because that's the only way to get things done when you are in uh, uh, an unbalance of power. You're not gonna do it on your own. I have more authority than you in the school, then you can like push me back by uh, coming together as a group. And uh, I think that's something that's really important that we, I, I think as teachers, um, our role is actually to, to set a discipline and uh, claim an authority. That's something that I think is our actually responsibility that we need to own up to it. And what you guys need to own up to is that you can challenge that authority. And uh, for that, that's actually pushing you to have um, a trajectory. That trajectory of gaining that power requires thinking and it requires action. And to topple us, you uh, need to go through that trajectory, and that's how you're going to take our place, and that's how actually we deserve to to leave and and give you the the seat. Um, I would like to the revolution oh, yeah. of the student. 
well, <laughs> what's happening. No, but I mean, what, what is interesting here is also talking about finding finding your voice. I mean, Patricia, you were talking about that, like you question a lot of things, some things opened up in your mind while you were listening to these discussions. Well, then maybe that also allows you to position yourself. And it is through being exposed to these sets of ideas that you as students can also find where is it that you want to be, you know, and that then allows you to, you know, engage into other discussions and to, and to, um, yeah, sort of, sort of influence in a way the change that you might want to see within your institutions. If you want to see change, maybe you don't, but well, maybe, maybe you do. <laughs> Uh, according well after what you said well we're very lucky at EPIA we do have a very easy contact with the professors even with the the people responsible of each faculty and that's amazing because I was in another architecture school before and that was not the case so also with the situation we're living in now we never felt alone last year like when we were mm -hmm. confined at home we always were able to express what was not going on well, so the exchange is there, but there's yeah still some work to do because we don't feel the power yet. <laughs> I think I've got a similar experience because I studied architecture in Poland, and uh, I think the gap between a Polish educational system and the Swiss one is enormous to put it uh, nicely. And uh, as you said, I feel a huge support from school already, which uh, strikes me, I think, every day. And um, what you said about that we still don't have a power, maybe to referring to your words, we just need to be more uh, self-aware and maybe this power is already in us and we just need to yeah, collaborate and create a group. And I think that during this, um, these discussions, uh, during the festival, you proposed and um, talked about different ways of uh, of creating a practice of uh, working together like really against the current um, path let's say so I think um, like the change is already happening and thanks to events like this you already feel that there are new new ways to to embark on and I mean I'm really, really happy with, with what we already have, but it's true that um, it can be pushed always further and forward. Well, I mean, I want to maybe finish off because we are reaching the end of our time together by talking about something that Elise alluded to that was coming from the discussion that she moderated today, this idea of doing the work every day all the time that it's something that it, it's not a, a one-way street but it's always a, a, a relationship it's always a conversation it's always a dialogue much like we had these dialogues over the course of these last days um, and it is something that needs to be enacted every single day it is just part of of also of your practice it is also a practice in itself um, I really want to thank the students for being here with us today I think it's very very um, uh, you, thank you for sharing your invaluable insights, actually. Um, and I'm going to wrap up this conclusion by thanking everybody, thanking our fantastic team of moderators for being part of, the, of our event, thanking the students for taking part in the workshops, for listening to the discussions, and I hope they continue to inspire you in the next days and next month, because you'll be able to watch them again. If you haven't watched all of them, they will be online. Um, and yet, we're almost at the end of Archipelago. Um, and before we move on to our closing act, which is getting ready to enter our set, um, we're going to talk to Cindy Duan, who is, has led one of the workshops um, that was part of our parallel workshop program. Uh, I'm going to talk briefly to Cindy because her uh, her uh, work and the workshop that she led was a workshop that really tried to think about different kinds of realities. And we are also trying to think about different kinds of realities as we make this event. And I'm just going to sit here next to Cindy and just going to tell me a little bit about what she was up to over the course of the last days. Hi, Cindy. How are you? Oh. Hi, I'm good. How are you? I'm very good. So tell us, what were you working on? Mm -hmm. 
so the um, the workshop called Conflating Realms um, stemmed from a Zoom meeting. So when we congregate in video meetings, we're also forming a congregation of environments. Um, and in this project, we tried to merge these identities forged through the webcam windows by using an object from our surroundings in place of ourselves. And the collective virtual landscape, it presents itself in an augmented reality, one that is accessible from any mobile device. And as such, Arlen, the project becomes sightless, but also able to occupy many sites at once. And each participant in the workshop sketches out the room and then we connected them through any visual congruencies that we found, like where two rooms share one window or two sides of the same closet door lead to rooms instead. And so the white frames of furniture give context to the scan objects. And the 3D photo scans themselves present a snapshot frozen in time that the viewer is able to navigate around. And uh, as you can see, like one workshop participant took photos during the Zoom call so the workshop itself is embedded in peace. Uh, they also bring a renewed focus to the everyday objects that we usually take for granted as literally the backdrop to our lives. And so in the process of highlighting them, we find that the ways that we use these objects are adding layers of value and memory. This is very interesting because these are all topics that we were discussing over the course of the last days, layers of memory, um, but also creating new kinds of commonality and new kinds of spaces where we can interact together. And you do this very interestingly by um, going on to the realm of augmented reality. That certainly has been a very common reality for all of us over the course of the last year and a half. Do you want to just say some words about this kind of digital dimension that is so crucial to, to creating, in a way, these different kinds of commonalities? Mm -hmm. So in creating this digital layer of information, um, we're really merging the domestic and the public space. Um, and each participant is able to choose what they're comfortable sharing. And of course, uh, they can deliver it, deliberately omit things from um, their fragment, just like they can curate the background of their um, Zoom window. And although we're aware that these are made public, there's still a sense of voyeurism when you explore the model, since when you pre present it in AR, um, the viewer doesn't see the other viewers of the model. And so you're seeing things like what someone left on their desk last or seeing what's in their nightstand drawer. And when viewing them in an established context, for example, I had placed it on the street in the park. There are connections that are made between the real um, and the digital, and also the domestic and public, like where a desk and a chair happen to be placed in a playground near a picnic table. And when you spend enough time in the Arab model exploring it, and then when you go back to, the, um, to viewing reality, there's a sense of having someone uh, or something existed um, in that spot without it having happened at all. And I think you also shared with us a video which we can see briefly um, here in the space. Um, and this is a video of the model that you did. I mean, what is interesting for me is also this conflating of realms like you titled your workshop now to creating these like kind of frictions, which were also the frictions that we were discussing over the course um, of the last few days. Um, so this methodology is just one of many of the ones that we also were exposed to over the course of the last days to create these kinds of frictions between public and private, between personal and the public. Um, I think that's a very interesting kind of dimension to explore. And this is a methodology that you will continue using? Or is this something that you were already working on and you will continue working on? So photogrammetry was something that I had been interested in before, and I had been um, playing around with AR in a, in a different context, um, purely um, through 3D modeling digitally. And this was the first time that these two came together. And I think having this uh, collective landscape really became a prototype for something that could be mm, that could become a larger collective of um, things to really form a landscape that um, of artifacts that anyone can access.
Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Also, this idea of universal access is something that, well, maybe I shouldn't have said universal, but the idea of access is something that I, I find is, is quite, quite important. Um, thank you, Cindy, for sharing with us. And this was the last workshop in our in our program of workshops. We've heard from all the, the contributors to our workshop program. and very thankful that you came all the way to join us here and to share also the results at the end of our program. Um, and I'm going to say thank you again to our concluding panel. And we're going to go right into our final act. We've come to the end of our programming. And I hope that you've enjoyed it, that you were inspired by the discussions that were happening here in the Cube, in the heart of Geneva over the last um, three days. And I'm going to go join our final act, who is ready to, ready to start over there. Hello. Hi, Ricardo. We have here HPO, who also proposed a format for our program based on our open call. And here they are. And they have a lot of laptops. And there's a lot of things going on. There's also like a keyboard, a media keyboard here. Who, who is HPO? Hi. I think your microphone is off. You have to put it on. I hear that your microphone is off. You have to put it on. Now it's on? I yes, think now okay. It's on. Sorry, it was, I was not Ricardo, told. Ricardo, Oreste, and, and Luca, Luca from HPO. Yes. Tell us, who is HPO? We come from Ferrara. We studied architecture there. And uh, we are graduated, and um, we are now working, but we formed this community of about uh, 10 people. We are just uh, three of them. And we like to, we are investigating which uh, can be the um, most unpredicted way to, to work as an architect after, after, <clears throat> after studying architecture. And this performance is uh, somehow. live sets, live music sets, and we um, performed live visuals in an analogic way with analogical um, light screen devices. Mm -hmm. But one year ago, when Italy was put in the first lockdown, uh, he was invited to an event uh, called COVID Room. It was a Zoom streamed uh, boiler room, one of the first during the first <laughs> pandemic. And we wanted to go along with our visuals, but uh, we were stuck at home. And we found ourselves in front of our laptops another time. And we wanted to stream our visual with uh, his music. And we realized that uh, we were mostly familiar with uh, graphic programs, drawing programs. Uh, this because uh, young architects may be uh, asked to work on a computer for, number, for the most of their time. and difference. These are ironic. Oh, your microphone has not been working. Sorry. These are some um, ironic reference to the fact that uh, we young uh, workers or students can be alienated uh, to our digital tools of, of production. So we are interested in how these programs um, can be used in a very different way. In, uh, instead of the one they were programmed for. Have they an autonomous language mm -hmm. that, that can, can go beyond this? We are, as HPO, we are interested in uh, how the banal use of technology can uh, unveil unexpected outcomes. And for example, this is only one of the three laptops I'm here using Rhinoceros, but there are also uh, the video process, the video, video signal is uh, processed also by Oreste here. Can you turn around and show us your shirts? Very good. <laughs> yes, Very good. I, I can say something. It's on? Yes, please. Um, yes, speaking about um, software, and uh, we decided to um, um, use and process the video signal with OBS, that is um, a 
stands for o, um, Open Broadcaster uh, Software. Um, is a digital tool that um, belongs to um, the gamer world. This um, streamer source. Yeah, yeah. This uh, I can say Twitch phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Yes, but is a new is a recent uh, topic for us. Uh, so we are looking for it now, and um, and yes. Mm, as HPO, we we have all been always been interested in uh, performance, and um, um, as a, one of the many possible um, opportunity expression of, of the architects, one of the many. Yeah. Yes, and um, and now um, we are um, investigating uh, the, the the role of the streamer the, yes. the, the, that. Um, Spends mostly of uh, his time uh, in front of the computer. Yes, and, it's uh, like a performer also. Yes, also. a performer himself. and maybe a new paradigm of worker. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and yes, now investigating this condition, um, we are trying to figure out uh, um, some possible uh, reverberation. How it can reverberate on uh, on our work. It's uh, about a work condition. Like uh, the streamer uh, has no clear distinction between uh, leisure time, between mm. entertainment production, between work, between private life. We are looking at the pros and cons of this condition. And we think that this reflection in our worker condition can... Um Luca, you want to say something as well? Uh, yes. Um, I, mm, I'll stream the music. Uh, through uh, this laptop, but uh, c uh, controlled with uh, these two MIDI devices that are uh, known uh, for uh, um, for their use in, in, in music, in uh, in, in uh, production and reproduction of, of uh, music. But also uh, Ricardo will use a, a MIDI keyboard to to, to control uh, uh, rhinoceros. That's a a CAD uh, software. Um, connecting music, uh, MIDI music, with uh, 3D modeling uh, permit us to put the variable tempo and uh, rhythm in, uh, in CAD software. And that's an unexpected uh, out out outcome of uh, this uh, uh, show. Yes. Uh, CAD softwares uh, like AutoCAD or Rhinoceros. Uh, usually don't have uh, an aesthetic purpose um, so uh, because they are uh, used in in, uh, in the intermediate steps of designing and not for the final uh, outcome of uh, the of, of the project uh, with these new variables of time bodies and uh, and uh, midi controllers we want to try to uh, transform um, the work in progress moment in a, in a static uh, uh, result. And we want to try uh, to not be overwhelmed by uh, the, the, the digital tools. Yes, by our, our digital tools that yes. now more than ever are always present in our Well, we were, we were certainly very inspired by what you proposed to us. Um, so I'm very curious to see how that's going to manifest here in this gigantic space. Um, thank you so much for being here. And before I let you go off into your performance, um, I need to, to thank people. Um, we've come to the end of, of our event, and it's been a real pleasure to be talking to you over the course of the last um, three days. I really hope you were as inspired by the conversations that have started here as I was, as everyone who participated was. Um, and I hope that the resonance of these ideas continues to um, circulate, not only within the student bodies of HEAD and HIPIA, but also within the institutional realities of these schools. Um, and within the minds uh, and the hearts of everybody who participated and who tuned in. So first, let me thank all of you for having listened in, for having participated. Um, I should thank first and foremost, Head and Hippia, 
who created a space for this kind of reflection to exist. Uh, and I should thank the, the directors of Head and Happy, Jean-Pierre Greff and Claire Baribot for creating that space. Um, also the director of the HOSSO, François Abbé de Garou, for creating also that space. Um, and I should thank the heads of our departments, Javier Fernandez Contreras at Head, Natasha Guillaumont, and Nicolas Femme at the HEPIA. Um, all of the wonderful people that helped make this project come to life. Uh, our steering committee, Yuri Kravchenko and Charlotte Chonet, also part of our steering committee, they um, helped make this event a reality. Charlotte was my right arm through this whole process. La Souris Verte for filming and broadcasting this event. Our wonderful architecture team who worked with the students to finalize and build the set that we are in right now. Um, our incredible particip participants and everybody who so generously contributed to this event. Our incredible advisory board whom we've heard in the first night of our event. Um, and in general, just all the students that took part in the two years of process from landscape architecture, from architecture, from interior architecture, the visual communication students led by Mitch Paone who developed the visual identity of this event, and also of course the communications teams at HEAD and HEPIA. I myself would not have been able to do this without the help of Edward Wong who is also um, leading the Telegram group in which a lot of resources have been, have been shared, Ines Reverge, who helped with the communications of Archipelago and AATB. Um, I think this is all for me. Thank you. And let's hear from HPO. Have a good evening.
Thank you very much. C'est fini. <laughs>